view of books, Robert Silvers. Also, Steven Pinker on how the mind works like a computer. A C-SPAN 2 weekend with About Books, tonight beginning at 8 Eastern and Pacific. America and the Courts, tomorrow morning at 8 Eastern. Robert Crandall at the National Press Club at 9. And tomorrow night, About Books begins at 9 Eastern and Pacific. Here's what's coming up this afternoon on C-SPAN 2. In a moment, Congressman Dan Burton of Indiana leads the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee in its investigation of campaign fundraising. That's followed this evening by President Clinton signing the annual Health and Human Services Spending Bill and the confirmation of the new ambassador to the Vatican. And later, the Israeli Knesset honors former Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin. Last Thursday, the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee continued its investigation into campaign fundraising. Members are concentrating on alleged abuses during last year's elections. One of the witnesses was First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton's former Chief of Staff, Maggie Williams. Good morning. Uh, a quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. Before Mr. Waxman and I get to our opening statements, uh, we will dispose of some procedural matters. First of all, I ask unanimous consent that all member statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, articles, and extraneous or tabular material referred to during this hearing be included in the record without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the depositions of Maggie Williams, Evan Ryan, and Gina Ratliff be made part of the record without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that members be able to use the depositions of Carol Kerr and Kelly Crawford in open session without Re objection reserving, so ordered. Reserving the right to object uh, only, will and I will not object, but I do want to uh, indicate that it's our desire that those uh, three depositions be made public. We're withholding a unanimous consent request uh, <coughs> while our lawyers look at those depositions to see if there's any reason that they ought not to be made public. I just want to point that out. We'll, be, we'll uh, hopefully come back to this issue later. I withdraw my uh, objection, my reservation to the unanimous consent request. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, in concurrence with the minority, I ask unanimous consent that the members be able to use the depositions of Ari Swiller, Dick Morris, and Eric Selden in open session without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the depositions of uh, Carol Kerr and Kelly Crawford be mar made part of the record once they have had the opportunity to review their deposition pursuant to committee rule number 20 without objection so ordered. Questioning in the matter uh, under consideration shall proceed under clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and committee rule 14 in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to committee counsel as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes per panel, equally divided between the majority and minority. <clears throat> Today, we are going to begin two days of hearings regarding Johnny Chung, his political donations, and his unusual access to the President of the United States. Today's hearing will focus on his controversial $50,000 contribution to the Democratic National Committee in March of 1995, the role of the First Lady's Office, his success in gaining access to the President for Chinese Associates, and his involvement in the Harry Wu Affair. Mr. Chung has been subpoenaed to appear before this committee. As everyone knows, he has invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. We are continuing to have discussions with his attorney who has asked that Mr. Chung testify in executive session. At this point, it is our plan to conduct a deposition with Mr. Chung tomorrow morning before making a final determination on that matter. These are our first hearings on Johnny Chung. They will not be our last. We will not try to answer all of the questions that have been raised about him in just two days. This is an area that we will return to in the coming months. Johnny Chung contributed $366,000 to the Democratic National Committee. 
All of that money has been returned because of sus suspicions about its legality. While all the answers are not in yet, these suspicions appear to be well-founded. In addition to his donations to the DNC, this committee has obtained clear-cut evidence that employees of Johnny Chung arranged conduit contributions to the Clinton-Gore campaign. Committee staff has interviewed three individuals in California who contributed $1,000 each to the Clinton-Gore campaign and were reimbursed in cash by an employee of Johnny Chung. This hearing is not, however, just about Johnny Chung. This hearing is about a White House that attracted him like a magnet. This is a story about a president who was starved for cash and didn't mind going all out to get it. Johnny Chung wanted to use the White House, and this is a White House that was willing to be used. In a Los Angeles Times article this summer, Johnny Chung said, quote, I see the White House is like a subway. You have to put in coins to open the gates, end quote. Where did he get this impression? It's not hard to figure out. This is the same White House where hundreds and hundreds of major donors, complete strangers, were invited to sleep over in the Lincoln bedroom at the President's directive. This was the same White House where over 100 fundraising coffees were held by the President. This was the same White House where convicted stock swindlers and drug traffickers found their way into intimate gatherings with the President. This was the same White House where John Wong and Charlie Tree were roaming the hallways with controversial figures like James Riotti of Indonesia and Ning Lap Singh of Macau. Time after time, we are seeing that the President and his people were more than happy to be used as long as the money kept flowing in. Johnny Chung was described by one National Security Council aide as a, quote, hustler. More and more, this description appears to fit. To Johnny Chung, the White House and the President were promotional tools for his business ventures. His, promo his promotional booklet for his fax business features no less than 12 photos of the President and the First Lady. There are another dozen photos of Mr. Chung in various rooms of the White House. He was aggressively using this booklet to recruit, recruit new investors for his company. One California investor was so impressed with Mr. Chung and his connections with the President that he and his family invested over $900,000 in Johnny Chung's company. Within months, he realized he had made a mistake and sued to get his money back. Johnny Chung was also working very hard to develop business ties in China. When the Los Angeles Times asked him about his efforts to get Chinese officials in to see the President of the United States, he said, quote, I am trying to build a new business in China, so I am happy to do my best to help, end quote. In March 1995, Johnny Chung wanted to get six well-placed Chinese nationals into the White House to see the President. He went to see Richard Sullivan at the DNC. He offered to make a substantial contribution if he could get them in and arrange this meeting. Mr. Sullivan would not set up the meeting. In his Senate deposition, Mr. Sullivan said, quote, Johnny Chung had made me nervous. Him showing up with these five people from China, I had a sense that he might be taking money from them and then giving it to us, you know. That was my concern, end quote. Mr. Chung was not deterred. He went to the First Lady's office at the White House. Mr. Chung has said in news interviews that the First Lady's Chief of Staff was willing to help him, but that she solicited a large contribution from him to help pay off the DNC's debts to the White House. Mr. Chung said that he readily agreed to donate $50,000. This charge is denied by Mrs. Clinton's Chief of Staff, Margaret Williams. We will hear testimony from her today. Mr. Chung has also stated that he was told that the First Lady was aware of his contribution. I will ask the staff at this point to play that portion of his interview that Mr. Tom Brokaw had with him. Would you put that on right now, please? I hope the sound system is working. Johnny Chung's name is at the center of the fundraising controversy, he says, because while trying to arrange a White House visit for Chinese guests, he learned from a White House aide that Mrs. Clinton's office needed about $80,000 to offset the cost of a Christmas reception. You knew what that meant, that you were going to write a check. 
Then I said, I'd be very happy to help the amount of $50,000. The next day, Chung says, he handed the check to the aide, Evan Ryan, who gave it to Mrs. Clinton's oh, chief of staff at the time, Maggie Williams. Did Mrs. Clinton know about this arrangement? I asked Mrs. Ryan, did Mrs. Clinton know I put it out the contribution of 50000 She said she definitely know. One by one, Mr. Chung's requests were quickly agreed to. It apparently took a flurry of phone calls between the White House and the DNC before the final and most important request was filled. Admission to the President's Saturday morning radio address. After interviewing and deposing several people over the last two weeks, we still do not know who gave the final approval for this request. We will ask several of our witnesses today who gave the final approval. We need to know that. However, it appears that this may remain an even greater mystery than who hired Craig Livingstone. There are three important questions that we would like to try to answer on this issue. First, did the White House staff solicit campaign contributions in exchange for official favors? Second, why wasn't anyone asked to screen foreign nationals being brought in to see the president, as was done in previous administrations? Third, was Mr. Chung's donation itself legal? We have two days to try to resolve these three questions. We'll see how far we get. I think that it's interesting to note that Richard Sullivan, the finance director of the Democrat National Committee, would not set up a meeting with the president because he was concerned that Mr. Chung's contributions may have come from a foreign source. I will repeat his words once again. Quote, I had a sense that he might be taking money from them, his Chinese associates, and giving it to us. However, when Mr. Chung's $50,000 check came in, it was readily accepted, no questions asked. In fact, Mr. Chung contributed a total of $190,000 after that date. Were Mr. Sullivan's concerns justified? The facts aren't all in yet. Mr. Chung's finances are difficult to unravel. However, here is what we do know about the $50,000 donation. On March 6, Johnny Chung received a $150,000 wire transfer. The money came from the Ho Min Tang Sham Beer Company in Beijing. Mr. Chung escorted the chairman of this company to see the president, President Clinton, in December of 1994. At the time, there was less than $20,000 in his account, Mr. Chung's account. On March 9th, the day of his meeting with Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Chung wrote a check to the DNC for $50,000. What do these transactions mean? We honestly don't know. Was this a conduit contribution? Was this $150,000 legitimate income earned by Mr. Chung's business? We don't have the answers yet. We hope to ask Mr. Chung these questions tomorrow. If nothing else about the White House dealt with uh, Johnny Chung generates any outrage, the case of Harry Wu, Wu should. On June 19, 1995, human rights activist Harry Wu was arrested in China. He was trying to expose slave labor conditions there. This set off a lengthy and very delicate uh, area of negotiations to win his release. When Johnny Chung met the president in a receiving line at a fundraiser, he informed the president that he was going to China and try to get Harry Wu released. According to Johnny Chung's account, the president urged him to go on. Mr. Chung sent a fax to both the White House and the DNC stating that he needed a letter of credentials so that the Chinese government would know that he was there on the president's behalf. He told the DNC that he was going to meet with the president of China. This should have set off alarm bells. He should have immediately received a call from the White House. He should have been told that this was an extremely sensitive situation and that it had to be handled by professional diplomats. Instead, he apparently got no response from the White House. What he did get was a letter of credentials and encouragement from the head of the Democrat National Committee, Mr. Fowler. The chairman of the DNC was perfectly prepared to allow one of his major contributors to go blundering into a very delicate situation with God knows what consequences. At the same time Mr. Fowler's letter was being prepared, another DNC official, Bobby Watson, was calling the White House to warn them that Mr. Chung was on his way to China and that he intended to represent to the Chinese government that he was speaking for the President of the United States. In other words, 
they knew that they shouldn't have been doing what they were doing, but they did it anyway, and then they tried to contain the damage. By the time the National Security Council found out about this, Mr. Chung was already on his way to China. It was too late. Far East expert Robert Sittinger stated in a memo to Anthony Lake, quote, all we can do is hope the Chinese recognize Chung's credentials are thin and that his message should be treated with caution. No one in the administration has any idea what he plans to say on the subject of Harry Wu. In the Harry Wu case, however, he could conceivably do damage depending on what he says and how much credibility he carries with Beijing. Mr. Settinger's comments pretty much say it all. He'll be testifying here tomorrow. Was the Clinton White House that desperate to humor Johnny Chung to keep the money flowing? A man's life and freedom were hanging in the balance. Would no one call Johnny Chung and stop him from forging ahead into this explosive situation? We have four panels of witnesses over the next two days. We have serious issues to deal with. We have a lot of ground to cover. As I said earlier, we are not going to try to answer all of the questions about Johnny Chung and the White House over the next two days. However, I hope we can make a dent. I look forward to hearing the testimony of Ms. Williams and other, our other witnesses today, and I now recognize Mr. Waxman for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is not a hearing about economic espionage or foreign agents or conspiracies to infiltrate our political system or any of the more sensational charges that we heard about earlier this year. This is a hearing about campaign contributions and access. And that is an important topic, especially if we have any genuine interest in reforming our campaign finance system. I think Robert Sutinger, who will testify tomorrow, provided the best description of Johnny Chung in a 1995 memo. That memo appeared in the New York Times on February 15th, warned that Mr. Chung should be treated with a pinch of suspicion. Mr. Sutinger wrote, quote, my impression is that he's a hustler and appears to be involved in setting up some kind of consulting operation, end quote. I think that's right. Nothing in the materials that the committee has received indicates anything else. Johnny Chung was acting in his self-interest to make money. And in doing so, he did what thousands of other people do in Washington every year. He set out to gain access. Now, one of the reasons the public ridicules politicians is that in these instances, we invariably have selective outrage. When Republicans buy or sell access, Democrats howl. When Democrats buy or sell access, we have Republican outrage. We specialize in self-righteousness and ignore the overwhelming reality. And that reality is that money buys access. To pretend otherwise is ridiculous. I have a page from the Senate Republican Committee's 1996 manual. It provides advice on fundraising to Republican candidates and has a section entitled, Why Do People Give Money? It lists three reasons. One, they know you and like you. Two, they believe in similar issues, parenthesis, usually small donors. Three, to gain access to power. So there's no misunderstanding. I'm not suggesting that only Republicans th think this way. There's probably nearly identical advice given to the Democrats in our campaign finance manuals. <coughs> Johnny Chung and thousands of others fall into category number three. They are in the business of politics, and money brings enhanced access. I'm amazed that anyone would be surprised by this. If Jane Smith, just a regular constituent, called any member of this committee and asked for a meeting, the answer would probably be no. That's a reality of politics. We have too many requests, and we can't meet with everyone. 
But if Jane Smith and her hus husband had given $2,000 each and then called our staffs, the chances are pretty good that there would be a meeting. And that's a cold reality of politics today. It may, and I hope does, bother us. We should find it repugnant, and we should come clean to the American people and admit what they already know is true. In the scheme of things, Johnny Chung was not a big pl a player in, by Washington standards. He's dwarfed by money and access to tobacco companies or others, like Archer Daniels Midland or Amway enjoy. Nonetheless, the record shows Mr. Chung gave hundreds of thousands of dollars and then visited the White House over 50 times. He ate in the mess, attended a radio address, sat in the movie theater, attended parties, and schmoozed. The only thing it seems he didn't do is ask for any policy favors. It could be that the White House extends these privileges to every American that asks. I'm skeptical and find it impossible to believe that Mr. Chung would have had the same opportunities had he not given campaign contributions. Another reality of politics is that this didn't start with Johnny Chung. I have an article from a May 1, 1992 article by Lars Eric Nelson, and that should be of great interest to this committee. It was given to me by my Uncle Ben, who was looking through some of his papers, and I want to read parts of this article. The headline says, President Bush and his campaign team recognize dollars, ignore donors. Look, who's that distinguished gentleman sitting up at the head table with Michael Kojima? Why, yes. It's President Bush, and there's Barbara, too. Aren't they lucky to be rubbing shoulders with Michael Kojima at this gala president's dinner? A better question, of course, is who is Michael Kojima to be seated with the president? And the answer to that is nobody has a clue. Kojima simply donated $400,000 to a Republican fundraiser and was made an honored guest. He is described as a Los Angeles businessman but his office address is a front, rented space in a law firm where he never shows up. His voting address is also a fake. It's his wife's business address. He shows up in no newspaper clippings. The California Secretary of State has no listing for his business. California politicians, both Democrat and Republican, have never heard of him. The organizers of President's Clinton, uh, President's, the President's Dinner, which raised $9 million for Republican congressional candidates admit they are mystified about Kojima. This is the first time he has appeared as a heavy-hitting contributor, and as GOP spokesman Rich Gallen explained, you don't cross-examine a guy who writes checks with so many zeros after the dollar signs. Lots of people, uh, lots of things stink in your nation's capital, but this president's dinner absolutely reeks. One of the co-chairmen, James Elliott, is a convicted felon in connection with an SNL racket who was lobbying for a presidential pardon. He figured that perhaps selling tickets to the president's <coughs> dinner might help his cause. Surely it would. If he could sell $92,000 worth of tickets, he gets to be photographed with the president. There is worse, however. According to a suit filed in Illinois, Elliott leaned on employees of his company Cherry Payment Systems, to buy $1,500 per plate tickets to the president's dinner if they knew what was good for them. William Neese, an employee who refused, said he was fired as a result. President Bush, of course, is horrified that anyone would lean on people to support the Republican Party. Bush has been in politics for 28 years, but he is like unto a newborn babe when it comes to the subject of campaign contributions. Also, he has nothing in principle against selling access to himself. Spokesman Marlon Fitzwater explained, it's buying access to the system, yes, he said. That's what the political parties and the political operation is all about. Now, you and I were not born yesterday. Certainly, it is a long-established practice that the extremely wealthy can buy their way into the system,
by invitation to state, din state dinners in the White House, by photo opportunities with the President, by a lunch with Vice President Quayle for N $20,000, or even by ambassadorships, $100,000. Generally, however, the politicians who peddle this access know who is buying it. In the case of Kojima, they have no idea. They don't know who he is or what he does or where his money comes from. He called himself an international business consultant, but what could that mean? The Bank of Credit and Commerce International was an international business. Manuel Noriega was an international business. The Secret Service checked only to make sure he posed no physical threat to the president. As for embarrassing Bush, the Secret Service couldn't care less. We don't veto his guest list, a spokesman said. Oddly, the Republicans don't care who Kojima is either. They just look at the check, cash it, and ask him where he wants to sit. After two days of searching all available records for Michael Kojima, all I can tell you about him is this. Whoever he is, whatever he does, and whatever he wants out of life, he has more access to President Bush than you ever will. Well, there it is. Before we had a Clinton administration or any of us had ever heard of Johnny Chung, we had money, access, international consultants, coercion to contribute, and a willingness to accept money with no questions asked. As Yogi Berra once said, it's deja vu all over again. Was it wrong that Michael Kojima could work the system so that he could sit by President Bush's side? Absolutely. Should we be disgusted? Absolutely. Was it wrong that Johnny Chung could work the system so that he could be at President Clinton's side? Absolutely. Should we be disgusted? Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I know that on many occasions, uh, you have said that the system, it's not the system that's broken. I think you're uh, dead wrong. The system is a farce. Johnny Chung, is an equal opportunity opportunist. And I want, if we could, to show the, a couple of photos of him. We know about him with President Clinton. But he was also able to get photographs and access to the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, the Majority Leader, Senator Bob Dole. Mr. Chairman, I know you oppose reforms that fundamentally change how we finance campaigns, and I think you're wrong again. The only legitimate purpose of our hearings can serve is to change the system. If we had public financing, I believe we'd have a whole less, lot less of Michael Kojima's and Johnny Chung's to worry about. One last point. Our first witness today is Maggie Williams, and she's here voluntarily. She has already been deposed in the Senate for eight hours and in the House for over 10 hours. She now lives in Paris and made a special trip to be here today. She worked for the Clinton administration for four years. No one has produced any evidence that she ever acted illegally or unethically. Notwithstanding that, she has already incurred over a quarter of a million dollars in legal fees. I think in most cases, people don't go into public service for the money, but this is ridiculous. Ms. Willing, Williams, uh, having reviewed your depositions, I think the Senate made the right choice by not calling you as a witness. I'm not sure why you're here, but I want to welcome you and tell you I look forward to your testimony. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Ms. Williams, would you rise so we can be sworn, please? <coughs> you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth about the United States. Ms. Williams, on uh, behalf of this committee, uh, we welcome you here today. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes if you wish to make an opening statement. Uh, if it's longer than that, we'll include your entire uh, s statement in the record. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Waxman, members of the committee. <clears throat> You have asked me to come here today to address you concerning Johnny Chung. 
I will tell you um, what I know of this matter. There are many things that I do not know and will be unable to assist you with, but those things that I know about, I am more than happy to answer your questions this morning. I do not remember the exact circumstances of my first introduction to Johnny Chung. I know I met him early in the first term of the Clinton administration. I do remember the story he told me at our first meeting. He told me that Mrs. Clinton's encouragement was important to the success of his business. He credited her with his professional achievement and told me she remained a significant inspiration in his life. His enthusiasm for Mrs. Clinton, I will tell you, bordered on the worshipful. Mr. Chung would not and seemingly could not stop saying how much he admired her. He was highly emotional about his support for her, and I did not doubt his sincerity. This initial interaction with Mr. Chung became the context for my association with him. At some point, I also learned that he was a contributor to the Democratic National Committee. As has been reported in the media and recorded in the visitor entry records, Johnny Chung came to the buildings in the White House complex a number of times. Many of those entries were arranged by my assistant, Evan Ryan. Long before Mr. Chung requested that he be cleared through my office for entry into the White House complex, he routinely would be in the old executive office building and stop by my office, which housed the First Lady's staff. Our staff office, unlike most of the offices in the old executive office building, kept the reception door open. The open door, a rotating picture gallery featuring the First Lady busy with her many activities, stacks of reprinted speeches available for the taking, and a huge cardboard cutout of the First Lady, a favorite site for visitor photos, encouraged unscheduled drop-bys from interns, visitors with other build business in the old executive office building, family members, and friends. The reception area was a welcoming place, and we made it that way on purpose. Mr. Chung visited the First Lady's office in the old executive office building more often than most. Like other visitors to our reception area, he typically would spend time viewing the pictures, using the phone reserved for guests, chatting with anyone and everyone working or passing through the front of our office. His many visits and then his constant requests later to be cleared into the, com into the complex did provoke complaints from both my volunteers and my staff. They found his visits to be a nuisance. They found his personal manner irritating. Indeed, there were times when I walked through other offices to avoid running into Mr. Chung when I was especially busy. Nevertheless, the standard of treatment I demanded for Johnny Chung was the same standard of treatment I demanded for all of our visitors and supporters who came to the old executive office building. I continued to require that the First Lady staff, whether they wanted to or not, extend every courtesy to him. And I instructed my staff to be tolerant of both his visits as well as his requests. Now, to be honest, any special treatment given to Mr. Chung represented my efforts to compensate to some degree for the snickers that sometimes occurred during his inartful and sometimes confounding use of the Eng English language. He could be embarrassingly aggressive. He was like a bull in a china shop, but he was never unkind. He was never rude. He was different, it was clear. It was clear to me, it was clear to my staff that he was different. He was different socially and culturally, and it showed, sometimes painfully so. And as an African American, I can tell you, I know what it means to be different in politics in America. 
and be on the outside of things and struggle mightily for insider status and recognition. And so I perhaps had an especially high tolerance for Mr. Chung. Now, a prime example of his aggressive and I believe sometimes simply misguided behavior was his persistent request to give money directly to Mrs. Clinton. He wanted to demonstrate his financial support for her. On more than one occasion, I told Mr. Chung this was not possible, although his offer was much appreciated. In response to his request, I told him he could support Mrs. Clinton by supporting the DNC. So when he asked me, how can I give, how can I show support, I told him, support the DNC, or perhaps give to the Clinton-Gore campaign. Write Mrs. Clinton a note and tell her how much you appreciate the work she is doing for our country. These were, uh, excuse me, help the president and Mrs. Clinton's legal defense fund. These were my standard responses to anyone asking me how they could help or show their support for the Clintons. I do not remember if I ever responded to Mr. Chung's request to give money to Mrs. Clinton by directing him to the President and First Lady's Legal Defense Fund, although it is likely that I did. I do, not, I do know that when Lynn Cutler, one of the founders of the Back to Business Committee, asked if I knew Clinton supporters who would be spokespersons or contributors to the group, Mr. Chung's name was one of the four or five people I recommended that she talk to. One day, Mr. Chung came to the old executive office building. I believe that either in the reception area of my office in the old executive office building or in the hallway leading into the reception area, Mr. Chung pressed me to take a check for the DNC. He was both excited and insistent, saying words to the effect, I give to the DNC through you, I give through the First Lady's office. Now, I did not encourage Mr. Chung to believe that presenting me or someone in my office with a campaign contribution or a DNC contribution would result in any credit with me or my office, nor did I encourage him to believe that our office was a conduit for campaign contributions of any kind. Now, in retrospect, after having had depositions of nearly 15 hours about this matter after coming here and leaving my new husband in Paris, France. In retrospect, I could have been equally insistent, I suppose, that I could have been rude and refused to take the check from him, but it made no sense to me at that time to do anything than take the check, quiet him, shorten our encounter, remain gracious, and get on with what I had to do. I believe I put the check in my outbox, leaving an assistant or a volunteer to direct it to its appropriate destination, as I had done with other checks that my office had received through the mail. Entry records to the White House complex suggest that Mr. Chung had a picture taken with Mrs. Clinton on the same day he gave me that check to pass along to the DNC. I did arrange for Mr. Chung to use my personal account at the White House lunchroom, possibly more than one time. My personal, my personal account, the account that I pay, with, pay for with my own money. Both arrangements were the type I had made for others, including members of Congress, members and friends of the administration, staff, visitors, and family on numerous occasions. I needed no special motivation to do for Mr. Chung what I had done for others. Thank you, uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, we'll now start our questioning with uh, Mr. Bennett. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, yes, before you do, I, I, I want to apologize uh, that I have to go to another committee where they're holding a hearing on tobacco. I want to ask some questions, but I will return in time to ask uh, some questions of you, Ms. Williams. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Waxman. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear your name. Uh, my name is Dick Bennett. I was about to introduce myself. Okay. Uh, I'm All right. uh, uh, chief counsel for the last two months here at the committee. I don't think you and I have met before. No, sir. And I do not believe that you did. You did not testify before the United States Senate. So no, uh, we felt it was important to have you testify here publicly. And I want to thank you for coming and uh, apologize to you for any inconvenience. Excuse um, me, just one second. Could you pull the mic uh, closer to you so we can be sure to hear, oh, hear you very well? Thank certainly. You. Uh, for the record, I note that you're represented by an old friend of mine, Mr. Ed Dennis uh, from Philadelphia. Mr. Dennis, it's nice to see you here. Ms. Williams, if at any time you need to refer to Mr. Dennis, please indicate, and then I'll give you the time. Also, uh, Mr. Lanny Brewer from the White House is back. Mr. Brewer, nice to see you, and we will not call you forward to testify. Today. Appreciate that. And restrain yourself if you want to testify. Um, Ms. Williams, you served as chief of staff to Mrs. I, I'm sorry, I just got one more thing. Yes. Could you explain the lights? The lights. Uh, the light is green while I'm speaking, then it comes to yellow as I begin to... I think it's three minutes left, and it will turn yellow. When it hits red, I'm to stop. Okay. Okay. And if you see it go red and I'm still talking, tell me to shut up. You can do that if you want. Okay. No, in all seriousness, uh, Ms. Williams, you served as chief of staff to Mrs. Clinton from the very first days of the Clinton administration until May of this year. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Were you always the chief of staff for Mrs. Clinton? I always felt I was the chief of staff. Okay. And that was your title the entire time you were at the White House? Um, my entire title was um, assistant to the president and chief of staff to Mrs. Clinton. And I think you indicated in your opening statement that Mr. Chung's enthusiasm for Mrs. Clinton bordered on the worshipful. I believe that was your word. Yes, sir, that was in, my word. In fact, Mrs. Clinton had shown some kindness to Mr. Chung previously, had she not. I, I would put on the screen if I can. Uh, exhibit 232, a letter of April 26, 1993, and the exhibits are there for you, Ms. Williams, or you can just look on the TV screen if you want in front of you. It might assist you. Uh, uh, the letter of April 26, 1993 is a letter to Mr. Chung from Mrs. Clinton, uh, and uh, as you can see, that is not just a form letter. It's a, uh, a sincere letter noting personal things in Mr. Chung's life, correct? Um, I do not know if it's not a form letter. It certainly directs attention to personal items in his life, um, does it not? To your knowledge, she was supportive of Mr. Chung and kind to him, wasn't she? Yes, she was. And indeed, in terms of your opening statement, where you noted that uh, uh, he visited the office. Do we I think, have copies of that letter? I believe you, you do, and as an exhibit, uh, Mr. Congressman Waxman, it's Exhibit 232 in the exhibit book before you, sir. Yes, I was going to ask. Exhibit 232 in the exhibit book right before you, sir. I must say, appreciate it. Letter of April 26, 1993. Well, may I make an inquiry of counsel? Y you certainly can, sir, yes. You are referring to this as a letter indicating a Sort of a personal relationship? Uh, no, sir, I'm just indicating the kindness that Mrs. Clinton showed to Mr. Chung. I'm not indicating a, a deep personal relationship between Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Chung. No, sir. Well, let me, let me read this letter to be sure we, re we read the same letter. Thank you for your, dear Mr. Chung, thank you for your letter and my apologies for not getting back to you sooner. It appears from the correspondence you have had with federal and state officials oh, yeah. and with the private sector that you are already on the right track. Nevertheless, I wish you good luck with your innovative systems. Sincerely yours, Hillary Rodham Clinton. This is about as non-personal a letter as I've ever seen. The, the, the council has the time. Uh, I'm not trying to impose on his time, no, but he misrepresents a letter that needs to be pointed out, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lantos, you will have time, and you can point it out uh, when you have the time. Mr. Bennett. I think it's relevant to point it out when it's raised. Ms. We Ms. Williams, uh, with all due respect to Congressman Lantos, so you understand my question, uh, I'm not asking you with respect to that letter that Mr. Chung was a close personal friend of Mrs. Clinton. Uh, with respect to her reference, uh, you're on the right track. Uh, I wish you good luck with your innovative system, uh, trying to cast this in as neutral a form as possible. Clearly, she was wishing him good luck in some venture. Isn't that correct from the way you can interpret this letter? Yes, she says, I wish you good luck. Right. 
and you don't have any particular knowledge of, of how well she knew Mr. Chung in April of 1993? Um, no. Okay, do you know whether she knew him in April of 1993? In April of 1993? Yes. I do not know um, dates. I can't tell you if she knew him in April of 19 when, when was the first time, I believe you've previously indicated to us, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Williams, that you believe you may have first met Mr. Johnny Chung during the campaign of 1992? No. I, I first met him early in the uh, Clinton administration, so that would have been early 1993. And April of 1993 being early when you first met him, do you know whether or not Mrs. Clinton knew him at that time? Um, the reason why I'm hesitant to respond um, exactly is because I do not um, know, one, whether or not this is a form letter or if I had talked to her in April of 1993 about knowing Johnny Chung. And in fact, I actually don't remember seeing this letter um, until sometime in 97, I believe. Well, you indicated that Johnny Chung visited the office more than most. In fact, the WAVE records, if we can put up Exhibit 227 in the chart, uh, page 8 of that exhibit uh, reflects 22 visits to the First Lady's office uh, in just an 11-month period. Uh, from March of 95 until February of 96. I think it's on the TV screen in front of you, uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, clearly, uh, Mr. Chung visited the First Lady's office far more than that. He, he was a, very, a constant visitor, essentially, wasn't he? Yes, my, yes, as I said in my statement. And with, do you recall um, a woman named Gina Ratliff who worked in the First Lady's office with you? Yes, she was an intern. Do you recall um, introducing Mr. Chung to um, Ms. Ratliff? And uh, I believe she says at pages 34 and 35 of her deposition, and the depositions are in front of you. I don't think you really need to stop. I'll just represent a statement she's ma she made. I want to know if you concur with that. Uh, she indicated that you took her to see, took Mr. Chung to see her, and said something to the effect, "This guy is coming in." He is a big DNC donor. His name is Johnny Chung. Uh, do you recall anything to that effect? Um, no, I can't. Uh, I can't recall why I would introduce Johnny Chung to an intern, or I wasn't in the habit of making introductions for Johnny Chung. So you have no recollection of that event? No, I do not. Directing your attention uh, with respect to contributions by Mr. Chung, uh, do you have any knowledge of contributions by Mr. Chung which would have been made to the Democratic National Committee, President Clinton's Legal Defense Fund, or his re-election camp election campaign prior to November of 1994? Prior to November of, of 1994. I, I wouldn't know that. He was, in fact, to your knowledge, a trustee of the Democratic National Committee? I believe that he was a trustee. Do you have any personal knowledge of any solicitation of Mr. Chung, either by the President or the First Lady at any time? No, I do not. Do you have any knowledge uh, prior to February of 1995, do you have any knowledge of any request made by Mr. Chung upon either the President or the First Lady or the Democratic National Committee? Prior to February? Prior to February of 1995. No, do I have any knowledge now? Directing your attention to February of 1995, you did become aware at that time, did you not, that there were certain requests that Mr. Chung was making? And, and to assist you, I'd ask that we put up Exhibit 171. And again, these are in the exhibit books uh, for the members on the table. I can't see it. Exhibit 171 was a list uh, Mr. Chung gave to Richard Sullivan of the Democratic National Committee uh, indicating that a delegation from China will be coming in March and seeking assistance in arranging certain benefits. Have you seen this document before, Ms. Williams? Um, only at the time of my depositions. In fact, uh, with respect to this request of the Democratic National Committee on February 27th, it was followed the next day 
by a request of the White House, and I'd ask that we put up Exhibit 172. And this was a request to, to the visitor's office of the White House. Can you see that, Ms. Williams? Mm -hmm. Wherein Mr. Chung references the same trip by, quote, important and powerful business leaders from China, end of quote. Have you previously seen that document? Um, only at the time of my deposition. Did you have knowledge of essentially what would be defined, I guess, as a wish list of Mr. Chung, uh, reflected by Exhibit 171 in terms of certain things he was hoping, uh, he, certain benefits he might receive? Did you have knowledge of his request in that regard? Um, only knowledge in terms of having seen uh, both these letters at my deposition that there existed a wish list. At the time, did you have any knowledge in February or March of 1995 uh, that he wanted to meet the president and meet the vice president and have lunch at the White House mess? Um, in February, I had, I had no knowledge of what he wanted. Ultimately, by March, then, you did, get some, you did obtain some knowledge of some of these requests by Mr. Chung, though, didn't you? Well, not obtain some knowledge. I mean, um, although I have never been certain of the dates or the time, but at some point in time, Mr. Chung made a um, direct request to my office for a, um, a picture with Mrs. Clinton. I don't know if it was the first time or the second time, or, but I know he'd had many pictures with Mrs. Clinton prior to that, and also he made a request to use my White House mess account. So that's when I had knowledge of his request. And I'm not asking you to specify a particular date, but at some point in time you knew that there were certain courtesies he wanted to have extended to him, correct? Well, I believe that in my mind, um, when you talk about certain courtesies, um, he made requests like hundreds of other people make requests to have a picture taken with Mrs. Clinton. Um, as I said in my deposition, there came a time when he made that request to my office, and we handle it pretty much in the same way that we would handle any other picture request um, coming from anyone, quite frankly. Well, actually picking up on the comments made by Congressman Waxman uh, might set a precedent for majority counsel quoting from the minority side, but Congressman Waxman made a very important point, I think, in that clearly there are many, many people across the country who would want to come to the White House and have their picture taken with the First Lady, Ms. Williams, and clearly Mr. Chung with his access and that he had procured in one form or another, unlike many, many other people across the country, Mr. Uh, Chung, in fact, was able to get his picture taken with the First Lady. Isn't that correct? That's correct, but if I may take just a moment, Council, to explain a little bit about the White House, or the First Lady's Office, particular process for um, handling picture requests. I think that might shed some light on why we did not treat Mr. Chung's request as a um, particular request. If I might, I don't really want to go too far into this point. It's not that I'm trying to cut you off, but I have a limited amount of time before there's lights go on, so I'd like to move on to something else. I'm not suggesting but, any impropriety on your but, part. But I, but I actually believe that it will shed some clarity, and I think it's important, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that the chairman will give you more time. Go, that's fine. We can go explain. right ahead, Ms. Williams. We want to hear what you have to say. Go right ahead on okay. that point. Um, very early on, we discovered that the number of requests for pictures that came from Mrs. Clinton were huge. And these were not requests um, just from donors, although there would be requests from donors, but there would be requests from interns, from people who would be visiting the White House on that day, and I mean really visiting the White House on that day, groups of people who were coming into the White House. And we decided that we needed a way to uh, be able to accommodate quickly a huge number of pictures to be able to turn around on a dime. And so we developed a system within our office by which if Mrs. Clinton had an occasion to be leaving the White House as she did, to be going somewhere, walking out the door, we were sure of two things. She would have a photographer with her and she would also have her makeup on. These would be two 
clearly essential things to have in order to have any kind of a picture. And so because we wanted to accommodate huge numbers of pictures, what we could simply do in the morning was to check her schedule, see if she was on her way anywhere, and anyone who would ask for a picture that day or the previous day could get a picture by seeing her on her way out. She would not have to spend a long period of time with them. She would take the picture, and that way we could accommodate huge numbers of people. And so that was a process um, by which Johnny Chung came to get this particular picture. And, and Johnny Chung was clearly at, the, at, his, at her office with such frequency that it wasn't difficult to find a time to allow him to see her then, I gather. Well, it really wasn't, I mean, quite frankly, it had nothing to do with the frequency of Johnny Chung being in her office. If you had called me and I knew you and you called me Monday morning and you say, listen, Maggie, my mom and dad are in town. What they really want is a picture with Mrs. Clinton today. Is that possible? I would say, one second, Mr. Counselor, let me check her schedule today. I see that she's on her way to give a speech at the AFL-CIO. I think it's possible. And I would have someone clear in your mom and dad and have the picture taken. Well, I think in the present circumstances, I'm not sure if I could have my picture taken with Mrs. Clinton, but I'll certainly ask Mr. Brewer if the occasion arises, uh, uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, directing to your attention to March of 1995, there were, in fact, a, a series of unpaid bills for collection issued in, collection, in connection with some political activity which had been held at the White House. Isn't that correct? Well, um... In fact, to assist you, if we can put up Exhibit 255. And looking at Exhibit two, uh, 255, uh, this is a memorandum which I believe you received, Ms. Williams, in March of 1995 from the usher's office in connection with many unpaid bills for collection. Included among those bills were receptions in connection with the Democratic National Committee. And clearly as to those uh, political bills, they could not be paid out of the normal uh, White House budget. So there were bills that needed to be paid uh, and uh, needed to be paid by the Democratic National Committee. Isn't that correct? Yes. And um, I think at the bottom of that document... <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite finished. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I wasn't quite yeah. finished with my response. Go right ahead, Ms. Williams. I just said, yes, but one of the things that I want to make sure is noted that in addition to um, the DNC bills on here that are um, unpaid, that there are other organizations on the same memo whose bills are not paid. For instance, the U.S. Olympic Committee, um, here there's a Mother's Day health care event with a different sponsor. Um, I will agree that the majority of the bills listed here um, have to do with the DNC. You'll also notice that there are a number of bills, a number of uh, um, items or entries on this list where no bill has been submitted at all to the DNC. And so what we have is not just a list of DNC bills unpaid, but a list of bills that were unpaid from a number of different organizations, including the DNC. Yeah, and so we're clear, in fairness to Ms. Williams, I'm not suggesting that all the items on that exhibit, those two pages, are bills that cannot be paid out of the White House budget, but clearly there were some that could, could not be paid and had to be paid by the Democratic National Committee. That well, was my point. Well, actually, there's a bit of confusion on that point because... Well, if I can re reference the document, I'm not trying to cut you off, but we can save time on this, and, and I'm looking at the bottom of the document before you on the screen, which indicates particularly there is uh, certainly over $135,000, which is to be paid by the DNC. Do you see that entry there? I do, but once okay. again, I, I'm going to have to interrupt you because I want there to be some clarity about what this document actually represents. Absolutely. Go right ahead. These bills are not bills that would have been paid out of any White House budget whatsoever. I believe what you said in your earlier statement that, of course, these bills would not be paid out of the White House budget. No. No bill listed here would have been paid. The point I was simply trying to make is that this is not a document that says the DNC has unpaid bills. It does say that. But in addition, what it says is that 
the U.S. Olympic Committee has unpaid bills. It says that um, another organization has unpaid bills, that there are people who come and use the White House, uh, the Kennedy Center, all kinds of, in fact, there are very few events that are actually paid for, you know, by the official White House budget. In fact, most of them are paid for um, by the DNC or a sponsoring organization. Only the Congressional Christmas Party is paid for out of the official White House budget, in fact. So I just wanted to be clear that this represents a number of organizations who owed money. I understand. Okay. I, and with respect to this indebtedness, you uh, were here and saw the tape uh, of the interview of Mr. Chung with Tom Brokaw played by the chairman. Uh, did you not? You saw the tape we played today of the Tom oh. Brokaw interview. Yeah. And had you seen that uh, interview before? No, I had not. Uh, with respect to the contention of Mr. Chung that essentially uh, someone urged him to make a $50,000 contribution to deal with this kind of debt, uh, did you, Ms. Williams, ever specifically solicit $50,000 to Mr. Chung to assist in the repayment of some of this money to the Democratic National Committee to pay some of these debts? No, I did not. As I said in response to Mr. Chung asking, how can I help Mrs. Clinton or I would like to give money directly to Mrs. Clinton, I did say support the DNC, support these other organizations. So I had said that to him, yes. Do you have any knowledge of, I believe Evan Ryan was your assistant? That's correct. And for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Ms. Ryan is presently out of the country traveling with the First Lady and was unable to be here today and perhaps can appear at a later date. Um, do you have any knowledge of Ms. Evan Ryan ever mentioning to Mr. Chung that he could make a $50,000 contribution in order to cover some of this debt? No, I, I have no knowledge of that. And, and then showing you uh, Exhibit 174, that in fact is the, the $50,000 check to the DNC. Did you in fact look at that check when you received it in your office, Ms. Williams? No. Um, my did you know how much the check was for? No, I did not. Okay. And exactly how was the check handed to you? Um, as I, let me just refer to my statement. Certainly. As I, um, again, uh, Mr. Chung came to the old executive office building. Um, I'm not certain where, but either in the uh, reception area of my office or it could have been in the um, hallway in front of my office. Um, he handed the check to me. Um, I was either coming or going someplace is what I recall. Ms. Uh, Williams, I'm going to play you a tape if I can. Mr. Chairman, of the testimony of Richard Sullivan before the Senate. Uh, do you know Richard Sullivan? Um, I've met Richard Sullivan. I don't He's know. He's an official with the Democratic National Committee. Did you happen to have a chance to view his or hear his Senate testimony? No. I did uh, for not. your benefit, Ms. Williams, I'll just play a brief portion of this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Johnny had, had contributed some money up to that, and um, uh, Johnny had a very uh, nervous, kind of a, a outward, aggressive personality, and uh, just the appearances made me, the appearances of it, and um, uh, the fact that he seemed um, very much desired to, to get into the radio address made me nervous. And also that that might not be his money, that Johnny Chung's money, right? That the money might be coming from those he was escorting into the White House. Isn't that a concern that you had? That was, that's correct. Ms. Williams, did Mr. Richard Sullivan ever indicate such concerns to you? No, he did not. Let me ask you this. How would Johnny Chung, in the statement he made to Tom Brokaw, and the discussion about holiday bills, bills that were owed, helping out paying bills, how would Johnny Chung know that there was money owed, that there were debts, that someone needed help paying bills, unless someone from your staff told him? 
Well, I believe you'd have the opportunity to, to ask him that tomorrow. When hopefully he'll answer. But I'm asking you, do you have any explanation as to how he would know of these debts and these problems and trying to pay bills no. uh, and how he would come up with a figure of $50,000 and, and, and have any knowledge of this? Do you personally have any knowledge as to how he would know? No, I do not. And you yourself did not speak with him about these bills? No, I cannot recall a time that I did. And you, you don't have any, any personal knowledge yourself of any member of your staff speaking with him, is that correct? I have no personal knowledge of that. That is to say, you don't deny that they may or may not, you just have no personal knowledge of that. I have no personal knowledge of that. <laughs> I don't quite. Looking at exhibit uh, 171, just very quickly again, if we can. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, go right ahead. I, maybe I think I missed something in that question. Ooh. I'm just, what I'm trying to clarify is, I understand that you have testified that you did not speak with Mr. Chung about these debts, mm -hmm. that you did not solicit $50,000 from him. My question to you was how he would know right, of I, these debts, and my question was as to members of your staff, you have testified that you have no personal knowledge one way or the other whether or not they solicited him, you just don't know essentially. Right. I thought I that's what I said. I didn't understand. And with respect to Exhibit 171, um, the wish list, um, ultimately, many of the items on this wish list were satisfied, weren't they? And in fact, I think essentially all of them, other than meeting with the Vice President, were ultimately satisfied, weren't they? He did get to meet with President Clinton. He did have lunch in the White House mess. Going down that list, to your knowledge, isn't that correct? Oh, yes, I, I know he had lunch in the White House mess. Let me go into, I can, in terms of um, certain matters in terms of follow-up. I'm trying to make sure I cover the points within the, the time allowed here. Uh, Mrs. Ryan is presently out of the country, um, as I said, Ms. Williams. But her deposition transcript is before you. And referencing pages 110 to 112, if you'll take a minute to, to look at that. Okay. And there, it's, the deposition <coughs> transcripts are available for members of the minority. Mrs. Ryan has testified that when she told you that Mr. Chung was in the office and he had some businessmen from China and wanted these various perks, she said, she has testified that she also told you that he was going to be donating money to the DNC. And Mrs. Ryan described your response as follows, and it's page 110 of her deposition. Quote, her response was, we could see, you know, we'd see if we could set those things up for him and that it was helpful to know about his donation because then maybe that would enable the DNC to pay off some of their debts. Do you see that, that testimony of uh, Ms. Ryan at her deposition, Ms. Williams? Yes, I do. Do you ever recall saying that to Evan Ryan, specific reference to paying off the debts and seeking money from Mr. Chung? Um, no, I did not. Not um, Ms. Ryan knew, as did it other people in my office that the DNC along with other organizations had outstanding debts. That wasn't a secret, but um, I don't recall discussing it with uh, Ms. Ryan in relationship to um, Mr. Chung specifically. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I note that the red light has lit, but I think the witness indicated at one point in time I gave her some time and she asked that she allow me more time. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Lantos, uh, there was interruption, so we'll allow just a little extra time. Thank you. If I can have five more minutes, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, uh, there were some, uh, one other thing, Ms. Williams, I meant to ask you, that, that the interview with Tom Brokaw, uh, Mr. Chung uh, stated that he was told uh, by Mrs. Ryan that Mrs. Clinton uh, knew of this $50,000 donation. That's what he says on the tape. Uh, do you know whether Mrs. Clinton knew of this donation? Um, I didn't tell her. I don't know why she would know. Okay. To your knowledge, you have no knowledge one way or the other. You did not speak with Mrs. Clinton about the donation? No, did not. With respect to a follow-up by Mr. Chung, ultimately, um, 
Exhibit 259, if I can. Exhibit 259 before you is, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chung contacting you concerning procuring these photographs. Do you see that, Ms. Williams? All right, I'm, I'm trying to have it be put by Mr. Dennis uh, before you with the exhibit book as well as on the TV screen. Ultimately, these photographs were, in fact, sent to Mr. Chung. And just quickly, uh, Exhibit 201 is, is not your direct response to that, but it's a response of Ms. Carol Kerr from the Democratic National Committee who's going to testify before this committee later this afternoon, indicating that photographs were, in fact, forwarded. Ultimately, Mr. Chung got his pictures with the First Lady, to your knowledge, correct? Yes, the right. pictures with the First Lady. Um, I didn't send them directly, but I'm sure that our office process worked and he got the pictures with the First Lady. But ultimately, there were questions and problems with respect to the matter of Mr. Chung's photograph with the President mm -hmm. and the individuals he'd taken into the Oval Office, weren't there? There seems to have been, yes. And it, what involvement did you have with respect to those problems as to the picture of Mr. Chung with the President and his six guests to the Oval Office? Um, I saw this letter at my, um, one of my depositions. Um, so I don't remember uh, seeing this letter, and, but I may have been called by Johnny Chung or um, Evan Ryan may have told me that there were picture, there were problems with Mr. Chung receiving his pictures from the president, and was there anything that I could do to help get his pictures? Do you know Ms. Nancy Hernreich? Yes, I do. And who is she? Um, she is the president's assistant. And uh, she, in fact, will testify this afternoon, and also Ms. Kelly Crawford. Who is Ms. Crawford? Do you know Kelly Crawford? I'm sorry. Um, Hillary Crawford? Kelly. Crawford. Oh, Kelly Crawford, yes. And did she at one time worked at the White House also, did yes, she, she not? Yes, she did. And did you have any discussions with either of them about uh, the comments they had with the President concerning his concern about the photograph? No, not that I recall. D with respect to uh, Ms. Gina Ratliff, uh, she at, at one point in time ultimately worked for Mr. Chung, didn't she? That's correct. And at the same time she was working with Mr. Chung, she was still volunteering at the White House? Um, no, I don't believe so. At any point in time, did uh, Ms. Ratliff uh, work both for Mr. Chung and at the White House, to your knowledge? No, not to my knowledge, no. Did you arrange for her to get a position with Mr. Chung? Oh, no. And ultimately, she was employed by him, correct? Yes, I and understood that she had taken a job with him. And was that after she was employed by the First Lady? Well, I don't believe she was ever employed by the First Lady. She was an intern and then a volunteer. And did she go from being an intern and a volunteer, to your knowledge, to an employee of Mr. Chung? Um, go from being an intern? In, in, chronologically, in terms oh, of her, what oh. she was doing. I, you know, I, I do not know if there was a period in between when she left her office and went to work for Mr. Chung, or if there was no period in between. I, I just don't know. But your testimony is she never was volunteering at the White House at the same time she was working and being paid by Mr. Chung? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Ms. Williams, uh, do you have any personal, I'll wind up with this, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams, do you have any personal knowledge, uh, either directly speaking with the President or in speaking with other members of the staff of the White House, of President Clinton's concerns when he learned of the release of the photographs of him with Mr. Chung and the delegation from China? I have no personal knowledge. Did you hear of those concerns at the White House? Um, I knew that there was some concern about the pictures, but I don't know where that concern emanated from, whether it was from the President or someone else. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is the appropriate point for me to stop, and I'll conclude my examination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one follow-up question, uh, uh, Ms. Williams. Um, did Mrs. Clinton have knowledge? One second. For the buzzers going off here in the uh, hearing room. Did Mrs. Clinton have knowledge of Ms. Ryan ultimately going to work for Mr. Chung? Ms. Ryan? Yes. No, I think you mean Ms. Ms. Ratcliffe, Ratcliffe. Excuse me. I, I'm sorry. I misspoke. Ms. Gina Ratcliffe. Did, did you ever speak with Mrs. Clinton about Gina Ratcliffe? 
left going from her staff as an intern to go to work for Mr. Chung? No, I, there would be no reason. I mean, she was an intern. She was a volunteer. I do you know, do you have any knowledge as to whether or not Mrs. Clinton knew that Ms. Ratliff went from the staff of the First Lady to go to work for Mr. Chung? No, I have no knowledge that she did. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to exceed my time. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, would the minority like to uh, have, have us go vote and then come back? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I think it would be appropriate for us to vote and then come back. But I do want to point out that the issue on the House floor, as soon as the vote is completed, will be a matter that affects this committee because the uh, Republican leadership has uh, requested that rules change to allow this committee to have eight subcommittees, which uh, is uh, quite unheard of and, in our view, a real waste of uh, taxpayers' money. So. Uh, uh, if the chairman would permit, we ought to give uh, some of us a chance to make a statement on the floor before we reconvene. Uh, that that be. would be fine with me. Uh, the problem is I don't want to impose on Ms. Williams' time unduly. Uh, could we have some of the members come back and go ahead and... Uh... I think it wouldn't last more than five or ten minutes for the, the, some of us to make our statement. Why don't we do this then? Uh, Ms. Williams, would you like to get a sandwich or something while we're down there debating another issue? <laughs> No, but I'll be okay. Okay, well, why don't we just plan on coming back as quickly as possible? Then the chair will stand in recess and call the council. will come to order. Uh, did you have a chance to uh, get something to eat, Ms. Williams? Or can I call you Maggie? Oh, you can call me Maggie. Um, you, you haven't had lunch yet? I'm waiting till after this. Until to after this? To have dinner. You might be very hungry. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Waxman, you're recognized for 30 minutes. Ms. Williams, I, I want to thank you again for being here. I, I think it's been an extraordinary uh, measure of cooperation for you to come. And as you can tell from my opening remarks, I, I think Johnny Chung's experience is a classic example of why we need campaign finance reform. He gave a lot of money to the DNC, about $400,000, and he got a lot of access to the White House, over 50 visits. His story paints a pretty depressing picture, in my view. It's hard to see how any member of the public could pay attention to the Johnny Chung story and not be discouraged about the health of our political system. To put it simply, his story presents the appearance that campaign contributions could result in remarkable access to the White House. Now, I understand you may have a different interpretation than I do, and I want to ask you about this. Johnny Chung visited the White House 50 times. He was allowed to bring his business associates into the White House on more than one occasion. He went to several White House Christmas parties. He had numerous photos taken with the President and the First Lady. He attended a radio address. 
He got to eat at the White House mess on several occasions. He even got appointed to the U.S. delegation to a Commerce Department trade forum. Ms. Williams, how do you explain how someone like Johnny Chung got this extraordinary access? Um, Congressman, as I said at the beginning of this hearing, I would talk to you about what it is that I know. Um, I certainly know how he got a picture with Mrs. Clinton, which I talked to you about. I certainly know how he got uh, to go into the White House lunchroom that he ate on my account. I understand, I mean, I am clear about that. Um, I did not know about the uh, Trade Commission. Um, I did not know about several other instances. But about those issues that you do know about. Right. How is it this fellow got such good treatment? Well, I'm going to say two things to you. I am not naive in terms of um, treatment of donors. But I will say another thing to you, which I hope really gives the American people a lot of hope, because one of the things that makes me exceedingly sad is that people watch these hearings and they think that as between the U.S. Congress and the White House, there is not one good soul among us. And one of the things that I want to say is that there were a lot of people working at the White House, not only to ensure that people like Johnny Chung, who was a donor and a supporter of the Clintons, was able to come in, but that millions of Americans were able to come in. And I happened to be in an office, in a situation, working for a woman whose graciousness, I think, is probably typified by the fact that when she was called a horrible name on national television by the mother of the Speaker of the House, what she decided to do was to invite her to tea. Now that sounds a little crazy, a little offbeat, but that was the model of graciousness that we had in the White House. And what I am telling you today, although I do know that certain people in the White House, outside of the White House, pay special attention to people who give the money. There are also people in the White House who pay special attention to people just because they are people. And if we could give more access to the public, to the White House, we would do it. There are security concerns, for one, but quite frankly, in the time that I have been at the White House, nearly a million and a million and a half people go through the doors of the White House. In addition to the regular tour, there is also a special tour for people who need something more. Even the Congress has a right to have constituents that they choose who might be donors who might just be friends and families, to have a special tour of the White House. So we have tried very hard to give access to a lot of people. I that guess the only point I'm making, and I don't dispute what you're saying, because I know the First Lady is a very gracious uh, person and that this White House uh, has tried to be as open as possible, but it's hard for me to believe that ordinary people would get the kind of treatment that a, a, a Johnny Chung got and, it, and that we have a campaign finance system where good people in public office try to think about how much uh, the, the, uh, an individual may contribute or has, uh, how much they have already contributed when they think about giving the scarce resources like of their time and access to those contributors. I'd like to focus for a moment on Mr. Chung's visits. Was there a typical visit? What did Mr. Chung do on a typical visit if there was Well, one. I wasn't always uh, present when he would make a typical visit to the White House. Um, and I really don't know. Um, according to the records, I'm told that he came to the First Lady's office, was cleared in by the First Lady's office, which is to say he was outside of the doors and we made arrangements for him to come in um, about uh, uh, 20 or 21 times, somewhere around that number. Um, and that 
The other times that he was cleared into the White House, he was cleared in by other offices, um, none of which at the time I knew about, but I did know um, from the people who worked at our reception office that he would drop by our office. And typically what he would do would be to use the phone, um, tell people his story of uh, meeting with Mrs. Clinton and what it has done for his life and he would mostly sit and chat and um, wait to see if I would come out of the office so he could talk to me um, or talk to anyone else. That was his typical visit. Did he meet with Mrs. Clinton often? Meet with Mrs. Clinton? Um, no, I actually only think that he saw her perhaps in receiving lines at these large events. And as I said before, the one um, picture that I know that I arranged for was a picture. He never in any of his visits asked for a meeting with Mrs. Clinton, a substantive meeting with Mrs. Clinton. He never talked to me about policy. He never talked to me about um, his business concerns. Um, so I did not have a sense that what he was doing in our office was business. And in fact, um, there were only two occasions that I can remember him ever being with other people when I saw him. One, he had a group of people and um, he introduced them to me. Um, they did not speak English and they all bowed to me and I bowed back to them and so that particular uh, group of people stands out in my mind. On another occasion, I believe that he brought um, two or three people who worked for him. Other than that, I have no knowledge of who else he brought you, to the you, White House. To your knowledge, did he ever come in advocating a, any official business, advocating a position, policy position, or asking for any official business with the White House? Um, never. Not to my knowledge, no. Now, in, in March 1995, Mr. Chung met with you in the First Lady's office and gave you a $50,000 check for the DNC. The key question here is whether you solicited this contribution. Did you? No, I did not. As I said in my testimony, um, on many occasions, he had asked to give money to Mrs. Clinton personally. He wanted to help her personally, he would say. I want to give to her personally. And I said, you should give to the DNC or give to the campaign or any of the other entities that were available. Um, did you or anyone in your office ever solicit any contribution from him, ask him to give not to my dollar amount or? No, not to my knowledge, not at all. What, what happened when Mr. Trung uh, tried to give you this check? Well, it was only, as I recall, the whole incident was um, incident. A um, few minutes, if not a few seconds. I remember him being much more excited than normal and that, in fact, he had in his hand something and kept saying, you take, you take. Um, and I was saying, Johnny, you can't give once again, as I recall, you can't give anything to Mrs. Clinton, because that's what I thought. If you said, you take, you take, it's DNC. I give to the DNC through you, I give. And he was um, once again, not unkind and not rude, um, but certainly in my face a little bit. Um, so he insisted on giving you this, this uh, was it an um, envelope or a check? I really, I really don't recall. Do you, I mean, did you know how much money the check was for? No. Okay. I didn't, I didn't even, I mean, the thing that is most memorable about that event for me uh -huh. is not even the check itself, it's kind of his behavior at that time. After he gave you the check, what did you do with it? Um, I believe I threw it in my um, outbox. And then what happened? Um, well, other checks come through the mail mm -hmm. to uh, the First Lady's office. Um, and generally, if I get them, I put them in my outbox where a volunteer or my assistant will direct them to the appropriate entity. So it was then put in your outbox to mail to the DNC? Yeah, to okay. send it wherever it belonged. Now, uh, Mr. Bennett has already mentioned a February 27, 1995 letter uh, 
that Mr. Chung wrote to Richard Sullivan of the DNC. The document is uh, Bait Stamp DNC 3233326. Three, I think you have that letter. Have you seen um, it? What's exhibit number, Congressman Waxman? Exhibit 171. 171. Uh, the letter to um, Richard Sullivan. Yeah, this letter describes Mr. Chung's plans for bringing a Chinese delegation to Washington. Did Mr. Chung also write to you about this visit? No, he did not. Did you have any knowledge about his agenda, which included meetings with the president, tours of the White House, before you met with him in March? No. Uh, I want to turn to another issue that has received a lot of attention. Mr. Chung and his delegation attended one of the president's radio addresses during the March visit. Are the invitations for these broadcasts coordinated by one person in the president's office? Um, I really couldn't tell you if they were coordinated by one person. Uh, Okay. Did, did you assist Mr. Chung in any way in obtaining an invitation to that March 11, 1995 radio address? And did you instruct anyone on your staff to do so? No, it's not my recollection. I helped him with the uh, picture and... Uh, the with pictures afterwards? No. Um, Some well, I helped him with a picture for Mrs. Clinton. I see. And as I stated... It, but it, not on this radio? Oh, no. Not no, not on the radio. Okay. Okay. In this context, did... Did you mention to anyone in the president's office or the DNC that Mr. Chung had made a contribution to the DNC? No, I did not. Did you do anything, uh, no matter how, how insignificant, uh, to help with this matter? No, not that I recall, nothing. Let me ask you a more general question. Did you ever help anyone else obtain an invitation to the president's radio address? Um, one person, yes. And who was that? Um, a person by the name of uh, Siandra Scott, um, who was an assistant uh, to the chairman of the DNC. Her parents, I don't remember if it was her parents or her grandparents, were in town, and she really wanted them to uh, go to the radio address. I, I want to make sure I understand your testimony on two key points. First, you never solicited a contribution from Mr. Chung. And two, you had no role in assisting with his attendance at the president's radio address. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Chairman, what confuses me about today's hearing is that Ms. Williams had to travel all the way from Europe to be here today. She was already deposed by us for over 10 hours, by the Senate for eight hours. By the end of the day today, uh, it will be a long, full day. And on the key points, she has testified repeatedly under oath that she didn't solicit Mr. Chung's contribution. If she didn't solicit the contribution, there's no illegality. Then the question becomes, I suppose, whether Mr. Chung's access creates an appearance of impropriety. Now, that is a much larger issue that really goes to the heart of our campaign finance system. And it seems to me that if we're going to focus on that, we should be at least willing to look at some of the big fish. Ms. Williams, are you familiar with a man by the name of Dwayne Andreas of the Archer Daniels Midland Company? Um, I've certainly heard his name. I ask because I find it odd that we're holding a hearing on money and access without any mention of Mr. Andreas or his company. Here is an individual whose generosity to both parties, Republicans and Democrats, is legendary. As you may know, he was a supporter of President Clinton. But he was also a contributor to Senator Dole. In fact, I have a series of photos starting with Mr. Andreas and President Truman. Then we have Mr. Andreas with President Kennedy. And we also have Mr. Andreas with President Reagan. And that photo is now being shown. Mr. Andreas and his company gave over $450,000 to Senator Dole, $70,000 to Speaker Gingrich and his PAC and $100,000 to the DNC at one fundraiser alone. He's given to almost every major presidential candidate since Richard Nixon. At the same time, his company has received billions of dollars in federal subsidies through the ethanol subsidy program and tens of millions of dollars in government contracts. Now, in the case of Mr. Chung, it doesn't seem as he was interested in any federal subsidies or policies. Is that right, as far as you know, Ms. Williams? Um, to my knowledge, he never discussed this with me. And as far as we know, he was never awarded a government contract. Is that right? To my knowledge, no. 
Mr. Chairman, since we're going to spend our time looking at access and contributions, I believe ADM deserves at least as much attention as we're giving to uh, Johnny Chung. And there are a lot of others, too. And if we're going to get into this issue, let's get into this issue, because it goes to the very heart of our campaign finance system. The access that people get to Democrats and Republicans, presidential candidates and congressional candidates, the kinds of quid pro quos that they get, if not in the precise term of a bribe, nevertheless one that the American people look at as corrupting. I think that's what our campaign finance system does. It corrupts. It makes people think about the money, think about the money, and then think about what they can do to those who can give the money. We still have time uh, left, and I want to yield at this time uh, 10 minutes to my colleague from California, Mr. Lampus. Thank the gentleman for yielding. I want to welcome Ms. Williams. Uh, you have been a very distinguished public servant. You have a record in the private sector of devoting your life to children's issues, and I want to welcome you to our committee. I want to apologize to you for having been dragged back here from Paris. Uh, and I, uh, I want to ask you if you have any idea what your legal costs have been thus far. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I should be able to tell you that actually. You're totally give us the give us just a ballpark figure. Oh, um, not including today, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Well, I suspect uh, I suspect that's a pretty awesome amount to most of us in this room, and. Um, this all in uh, this game, <clears throat> which I have labeled trivial pursuit, so today we are engaged in I don't know what chapter of this drama. I want to spend a few minutes uh, um, on uh, Mr. Chung as a political hustler of a very bipartisan character. A great deal of attention was paid early on to a picture he had with the First Lady. I would like to draw attention to various other pictures that, uh, that uh, feature Mr. Chung. Uh, let's first look at the one with Mr. Chung and the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Um, they seem to be engaged in a rather serious and substantive uh, dialogue. I cannot uh, tell the topic by just looking at the picture, uh, but I don't think they are sharing jokes or engaging in, in uh, trivial discussions. Both of them look very serious. Uh, when we move over to uh, Mr. Chung and the former Republican presidential candidate and the distinct, well, we are now looking at Mr. Chung and Mr. Gingrich. If we could take now Mr. Chung and uh, Senator Dole. Uh, Mr. Chung and Senator Dole have a more uh, sort of cordial appearance. Uh, they may have been discussing um, athletic events or perhaps the meal that they may or may not have shared. Um, in any event, uh, there is a degree of physical proximity between the two of them, which indicates um, a modicum of intimacy. Now, <clears throat> if we may move on to a lady who recently was in the news again, because she again won the gubernatorial contest in, in New Jersey, Governor Christine Whitman. Uh, she seems delighted to be meeting Johnny Chung, and Johnny Chung is equally pleased in meeting her. Uh, She's, she, of course, is not the only distinguished Republican governor that Johnny Chung seems to be cordial with. If we look at the state of Virginia, we find Governor George Allen uh, literally beaming at uh, the chance of spending a few leisurely, relaxed, and I suspect uh, warm moments uh, with uh, Mr. Chung. Uh, 
Mr. Chung, it seems, was not partial to the East Coast, so let me take you uh, to, to the heart of the country, where Governor Jim Edgar of Illinois uh, is uh, smiling and pleased. Uh, in this case, it's Mr. Chung who seems to be overly elated at the opportunity of, uh, of getting together. And uh, since I think, in all fairness, uh, the Pacific Coast should not be discriminated against, uh, let me take you to uh, the state I have the privilege of representing, state of California, where former Republican presidential candidate and our current governor, Pete Wilson, is uh, serious but uh, very positive in his uh, exchange with Mr. Chung. Uh, these pictures, of course, could be conducted, uh, this series of pictures, ad nauseum and ad infinitum, because if you are a, uh, a resourceful and aggressive uh, political hustler, as obviously uh, this gentleman is, then, then sooner or later, um, sooner or later you get a picture with somebody. Um, I would, uh, I would like to read a letter which in terms of warmth and intimacy dramatically exceeds the letter Mrs. Clinton wrote, uh, Mr. Chung. This was written by Governor of the State of California, Pete Wilson, and this is what it says. Dear Mr. Chung, it is my understanding that you have been nominated as Entrepreneur of the Year, <laughs> a title surely deserved. Congratulations. It is a well-deserved recognition. My communications and press offices inform me that you and your team have performed in an outstanding manner. Your good work, in turn, has enabled my office to serve the people of California effectively and efficiently. Now, I don't quite understand this, so let me read it again, because I have difficulty seeing how Mr. Chung's entrepreneurial excellence had an impact on the gubernatorial office in California, but there may be things here I don't know about. So let me read uh, Governor Pete Wilson's sentence again. He's talking to Mr. Chung and says, your, your good work, in turn, has enabled my office to serve the people of California effectively and efficiently especially during California's recent disasters. Uh, if you read this carefully, it seems that uh, all this tremendous statewide effort in California during the various uh, tragedies that befell the state a few years ago uh, and were handled so effectively may have been the result of the entrepreneurial brilliance of Johnny Chung. Uh, to conclude Pete Wilson's letter, again, you have my appreciation for a job well done. Now, um, I suspect that what we are dealing with, as the distinguished ranking member uh, pointed out, is the seamy side and the occasionally hilarious side of the political fundraising system that we on this side of the aisle are anxious and eager to reform and correct. But <laughs> since we need to look at more than episodic evidence, uh, let me indicate, still sticking to the question of photo opportunities, the kinds of photo opportunities that the Republican National Committee has offered its generous contributors. Uh, photo opportunities. <clears throat> the 1997 Republican National Committee annual gala offered those who raised $250,000 a photo opportunity with Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott <coughs> and Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich on May 13, 1997. In 1995, the Republican Senate House dinner invitation offered those who donated or raised $100,000, I quote, a photo opportunity with Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole, House Majority Leader Dick Armey, 
and Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich. 1992 President's Dinner, this involved uh, President Bush, I promised those who raise $92,000, you get the cute connection, it's 1992, all you have to get is $92,000. $92,000, you get a photo opportunity with President Bush. Season ticket holders. Now, if you thought that season ticket holders is a sports expression, it isn't. Season ticket holders are people in the Republican National Committee's uh, lexicon. They're contributors who gave $250,000 a year. They were invited to attend private receptions with presidential candidates, private meetings with congressional committee chairmen, lunch with Newt Gingrich and Bob Dole, breakfast with the Republican presidential nominee at the Republican National Convention. Season ticket holders also are promised a GOP staff person on call to answer questions and provide assistance. <clears throat> if you are not a season ticket holder, but a lower level contributor, $175,000 over a four year period, you're invited to attend a retreat with presidential candidates, participate in international business missions, and national and regional meetings with key Republican leaders. Now, if you are just an eagle, an eagle is a pers person who gives $15,000 a year, you are invited to attend a White House dinner, meeting in Washington with party leaders, and an international business mission and so on. Now, I find Johnny Chung's activities uh, nauseating and revolting and very likely illegal. And I hope that the full weight of the law will be brought to bear on any activities on his part or on anybody else's part where we are dealing with violations of law. But the fact that in the process of his hustling, during the course of which he got hold of the Speaker of the House of Representatives in an intimate setting, the Republican presidential candidate, former Senator Dole, man for whom I have very high regard in a close setting, these fine Republican governors covering the national landscape from California to New Jersey, from Virginia to, to Illinois, uh, do not make it so unique that in his reckless and mindless pursuit of political leaders, he also was interested in meeting with some people in the White House. Uh, I find the performance unattractive, unacceptable, nauseating, but totally bipartisan. And and, uh, and the, the hypocritical attempt on the part of, uh, of uh, some on the other side to portray Mr. Johnny Chung as perpetrating these photo outrages with, uh, with uh, Democrats only, the facts simply will not bear out. I yield back the time to the ranking member. Thank you for yielding back to me. Uh, Mr. Konjorski, you want to ask questions at this time? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Konjorski, it looks like I'm not yielding you any time. Oh. Uh, why don't we wait till the next round? Okay. We yield back the balance of our time. Oh, let me just ask a question before the light goes red. You said that Mr. Chung would tell you how his meetings with Mrs. Clinton had changed his life. Did he ever tell you about his meetings with these Republican governors and whether that changed his life as well? No, he did not. I see. Yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Ms. Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Williams, I, you didn't see this as any part of your job description, did you? I want to appreciate, I just want to indicate my appreciation for your being here and Thank your you. willingness to answer questions. I've always valued working with you in small ways in the past. Thank you. But I, I, there, are, there are a couple of questions I have because they mystify me and 
perhaps you can shed some light on them. Yeah, I've been looking at the papers I have here before me, and there is one here that is uh, Exhibit 255. Can you, 155? Um, 155, maybe we could put it on the screen. At any rate, it's a memorandum to you, Ms. Williams, from uh, Gary Walters, and it's uh, Bills for Collection. In that um, memorandum, which you received from Gary Walters, at the bottom it indicates oh. remaining to be paid by the DNC uh, for fiscal year 94, $135,345.25. Now, um, in the Tom Brokaw tape, Mr. Chong specifically said that he was solicited, solicited by um, Evan Ryan to make a contribution to cover that particular debt. Do you know anything about that? Uh, no, I do not. Um, the, the thing that puzzles me is that how do you fathom that he knew about this debt for holiday events if somebody didn't tell him? And who, who do you think might have told him? Or where do you think the information might have come from? Okay. Um, Congresswoman, as um, I had been asked that question earlier, and um, my first uh, reaction would be not to speculate where um, Mr. Chung had heard that. I will say to you that um, this document um, or the fact that um, the DNC, along with other organizations, um, had not paid debts to uh, the White House for events held there was really not a state secret. Um, people at the DNC knew this. Um, the people in my office knew this. Um, I, I can simply say to you that this was not a well-kept uh, or um, hidden state of issues, um, but I do not know um, from whom, if in fact um, he got the information, whom he got it from. Mm. You, you can understand why it would be puzzling, because it's so specific in terms of the breakdown with regard to the events that had been held. But so somebody got the word out. You don't, you don't know who did. And you say right. that it may have been very well known. I think that it was, I think that it was generally known both at the DNC mm -hmm. and also at the White House that there were bills that organizations had not paid, including the DNC, yes. Okay. Incidentally, that is exhibit 255, right? Uh, I had another question in looking over some of the photographs and the letters, and, and um, this uh, has to do with the fact that evidently Mr. Chung must have been using these photographs and letters for his own business um, uh, benefits. One witness that was interviewed by the committee said that Mr. Chung convinced him to invest over $900,000 in his company, AISI. And um, he said he was finally forced to sue Mr. Chung when he discovered that AISI was not capable of even providing the services that Mr. Chung said that it could. Um, and I just wondered, were you aware that Mr. Chung was utilizing these letters, um, photographs uh, for uh, his personal aggrandizement for his business, it was a fraud? No, I had no idea. It seems as though um, at some point there was a cease and desist that was sent from the White House. So evidently somebody caught on to the fact that this was inappropriately used. Are you aware of that? Um, the, the, no, I'm not, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not specifically aware of, of that. Mm -hmm. I have another, um, another kind of question, and that has to do with um, the young intern, Gina Ratliff, mm -hmm. and trying to follow the line of her 
uh, involvement as an intern in the First Lady's office. Um, in her deposition, Ms. Ratcliffe said that she started to work as a volunteer in the First Lady's office after she returned from her trip to China with Johnny Chung. And um, I just wondered, did you know that uh, when she was volunteering in the First Lady's office that she was employed by Mr. Chung? Um, no, um, I, I have to tell you, I really didn't focus very much on the comings and goings of the interns and the volunteers. If you had known, would you, what kind of advice would you have given her? With respect to? Whether she should sever her internship or sever her work with Mr. Chung, I mean. I, I guess, Congressman, I'm not quite clear. She was working. She was, she was employed by Mr. Chung right. while she was working at the White House as an intern. I just wondered, have you known that, that, that this was going on? Would you have said to her, I really don't think you should be here or you shouldn't be working for Mr. Chung? I mean, I probably would have said something to a, to a young woman who was an intern if I had found out. I'm, well, I, I guess, clear? well, you know, it's very hard for me to, to, um, to speculate or give advice in retrospect. I, I prefer not to do that because there are quite a few things um, that I have recently learned um, with respect to Mr. Chung through news media accounts. And since we haven't heard from him, I'm reticent to simply receive those as given until we do. Um, we have, um, so I, I mean, I, I don't know what specific advice I would give to her um, about not volunteering in the First Lady's office because she was working with Mr. Chung. I just don't quite know what mm -hmm. what advice that would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I... I General Lady's time has expired. Yes, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, Ms. Williams. These are just uh, riddles within enigmas. No. <laughs> it was cryptic. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kanjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams, uh, what was the policy uh, of the Clinton administration in regarding to increasing access to the White House? Um, well, I certainly know um, that both the uh, President and the First Lady um, we're always looking for opportunities um, to increase the number of people who got to come to the White House. In fact, it was, um, it is during the, um, the, the term of uh, Mrs. Clinton's time as First Lady that she started talking about the White House as the People's House and asked that several things be worked on and done, um, including having special days like the Veterans of Foreign Affairs Day where veterans could come into the White House, special day for scouts and girl guides. The idea was to get as many people into the White House um, as possible. Isn't, isn't it true that you had a policy there to encourage average Americans oh. to come down and volunteer answering, uh, opening up Christmas cards to the president, letters to the president? Oh, the, the, uh, the White House could not survive without the help of its volunteers, and we certainly encouraged uh, people to do that, young people and quite a few older people. I remember particularly being down the executive office building myself uh, when two busloads of senior citizens mm -hmm. from Carbon County, Pennsylvania, were just tickled pink to have an opportunity to be invited to the White House to volunteer their time to open up Christmas cards and letters for the president. And that wasn't peculiar to Carbon County, Pennsylvania, was it? Uh, no. In fact, a number of things we have done. Uh, we have tried to, at Christmas, to go out and get people from all states to come in and participate at Christmas, whether it be their choirs or in-house decorating. Yes, there's been a real special effort I'm really proud of in trying to get people into the White House to see it, because it's, it's incredible to be there. Ms. Williams, I go home to my district every weekend and I talk to constituents, and when they describe their opportunity to visit the White House, 
they, they light up and uh, just the essence of being close to the president, the first lady, if they never see them. And isn't it true? 90, 95 percent of the people that pass through the White House or come there never really get an opportunity to see the president. But just the association that the presidency is there and their particular president is there gives them great enthusiasm. Oh, um, certainly. And I would say that while you're probably right that 95 percent of them never see the president or the first lady, um, Mrs. Clinton has uh, made it a habit from time to time to actually walk through the visitors' lines and to see people who would not ordinarily have a chance to see her. So yes, um, access has been important to us. And, and although a million and a half people a year do come to the White House, even if you did that over the five years of this presidency, that's about seven and a half million. That would leave about 262 and a half million people in the United States that in the last five years didn't get an opportunity to go to the White House. Isn't that right? That's true, but soon the White House will be available on CD-ROM. Right. But what I wanted to point out is when we say the White House, it's really the White House compound we're talking about. Oh, yes. And most people don't realize that what they see as the White House is a very small portion of the president's office and residence of the White House. But alongside, off on the west side of the White House, is the executive office building. It sort of looks like a... Uh, a French architectural, uh, well, I, I, I've never been too fond of it myself, and it lacks air conditioning and seems to be inefficient as hell and probably planned by some frustrated architect. But anyway, <laughs> it, that's where most of the operations of the, uh, of the White House occur in that executive office building. Isn't that correct? Yes. In fact, that's where um, the First Lady's staff is that's where your situated in the old executive that's office right. building. But isn't it also true that the First Lady was actually occupying a working office over in the White House, very close to the West Wing? That's correct, in the West Wing, in fact. So that if I drop by your office, I, if I were informed at all, I would have to know that the likelihood is the First Lady would be there on very, very few occasions, that's that that was a working office. That's correct. So Johnny Chang taking this opportunity to come by your office either had to be naive, and if he was, that would indicate he wasn't that close to the first family, or he wasn't coming there with the anticipation of seeing the First Lady because she's hardly ever there. Is that correct? Um, rarely is she there, and he never asked to see her. Now, the only other thing I'll illustrate now is uh, I've heard a lot of, of, of postulation on the other side here <coughs> about dastardly campaign contributions. Now, I'm going to be a bit of a, a confessor, and I think there isn't a member on this committee or in the House of Representatives of the United States Senate that hasn't been discombobulated and embarrassed when a supporter or a friend or associate of theirs either walks into their official office or sees them at a function and wants to press their hand and hand them an envelope and usually with a political contribution involved. And so often in my career, because of the FEC regulations, uh, the contribution is in cash and you have to end up going to your lawyer, sending letters and trying to straighten out the whole problem. But it's always the case that you mentioned in your testimony. How, how do you treat these people? You turn on them and suggest that they're being criminal. Do you ratchet the envelope back in their hands and say, don't ever come here again? But it's really with a, a sort of a sensitivity that you address this and you try and handle it in a modulated way, not to offend them, and in the other way comport with the regulations and laws regarding campaign contribution. And is that what you describe in your testimony today? when you were, were faced with the suddenness and the rush of Mr. Chung wanting to personally pass that envelope to you and knowing full well that it would take an awful lot of time to explain to him the convoluted rules and regulations of campaign financing, and conduits, and everything else. But instead, you just took it, passed it on, unopened, unseen, and really had little significance. But it did embarrass you. Is that correct? Slightly. I was embarrassed myself and embarrassed for him. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, before I yield to my colleague, Mr. Cox, I'd like to take uh, a couple of minutes. I have not yet had five minutes, so I, I think it's important to uh, maybe explain a little bit of why we're here. Mr. Lantos pointed out a number of uh, public officials who have appeared with Mr. Chung. Uh, and uh, we, we agree that uh, that took place. 
But one of the major functions and focuses of our investigation is the illegal foreign contributions that came into the United States and <laughs> would you uh, turn the light on for me, please? Thank you. One of the main focuses of the investigation is to find out if illegal foreign contributions were coming into the United States uh, through conduits into the American political process, whether it's Republican or Democrat. Now, we know that on March the 6th of 1995, and, and uh, Ms. Williams, uh, according to her testimony, has no knowledge of this, so we're not making any kind of allegation about that. But there was $150,000 that came from the Bank of China in Beijing, China, on March the 6th to Johnny Chung at the Cal Fed Bank. $150,000 came from the Bank of China in Beijing on March the 6th. Now, we know that three days later, on March the 9th, he gave a check to Ms. Williams for $50,000. Now, at the time he got the $150,000 from the Bank of China in Beijing, he had a negative bank account. He didn't have any money. So it's logical to assume that the $150,000 he got from the Bank of Beijing in Beijing, China, Bank of China in Beijing, China, was money that he gave to Ms. Williams, which ultimately found its way to the DNC. That doesn't mean that Ms. Williams did anything wrong. But the fact is, she was a recipient, probably, of illegal foreign contributions. Now, the reason I bring that up, and, the, and then there were $70,000 that were subsequently deposited uh, to the uh, Johnny Chung General Bank account on March the 4th. But the fact of the matter is there's a very strong possibility, and you can see on the monitor, that foreign money was laundered and was given to the DNC. That's what we're all about. We're trying to find out about illegal foreign contributions that found its way into the Democrat National Committee and if it occurred into the Republican National Committee. That's what this is all about. These pictures of the people that Johnny Chung met, he may have met me for all I know. These pictures really don't really mean a lot other than uh, they show that he was a person who had uh, the ability to have access to a number of people. But what we're really all about here, at least is what I would like for us to be about, is the laundering of foreign money into the uh, uh, elective process in this country and whether or not Mr. Chung or anybody else uh, tried to get uh, some concessions in the area of foreign policy or business concessions or anything else in exchange for that money and whether or not foreign governments or foreign entities were getting the benefit of these contributions in the form of concessions to a country or to a foreign business. That's, uh, that's what uh, we're all about and that's why I, uh, I wanted to take my, uh, my time uh, to, uh, to respond. With that, uh, uh, I apologize. Uh, I'll yield the remainder of my time if you'd like to Mr. Cox, and then he can have his own time on the next go round. Uh, I thank the chairman. I'll just uh, uh, use the balance of the chairman's time and take my own time uh, later to pursue uh, the chairman's uh, line of questioning. Uh, the thank you note. Uh, that was sent from the DNC to Johnny Chung on July 24th in 1995 that came from Don Fowler, said uh, to Johnny Chung, uh, I enjoyed meeting your friend who's the wife of the chief of staff of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Uh, the people that came in to the White House with Johnny Chung were all, uh, uh, for the most part, communist Chinese officials. Uh, uh, the China Petrochemical Corporation, Costco, uh, CIDIC, the firm headed by the arms dealer Wang Jun, who himself was at a White House coffee. Uh, uh, CIDIC, of course, is directly controlled by the State Council, the People's Republic of China. Did you talk to the National Security Council about this group's visit into the White House uh, at any time before the visit took place? Um. No, um, I actually, um, if Mr. Um, 
Chung, once Mr. Chung, once it was agreed that Mr. Chung could, one, have a photo with Mrs. Clinton or um, go to the mess, it was simply a matter of clearing in whoever he was bringing with him. I was, was it, un, I was, was your decision? Pardon? Was this your decision? Um, no, it was pretty much... Um, Who made the decision to let the people come in? Uh, the White House uh, security people. What typically happens is if Mr. Chung was going to come and take a picture, um, and I'm not even sure at that point in time that I knew that Mr. Chung was bringing in a group of people to have a picture taken with Mrs. Clinton. I was okay in a picture. Well, there, there, I have a document here that's Exhibit 187 that is a name list of the delegation which was in your possession prior to the radio address. It was my in my possession. Had you ever seen Exhibit 187 prior to the radio visit? Because this is a document, it's my understanding, that was prepared by the White House and it lists the names and titles of the uh, no. PRC people who were coming in. No, this was never in my possession. So you'd never, when did you first see this document? Um, during the deposition. Can you tell from this document who prepared it? No. I wonder if I could inquire of counsel. Do we know who prepared this document, Exhibit 187, which says name list of delegation? It is my understanding this is a White House document. The, Congressman, I believe the testimony this afternoon will indicate that the document was initially prepared by Mr. Chung, and then there's handwriting of witnesses who will be called this afternoon who made notations on that document. And is it the committee? White House personnel. Is it committee staff's understanding that this document was circulated inside the White House prior to the? We'll find out more this afternoon. It's our understanding that that's the handwriting, I believe, of Ms. Nancy Hernreich from the uh, White House. Mr. Cox, my time has expired, and I don't want to. I appreciate the chairman. So uh, uh, you'll you'll get the next. Uh, time. And I will return to this later. Thank uh, you, Ms. Williams. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm curious, first of all, as to whether we're going to be holding hearings, uh, as I sit here next to the Republican wall of shame. Uh, into how he got access to these individuals. Do you plan on holding any hearings on that? Uh, if there's any indication that uh, uh, illegal foreign money uh, came into the RNC, of course we'll look into any of that. Have you, have you attempted at all, at all, to discern that? Well, there has to be some indication that there was wrongdoing before we start an investigation. If you have some evidence, I most certainly will do that. We have evidence. We have $50,000 that we, we're sure, or, or almost certain, uh, came from the Bank of China in Beijing. I, I'll reclaim my time, Mr. Chairman, because the fact well, that I'll it came from the time. bank of... I'll give you more time. No, 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 Mr. Chairman, it's my time. I would, if you want okay. to take my time away from take it away from me, but it's my time. I don't yield at this Well, time. we will investigate if, it's, if there's a cause. But the fact, it's, it's wonderful to put the innuendo on the table that the fact that money came from the Bank of China, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily Chinese government money. But that's what these hearings are. They're innuendo after innuendo. And it's a tra just travesty that we're looking at this, but we're not spending a second on the triad management group. We're not going to look into that. And there are allegations on that, Mr. Chairman. There are real allegations on that. And this committee would not for a second dare spend any time examining allegations against Republicans. And that's why this is such a total travesty. There is no attempt here for fairness. There is no attempt here to balance this, these hearings. This is nothing more than going after the President of the United States. That's clearly what this is, and I think that everybody should recognize that. Ms. Williams, I thank you for being here. I'm sorry that you had to come back. You obviously have spent a lot of time and a lot of money to defend yourself. Um, I frankly don't think that this committee cares about that at all. I think they'd be more than happy to have you go into bankruptcy because you committed a mortal sin. Ms. Williams, you worked in a Democratic White House. That was your sin. And if this is going to ruin your life, it's going to ruin your life. And that's the way this committee works. And we should all be well aware of that. I'd like to ask you a couple questions, if I could, please, about your role in, with Mr. Chung. Before the March 1995 events, Mr. Chung had told you on other visits that he wanted to give to the First Lady, hadn't he? Yes, that's correct. And what did you tell him? I told him that he could not give personally to Mrs. Clinton. He could not do that. And you, al you always told him that, didn't you? Yes, I told him that would be inappropriate, that we could not do that. And you told him that if he wanted to contribute money, 
He could give to entities such as the DNC and the campaign. Is that correct? That's correct. Did you ever suggest to him that if he gave money to the DNC, he would help pay off DNC debts to the First Lady relating to White House Christmas parties? No, I did not. Did you ever say to Ms. Ryan that if Mr. Chung asks her how he can help the First Lady, Ms. Ryan should suggest helping the DNC pay off its debts concerning Christmas parties? No, I have no recollection of that. So you simply passed the check along to the DNC, though, when, when you received it. Is that correct? Right. That's correct. And that was your normal practice that had happened in other in incidents? The checks that came through, yes. Was the incident in which Chung handed you a check the first time anyone had ever handed you a political contribution check in the White House? Yes, it is. Since, it's, since this incident, no one came to the office of the First Lady to give you a political contribution check? No. So the, uh, l let, me, let me ask you this then. This, this fellow, again, from these pictures right here, I would put in the, in the category of a political groupie. Um, would you say that's an, an accurate description of him? Um, I don't like to call names. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not but saying that that's a derogatory name. I mean, he's, he obviously likes he, to be around politicians. He liked politicians. to be with politicians. Maybe that's the negative, is he likes to be around <laughs> politicians. Not that, uh, I, I don't necessarily mean groupie's a negative word. Um, but was he, was he involved in high-level policy discussions? Not to my knowledge. He was just someone who liked to be around the First Lady. He liked to be around the office, yes. Just like he apparently liked to be around Governor George Allen, a Republican from Virginia. He liked to be around Governor Christine Whitman, a Republican from New Jersey. Uh, he liked to be around Majority Leader Senator Bob Dole, a Republican from Kansas. He liked to be around Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, a Republican from Georgia. He liked to be around Governor Jim Edgar, a Republican of Illinois. Uh, Governor Pete Wilson, a, a Republican of California. And apparently the entire governor's office is something that he liked to be on. So he's a, he's a, a man who likes to be near power. Would you say that that's pretty uh, accurate? I would say that would be correct. And you, how did you treat him differently from other people? Um, <coughs> no differently. I, um, I tried to accommodate his request. If I could do something for him, I would. If and, I could do something for you, I would. And so you treated him and his political contribution just like any other one, is that correct? Just like any, any, anybody else, not necessarily even a contributor. But yeah, I, I thought I treated him fairly and I treated him well and I was gracious to him and I went out of my way to accommodate his request and I felt that that was a job that we were supposed to be doing in our office for everybody. Okay, thank you. I, uh, again, I thank you for your comments, and, and I think that Mr. Waxman did a wonderful job in his opening statement because the problem here is, yes, there was too much access to the Democratic pro White House, there's too much access to Democratic members of Congress, and there's too much access to Republican members of Congress. People who have money in this society have more influence on government than people who don't have money. That's what the problem is. And that's why this hearing is a sham, because it doesn't really care about that. All it cares about is trying to make the president look as bad as it possibly can. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Cox. Thank the chairman. M Mr. Cox, would you yield to me for just about 30 seconds? I'd be seconds? pleased to yield to the chairman. Uh, let me just correct one thing uh, that my colleague has just said. First of all, we are investigating uh, allegations of illegal foreign contributions coming in through to Republican, uh, the Republican Party, and the National Policy Forum. Uh, we've had two people in California, uh, detailees and others, uh, talking about Mr. Ted Siong, who gave money to the National Policy Forum as well as the Democrat National Committee. Uh, we have subpoenaed and are receiving information on the Young Brothers, who had a shell corporation in Miami that gave money to the Republican National Committee. We are looking at both sides. It's, I understand uh, the, the reason to try to make it look like we're being totally biased. The fact of the matter is we are not. We're looking at foreign contributions, that illegal foreign contributions that may have bought influence in this country, in the political process. That's what it's all about. I Will the gentleman yield? Well, the gentleman I, yield. I do not have the time. My what about the triad management? Are we looking at that, Mr. Regular chairman? order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just. Uh, I've yielded just, time to the chairman. Five seconds. I am going to send a subpoena to triad. Does that satisfy you? I think that Thank that's a positive much. state. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cox. Uh, reclaiming my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, 
Ms. Williams, do you understand the concern, and I think it is a legitimate one uh, on both sides of the aisle, about illegal foreign payments? Do I understand the concern? About illegal foreign payments? Oh, yes, I understand the concern. And uh, even if you were not aware of it at the time, uh, do you think it's appropriate for this committee to be investigating uh, the apparent connection between a March 6th wire transfer to Johnny Chung for $150,000 from the PRC uh, to uh, uh, the $50,000 check that you received in the White House? Um, I really don't think it is in my... Three days later? I don't think it's really in my purview to say whether or not um, I think it's um, the right thing to do. Well, I, I just I, I ask this because I, as the Chief of Staff to the First Lady of the United States, you have a great deal of experience and judgment. Uh, and uh, if questions are being raised about the propriety of the investigation, I just want to know whether or not you can see a prima facie reason for us to investigate when there's $150,000 wire transfer using the Bank of China in Beijing that goes into Johnny Chung's account and three days later he hands you a $50,000 check inside the White House. Uh, is that something that, even though you didn't know it Ms. at the time, is that something right. you think? Ms. Mr. Cox, I did not know that at the time and with all due respect, and I want you to know this, mm -hmm. with all due respect, if you were interested in my opinion about this, you would have asked me before I was here. What I'm asking you now. Well, I, I do not want to comment now. It's I am a fact witness here, and I don't necessarily have to give my opinion. Fair enough. Uh, with the uh, ranking member, uh, you covered the ground of whether or not you solicited this contribution, uh, and it's your uh, opinion uh, as well as your fact testimony that you did not solicit. Is that correct? Well, that's not an opinion. It is fact. Testimony. Well, to the extent that it's a legal opinion as well as a fact question, but it's your testimony that you did not solicit uh, that, for legal purposes. Is that right? That's my testimony. Uh, you did uh, precisely what? You accepted an envelope but did not open it? I don't recall if there was an envelope. I recall that I accepted something that I believe to be a check. Why did you believe it to be a check? Um, because he said, here, I give to you, I give to you, it looked like a check. Did you contact the White House Counsel's Office about that check? No, I did not. Uh, were you aware of the guidance from the White House Counsel's Office that it's uh, uh, inappropriate for you to accept that check? Um, the guidance, I believe I had from the White House counsel was that you could take a check that did not necessarily constitute um, acceptance, and since other checks had come to the mail, as long as you passed it on to the appropriate entity. Uh, well, to refresh your recollection, the counsel of the president sent a memo around to all the heads of White House offices that states that uh, Federal law prohibits the receipt of campaign contributions in federal buildings. It says that uh, federal employees. Is there employees a document? Excuse me, Congressman. Is there a document number attached? Uh, uh, document, or excuse me, exhibit number uh, 153. And while you're looking for that, I'll just read from uh, 18 right United here. States yeah. Code, section 607 which says that it is unlawful for any person to receive, receive, not solicit, but receive any contribution in any room or building occupied in the discharge of official duties. Any person who violates this section shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than three years or both. Has your lawyer told you about this uh, criminal code provision uh, prior to your appearing here today? Um. I understand it. My lawyer wrote um, a letter about it. Mr. Cox, if I might address that uh, particular issue. Uh, I'm just uh, since you asked curious what whether the witness has, uh, at this time is aware of this criminal statute. I'm aware of it. She's aware of it. Uh, I thank counsel. Uh, the uh, advice memorandum from the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, Regular order, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Cox, uh, uh, you conclude this question and then we'll go on to the next one. Uh, now that we've identified the exhibit, is that something that you recognize that was received in your office? I'm sorry. 153. Um, yes, I believe it was. You can look for it. I, I thank the witness and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Fattah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, for one, am pleased to hear the Chairman's announcement that he has uh, issued a number of subpoenas and looking into various matters that have been raised. And so as one who has at times raised issues in that regard, I want to uh, commend you for your announcement. And I'd hope that as we go forward, we can continue to find uh, uh, opportunities in which we will be able to agree. Let me mention a couple things for the record real quickly. One is, is that um, it is the law uh, that you can't receive these contributions. Uh, what that means in the United States Congress is if you receive a check uh, here, you have seven days to transfer it out to your political uh, office. And that is the rule both here in the House and in the Senate. And the rule in the White House, as by pursuant to advice of counsel, which we have, if one would read the complete document, is that you must move the check along. And that's what you did. You received the check and you sent it on to the DNC. That's correct. So there, so there should be no confusion that here, under the rules of the United States Congress, these are federal buildings under which work takes place. It is perfectly legal practice that people receive checks, and they have, under the rules of the Congress, seven days, an entire week, to move those checks uh, on to their various campaign committees and in the Senate. And the White House is, uh, has a rule to do it and they, in fact, do it much more expeditiously than our rules uh, call for. With the gentleman yield? Wanna, because that's not the law at all. Excuse me. I'd be glad to yield at the, my completion. I want to talk about this issue of access, because this is a fascinating subject to me. We're talking here as uh, co-equal branches of the government, the executive and the legislature. We're talking about someone who is writing checks having access to come and visit. We have more than 1,000 people here in the Capitol every day who have written checks to tens and dozens of members of Congress who access various offices every day as paid lobbyists. They're here to talk to members of Congress about matters of importance to them. Now, we have uh, this gentleman, Mr. Chung, and I take issue with uh, people who have uh, used his name in derogatory terms on both sides of the committee, because I'm not sure at all uh, that that's appropriate. I think that we know something about the culture of uh, Asian Americans who, in their conduct of business, place a great deal of reliance on pictures and relationships and business cards and things that here in America one might see as a little bit different, uh, but it is part of their custom. And as we can see, he was quite aggressive. And as a businessman in his, uh, in his uh, initial enterprises was also quite successful. So until it sets time that there's something clearly on the record that this American has violated the law, I'm not sure that we as a committee should be uh, speaking of him in, in derogatory terms. But nonetheless, if our concern is that someone is writing checks and showing up more than 50 times in the White House over a span of three or four or five years, we have people who write checks and show up here every day, every single day. Uh, and so we even have, and I want to enter into the record, a story from the uh, Wall Street Journal, Gingrich Backer has unusual access as a volunteer in the speaker's, speaker's office. Uh, Donald Jones, who was a CEO, uh, helping to uh, deal with a very important piece of legislation that he had some interest in. I also have another account from the Washington Post, which showed that the majority party here invited a group of lobbyists representing the uh, largest polluters in our country into the room to draft the laws that would, in fact, govern who would be liable um, for the pollution and the, uh, and the deterioration of uh, property that they had caused. So this issue of access, to the degree that this committee is interested in it, uh, is something that I think we could have a broad scope on. And I, this, this other thing that was mentioned in the chairman's opening remarks and has been referred to again is uh, Don Fowler's letter to Johnny Chung. Uh, that, so that he could uh, either visit China or use it in some way. Haley Barber not only wrote a letter, but Haley Barber went to China with uh, the principal of the Young Brothers um, in order to help facilitate. In fact, his quote in the story 
that I also like to put in a record, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Young said, well, with Mr. Barber traveling with him, it helped put powder on his face. That was to suggest that it made him look like someone who uh, knew important people in the United States and therefore could help facilitate business transactions here. So this is not a letter that was written. This was a party chairman, someone who on a weekly basis met with the majority leaders and speaker here and, and Senator a lot and the majority leader in the Senate to as to the conduct of legislative business. This party chairman went and got up and went to China in order to facilitate this gentleman's business uh, transactions. This is the same gentleman who they borrowed the $2 million from and then decided not to repay it in order to finance the Republican uh, contest in the 1996 elections. I just want to ask you, uh, Ms. Williams, since you've said that you've done nothing wrong, and no one here has accused you of doing anything wrong, uh, and you've been brought here from Paris, uh, this committee is investigating Mr. Chang's access to the White House. You were not at any time uh, involved in any discussions with him about official actions or policies in the White House? No, not at any time. And you don't have any knowledge of him ever seeking uh, uh, policy uh, changes in terms of the White House in any regard? No, not to my knowledge. So if the committee was investigating contributions for improper influences on policy, you would have some difficulty helping us in that regard? Yes. I, I want to thank you for your appearance here today. Yeah. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Ross Layton, or excuse me, Ms. Mr. Horn. You'll pass right now. Uh, just. Uh, Mr. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in uh, the time period that we've been talking about here, uh, Ms. Williams, uh, that is uh, March and April of 1995, uh, what was your uh, official title? Um, assistant to the President, uh, Chief of Staff to the First Lady. Okay, how were you paid? How was I paid? Yes, ma'am. By the U.S. government. Okay, by, uh, you received a government paycheck? Yes, sir. Drawn on funds from the Treasury Department? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of the locations that we've been talking about here was, uh, was your office. Where, again, was your office located, again, during this time period that we're talking about here? Um, the office that I worked out of was in the old executive office building. I also had an office in uh, the White House building. Okay. And, and both of those uh, were locations uh, that were used for the discharge of official duties. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we can have uh, Exhibit 174 replaced on the screen, please, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we have talked about this, but I just uh, wanted to redirect uh, your attention to it. This is a check dated March 9th of 1995 from Mr. Chung to uh, the DNC for $50,000. Uh, and you've testified that, uh, that, that you knew that this was a check. I think your words were it, it looked like a check. Uh, and it does give every appearance of that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, is it a uh, political check? It's a check made out to the DNC. What is the DNC? The Democratic National Committee. Is that a political organization? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, in your uh, written statement on page two, and I don't recall whether or not uh, you, you read this in its entirety, but on page two of your, uh, of your written statement dated today, uh, the second paragraph, uh, I'm going to quote, uh, quote this here, and if you would just read along just to make sure that I do uh, quote it properly. So when he asked how he could give and show his support, I told him he could support the DNC or give to the Clinton-Gore campaign. Uh, have I read that accurately? Yes. And that is your testimony? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, if we could have... Uh, Exhibit 153, replace, please. This is the memo that I think Mr. Cox drew your attention to just a short while ago. 
dated uh, April of 1995. I'd like to uh, quote just to make sure that we're accurately stating what the counsel to the president stated in the first paragraph on page one. Uh, it states that this is a review, in other words, not enunciation of new policies or newfound statutes. This is a review. Uh, we then uh, look also uh, at page two, it says that there are a number of criminal statutes which prohibit the use of federal programs, property, or employment for political purposes, and these are punishable by imprisonment and substantial fine. On page three, at item three, up towards the top of the page there, uh, it says that federal employees, including White House employees, may not uh, knowingly receive a political contribution from any person. Then uh, down towards the uh, uh, let's go over to page four uh, in uh, paragraph A2. Campaign fundraising activities of any kind are prohibited in or from government buildings. In addition, federal employees are prohibited from soliciting or accepting campaign contributions. Down at the uh, bottom of page four, uh, paragraph C, federal law prohibits the receipt of campaign contributions in federal buildings. Uh, now here it, it comes to something that I think there's been a little confusion about, and I think it's deliberate. Uh, there is a reference to mail. Uh, the check uh, that we're talking about here from Mr. Chung was not mailed, was it? No. It was uh, I didn't think so. Uh, it was it was received uh, in person uh, by you. Now, if we could then turn our attention, and I know your, your counsel is a man very learned in the criminal law, having been a United States attorney, to Title 18 of the United States Code, which is the Criminal Code, Section 607. Uh, I would respectfully suggest that you speak with him, because in your testimony today, you have laid out each and every element of Section 607A which is a federal criminal statute which says it shall be unlawful for any person and any person is defined in section 603 to include yourself pursuant to your sworn testimony to solicit or receive any contribution you have received a contribution this check within the meaning of section 3018 of the federal election campaign act of 1971 in any room or building occupied in the discharge of official duties uh, and we have established that the office uh, in which you operated and in which you received this check fits that category. Uh, I would suggest that you have a very serious discussion with your attorney because I think you have violated Section 607A of the United States Criminal Code. Mr. Barr, may I speak to that uh, issue? Or Mr. Chairman, if I might? My client is... You'll be allowed to answer. ...not being a lawyer. I'd like to make a part of the record a letter that I sent to Joseph DeGeneva dated March 6, 1997, um, in response to um, an interpretation. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I could... Uh, can we let the uh, council speak, please? Uh, hold, hold on just a moment, Mr. Fatah. Uh, Mr. Chairman... Mr. Chairman, can we... Uh, the, when regular we, order, Mr. Chairman. Did, regular minute, order. Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry. What state's your parliamentary inquiry? When we uh, refer to documents, uh, and folks on the other side are very quick to jump on us if uh, the document is not on the screen and if the document is not in the hands of the witness, uh, to make sure that they have copies Regular order, of documents Mr. Chairman, if you could that we state refer it in the to. form of an inquiry uh, rather than a, a soliloquy. I, I will listen to the inquiry and then make a decision. Just one Thank second. you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it is not the witness, uh, but, uh, but her counsel that is seeking to read into the record and discuss a document that we don't even have, and I would therefore object to that. Well, I, 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 I appreciate that, but I think the chair will uh, allow a little latitude here to, uh, to uh, hear what uh, the council has to say. If I might uh, just pose uh, one further question, Mr. Chairman, and that is, uh, could council extend us the same courtesy that we extend to him and furnish us copies of the document that, to which he's referring? Does the council have copies of this document? I have no additional copies. I can have copies made, but I can certainly refer to this and read from it and provide uh, copies of the letter um, after 
my statement, and I'd be happy to do that. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll allow you to go ahead, and then we'll, we'd like to have copies for Mr. Barr and other members. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is not a, a very long letter, but let me read it into the record. It says, uh, Dear Joe, Mr. Gigenvo, by the way, was former U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. Your off-the-cuff opinion on the Hatch Act given to the national media is 101 years out of date. You are quoted as taking issue with my client's handling of a political contribution to the Democratic National Committee, calling it, quote, totally improper, end quote, because in your words, quote, it is illegal to receive federal campaign funds on property at the White House or the Executive Office Building, end quote. New York Times, March 6, 1997. In 1896, President Glo Grover Cleveland's administration issued an opinion on the meaning of the word receive under the predecessor to the modern statutes limiting political activities by federal employees and the interpretation that, ha that, has, that has been followed consistently through reenactments and codifications of these statutes over the past 100 years. Attorney General Judson Harmon wrote in 1896 in a published opinion at 21 Opinions of Attorney General 298, quote, the place where he, bracket the federal employee in bracket, received the contribution is immaterial because, quote, possession which simply constitutes the taker a mere custodian without right on his own behalf or of that of others does not violate the act. The vitality of Harmon's opinion has not diminished over the years. The word receive and the phrase receive a political contribution in 5 U.S.C. section 7323A2 and the phrase receive any contribution in 18 U.S.C. section 607A is defined today by federal regulations as follows. Quote, receive means to come into possession of something from a person officially on behalf of a candidate, a campaign, a political party, or a partisan political group, 5 CFR section 734.101, 1996. To further drive the point home, the Office of Personnel Management, the agency that promulgates these regulations, has recently addressed this very issue in both its comments to interim regulations on the subject in 1994 and its adoption of final regulations a mere eight months ago, stating, quote, ministerial activities which proceed or follow the official acceptance and receipt such as handling, dispersing, or accounting for contributions are not comfort under the definition of accept and receive. As Attorney General Harmon stated over a century ago, where an employee's relation to the transaction is purely mechanical, and that's in quotes, the employee has not acted improperly or illegally regardless of whether he or she is in a federal building. There are several additional uh, paragraphs. That's. Uh, my opinion with regard and analysis with regard to this particular issue and I just wanted the uh, committee to be aware that uh, there is substantial authority for the fact that these circumstances would not give rise to a criminal violation or a civil violation of any statute or regulation on the part of my client. The, the, the gentleman's statement and the correspondence you alluded to will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Yes, the Senate. It's just, it's just Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, submit something for the record. This is a memo for all members, officers, and employees of the House of Representatives, uh, dated April 25th, 1997. And the subject is rules uh, governing solicitation by members, officers, and employees in general. Uh, in this, and I cite from this uh, for the uh, purpose of bringing some clarity to this moment, uh, under the topic of receiving political contributions, and I quote, however, if someone unexpectedly offers a contribution during a visit to a House office, or if someone unexpectedly mails or delivers a contribution to the office, the contribution can be accepted, provided that it is forwarded to the political committee within seven days of receipt. The criminal statute, 18 U.S.C. 607, includes a provision which specifically permits acceptance and forwarding of a contribution received in a congressional office, provided that the contribution was not solicited in any manner, which directs the contributor to mail or deliver a contribution to any federal office. And then it goes on to talk about the implications of the, of the Frank. I would like to submit this into the record. I would also like to submit a copy of 18 uh, USC uh, 607, 
which uh, spells out the circumstances under which someone, in effect, uh, can uh, in, uh, be a custodian, but passing it along, they're not uh, lawfully re or they're not unlawfully receiving it, and also uh, an addendum, which is the uh, Hatch Act, which uh, in effect would uh, qualify the conditions under which someone would uh, have a temporary custodianship of a uh, of a contribution. Would, would the gentleman yet. yield? Is the gentleman aware that that's not the law that applies to the White House? Uh, I am aware, furthermore, that in Exhibit 153-4, the White House, in receipt of campaign contributions at the White House, uh, spells out a policy of passing along such uh, contributions. I'm going to continue, if I may. The, um, uh, I furthermore want to uh, point out and, and caution members of the committee about implying that Ms. Williams uh, broke any laws. Uh, in, in regard to this, since it's very clear that there are uh, policy statements and ethics statements which suggest that there is one standard that has already been applied to the legislative branch and a policy through an exhibit that implies that there is an equivalent in the administrative branch. Uh, furthermore, the, on another issue, the chairman of this committee said on record that the check from Mr. Chung came from the Chinese government and was therefore illegal. But I would submit respectfully that the chair is not correct. On March 6, 1995, Mr. Chung received a $150,000 wire transfer into his account, which had only about $9,000 in it. On March 19, 1995, he wrote a $50,000 DNC check that he handed to Maggie Williams. There is nothing illegal about this transaction if the money he received by wire was his own earned money. In fact, the wire transfer record itself states that it was a payment for goods from the Haleman Group. The Haleman Group is a Chinese beer and soda company, and Mr. Chung escorted an executive from that company through the White House in December 1994 and reportedly was trying to market the company's beer in the United States. The wire transfer came through the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City. Now, the Senate released the underlying documents about the wire transfer to the press which then reported the facts. For instance, the July 18th articles in both the uh, LA Times and the Newsday fully report the facts about the March 6 wire transfer. Quoting from the LA Times, a partial review of Chung's personal financial records shows that contrary to GOP assertions, Chung had in excess of $300,000 in various bank accounts at the time, indicating that he could have covered his $50,000 contributions without Chinese funds. So there's two points here, uh, one of which is that uh, it, it, there is no suggestion that Ms. Williams violated the law by uh, taking and then passing along, uh, according to proper procedures, uh, that check that Mr. Chung gave her. Secondly, there is no evidence that Mr. Chung, in fact, uh, could not have covered that contribution with his own money. Now, we do have evidence of the ubiquitousness of Mr. Chung. That we have evidence of. Uh, what we have here is, um, is more or less uh, the return of Forrest Gump, uh, this time as, a, uh, as an ethnic businessman. Uh, he is everywhere. He's with uh, Republicans. He's with Democrats. He's at the State House. He's at the White House. But nothing says that he should be going to the big house. Gentlemen, yield back the balance of his time. I yield uh, uh, my time back to Mr. Fatah if he wishes to uh, continue that uh, point. No, I just want to, in addition to, uh, in response to Congressman Cox's, I think, very appropriate question, that does only relate to the House's rules, but there's a Senate rule that I also like to put into the record, which is quite similar, and it's also one that governs the White House. In addition, the Office of Personnel Management uh, in its regulations, which governs all federal employees, says essentially the same thing, and that is that administrative activities which proceed or follow the acceptance and receipt, such as uh, handling, dispersing, or accounting for contributions, are not covered under the definition of accept and receive. And so I think that what we need to be clear about is that clearly, based on all of the accepted norms, the fact that she received a check and sent it over to the DNC is not something that is dissimilar to what happens throughout the federal government and is generally accepted as a normal part of doing business here. And for people to try to make that into a crime, is it in it, it is in it of itself 
uh, quite offensive, and it should be to the majority even on this committee. Gentlemen's Reclaiming my time, thank you, Mr. Fatah. You've uh, helped to elucidate that further. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Horn. Glad to yield the chairman such time as he needs. Let, let me just take a, a second here. Uh, uh, one of the things that we're trying to find out is was illegal foreign contributions made to either party? In this particular case, we're talking about the Democrat National Committee. What do these transactions mean? Now, uh, we can sit here and argue about uh, whether or not Mr. Chung had funds in one bank account or another and, and on and on and on. But uh, we honestly don't know. We don't know uh, if this was a conduit contribution. Uh, was that $150,000 legitimate income that was earned by Mr. Chung's business? We don't have the answers yet. We hope to get those answers from Mr. Chung tomorrow. We're going to be talking to him about that and taking a deposition in the morning before the hearing. But the fact of the matter is uh, the appearance, the appearance is one that needs to be investigated very thoroughly, and that's what we're trying to do. With uh, Mr. Horn. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Would the gentleman from California yield? Would the gentleman yield? Uh, I will. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's also important for us to focus on the fact that uh, while surely we would empathize with anyone who unwittingly received uh, a campaign check and tried to do the right thing with it, uh, what we've got here is first uh, consistent long-standing advice of the White House Counsel's Office, the same memoranda that we used to circulate when I worked in the White House Counsel's Office, that make it clear to all the White House Office employees and certainly to the people who run those offices, such as the Chief of the Staff or the First Lady, that you cannot accept contributions. We have a Chief of Staff who then did not consult with the White House Counsel's Office, neither did she consult with the National Security Council concerning people that I take it were complete strangers. And I'll ask you on the record, Ms. Williams, were the people, and we're not so much concerned, frankly, about Johnny Chung as we are about uh, what's going on behind him. And therefore, these pictures that we're looking at uh, of Johnny Chung uh, with various people or with the President of the United States uh, are not so troublesome as the fact that uh, he didn't even uh, go to the uh, uh, main event, which he apparently purchased uh, for his uh, People's Republic of China visitors, uh, but rather we had uh, uh, representatives of the China Petrochemical Corporation, uh, Costco, Citic, and so on, none of whom I would classify as a political groupie, uh, and none of whom I would say is beyond engaging in policy discussions, uh, walking right in, having meetings with the First Lady, the President of the United States, and so on. Uh, but let me ask you, uh, because we left off uh, on this before, whether or not uh, the people uh, who you arranged to uh, meet with President Clinton on that Saturday on March 11th uh, to watch him give his radio address and so on, uh, was any of those people known to you uh, prior to the request by Mr. Chung that they be permitted these meetings? Um, I did not arrange for Mr. Chung to go to the radio address or any of his uh, associates to go to the radio address or, or meet with the president. Uh, did you meet with these people yourself? Um, I didn't meet with them. I was introduced to them, as I said before. And well, when I, you were introduced to them, uh, they was, didn't speak any English. Was any I, of these people known to you before? No. So they were complete strangers? Yes, they were. And I think part of the concern here is that uh, exactly contemporaneously with the exchange of significant funds, $50,000, complete strangers uh, are given extraordinary favors uh, by the White House. And that is a different issue. Uh, and that it is that sort of total picture that uh, makes us focus on uh, why this money is changing hands inside the White House. Uh, but these people, to you, were total strangers. On the 7th of, of uh, April, uh, the National Security Council uh, opined that Mr. Chung should be treated with suspicion and that he was a hustler. Do you know how many times he was admitted to the White House after that advice was given on April 7th? Um, I do not know that, but that advice was not given to me. Uh, so you never uh, heard from the National Security Council about Mr. Chung at all? Um, no, I didn't. In fact, the only contact I ever had with the um, 
National Security Council with respect to Mr. Chung that I recall was having spoken to someone um, a long time after the radio address when Mr. Chung was trying to get his pictures and he wrote me a, a note. So I was not aware of the uh, National Security Council, um, uh, I don't know if it was a memo or whatever on April 7th or whatever the date was, sorry. Uh, let me ask a question about these complete strangers because it's been suggested that uh, uh, Johnny Chung is sort of a uh, wealthy Mr. Magoo who just kind of aimlessly uh, uh, bumping into people and showing up places. Uh, do you, would you characterize uh, the uh, vice president of the China International Trust and Investment Corporation as a political groupie who was uninterested in discussing any policy? I, I don't know him. But do you think that someone who occupies that position uh, is um, uh, likely to be a naive waif? I, I, I don't know him to say. Or uh, the vice president of China Petrochemical? Does that sound like the kind of person who's just uh, interested in being a political groupie? Well, I don't know him. And boy, you know, Washington is full of surprises people you least expect to be one way or another way. So I'm hesitant to say just, just based on the title. It's quite gentlemen, a surprise. The gentleman's time has, uh, has expired. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Ms. Williams, uh, I think we're sinking to new lows on this committee. I, I just am astounded at the last questions that you had from Mr. Cox when he said that there was an advisory from the National Security Council. It was not an advisory for the National Security Council. It was a memo by somebody at the National Security Council when he was questioned whether they should give Mr. Chung and his guests photos. And he said extraordinary uh, reward that was given to uh, Mr. Chung. Well, that was the extraordinary reward, whether he should get his photos. They were a little nervous about this guy. He was a hustler. And that's what uh, Mr. Sutterfield, I think is his name, said in this memo. It wasn't an advisory. It wasn't an all-purpose alert. Secondly, I think we've reached an all-time low when people start talking about the law. You would think that lawyers would have some sense that they should be honest about it. Uh, the law is very clear. If someone unexpectedly offers a contribution or unexpectedly uh, mails or delivers a contribution, the contribution can be accepted provided it's forwarded to the political committee within seven days of receipt. That's the law. Uh, what is going on here, and I suspect you already figured it out, is Republicans have no indication that you solicited any contribution. They have no basis for say, saying that you violated any law, you committed any illegality. What you're in the process of being is, quote, slimed. That's what's happening here today, and it really is a new low. Um, the chairman says we're talking about foreign contributions. Well, no one has been able to say that there was a foreign contribution involved here. Maybe there was. But all we know is that Mr. Chung wrote a check and then received a wire transfer from a foreign bank. A foreign bank doesn't mean it's a foreign contribution. And if it's a, a foreign payment a, or through a foreign bank, a payment for some business activity of his, that doesn't make it a foreign contribution. You know, the, the thing is this. This is supposed to be an investigative committee. Before an accusation is made, those who are doing an investigation should find out the facts. What we have in this committee is a pattern of allegations before they know the facts. That's what happened when the chairman alluded to the, his claim that the tapes the White House coffees were altered. He still has no, no basis for making that statement. You don't reach your conclusions before you get the facts, unless you're doing it for political purposes. And of course, I think that's what's really going on. Uh, if we have information about a foreign contribution, let's get the information out there before the allegation is made. That's the responsible uh, way 
for investigators to handle things. On, um, just for the record, and people should know this because there are people who watch this hearing on C-SPAN, this committee has issued 600 subpoenas and requests for information, all directed at Democrats. And they've had 10 requests for information and subpoenas where it, uh, it might pertain to possible Republican wrongdoing. The chairman says he's going to get down to the level best that he can to know what the facts are, on, no matter where they may lead on either side of the aisle. Well, I'm pleased to hear he said he's going to subpoena triad. I haven't seen a subpoena to be issued by our committee at all. And I want to make the point for the record that uh, an excerpt from the 1994 interim regulations that say uh, ministerial activities regarding contributions like the one you had are perfectly legal. I, I, I'm going to put that in the record. These are the regulations for the Office of Personnel Management. Now, Mr. Cox, who used to work at the White House, said, don't you know that the rule is different? I will in a minute. Uh, don't you know that the rule is different in the White House? Well, I have now the information that it's not different in the White House. Would the gentleman yield? Because uh, the statute is different, I, as well as the well, advice memorandum I'm given to White House. I'm submitting for the record, and I do not yield. I'm submitting for the record the statement of the, of the Office of Personnel Management dealing with the interim regulations that pertain to the White House itself. It seems to me that what we have uh, repeatedly is a statement we're going to go into foreign contributions. And yet, two weeks ago, the subpoenas went out from this committee to the Teamsters. That has nothing to do with foreign contributions. Uh, what we're trying, uh, what we're trying on this committee on behalf of the Republicans is to try to see if they can stir up some kind of claim of illegality out of thin air. And to me, I think that is the wrong thing for us to be doing. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. It is partisan. It is just not credible as a serious investigation. And we've already spent $3 million on this subcommittee just to fund this investigation, for which we have nothing new, nothing new. Even your testimony is not fresh for this committee because you've already uh, given depositions in the Senate, given depositions here. All of this has been reviewed over and over again. Nothing new has come out of this hearing. And I think this uh, whole investigation is a very sad uh, chapter in uh, the House of Representatives in the history of what ought to be our clear responsibility for oversight. This is a, uh, a ridiculous uh, a process. And by the way, OPM and the Ethics Committee on this issue agree on the interpretation of the law. Only Mr. Cox and Mr. Barr disagree. And I'd be pleased to yield to the gentleman from California if he wants to uh, uh, make any other further comments. But he might want to wait to see what the, re the, the, the uh, document that I have and putting into the record says, so he'll know for sure what the uh, rules are that pertain to the White House. I ask unanimous consent to be made part of the record. I'd be happy to accept the gentleman's invitation of time. Uh, the time has expired, but if... Uh, if, if uh, well, I'll, I, uh, then I don't have time to yield, and therefore I don't yield. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Mike, are you recognized? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to uh, comment on a couple of things. First of all, the uh, pictures that we have over here with the Republican governors, uh, uh, I heard one of my colleagues say that, uh, uh, that uh, they made it into the State House and the White House. Well, that's not a matter of fact, because these pictures were all taken on the same day at the uh, uh, Republican Governors Association. In fact, just look, he's wearing the same tie in all the photos. Uh, these. Uh, meetings did not involve uh, arranging 55 visits to the White House. These uh, photos did not involve uh, $50,000 checks being uh, passed to a government employee in any instance that I know of. Uh, these uh, photos did not involve uh, the records of money uh, coming from foreign sources to make those contributions. Uh, these uh, instances uh, did, uh, did not, in fact, uh, bring uh, foreign nationals uh, to arrange uh, meetings uh, uh, while the uh, President of the United States made a national radio address. And these uh, 
these uh, photos didn't uh, uh, offer uh, uh, the access that we've seen uh, demonstrated uh, here today by the uh, by this hearing. Uh, these uh, photos did not uh, arrange for uh, giving of uh, forty thousand dollars December fourteenth. Uh, 1994 to the DNC, again through questionable sources. $50,000 March 9, 1995 to the DNC, again from questionable foreign sources. $125,000 April 8, 1995, again to the DNC, and a grand total of $366,000, a few more dollars uh, than he could have covered in his account, as uh, alleged by the other side. Uh, Ms. Williams. Um, do you know Miss Kara, uh, I think it's Sandra Scott at the DNC? Yes, I do. Now, you just testified a few minutes ago that you had nothing to do with uh, getting uh, Mr. Mr. Chung and his Chinese delegation into the presidential radio address on March 11th, 1995. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, Miss Scott, in fact, has told the committee that she uh, uh, may have spoken to you specifically and uh, at, and made that request of you. You think she's wrong? Um, I can only recall one time when I spoke with um, Ms. Scott regarding a radio address, and that was a radio address for either her parents or her grandparents. But you did not arrange uh, or make any arrangements personally, and you have no knowledge of your staff making arrangements to get Mr. Chung and these guests into this uh, uh, event. No, not to my knowledge. Uh, you said you, in in your testimony, you said uh, that uh, Mr. Chung had asked you about giving money to the president or the first lady. Was that from the very beginning of your meetings with him? Um, well, as I said before, I never had any real meetings with him. Well, your conversations with him. Um, you have in your testimony that Mr. Trump, uh, he said, so when he asked how he could give and show his re support, I told him he could. Yeah, Did he, he constantly he asked He asked me. you, you didn't say, would you like to give? No. Okay, and then you said you could support, in your quote, the DNC, give Clinton Gore campaign, and you've also said you were somewhat aware of the law that said that you couldn't take that money that, that was some time earlier, before you took the $50,000 on, when was it, March? Uh, when did you take the $50,000 check? Um, March 9th? March 9th. Well, that's the date people tell me. I'm not aware of the date. But you remember getting a check. I remember a check. getting a check, yes. And you, had, and you had suggested to him, this is your words and your testimony to this committee, support the DNC, and he brings you a check for $50,000. It doesn't raise a question or him giving you a check? I'm sorry, it doesn't raise a question. I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Well, you, you gave him an array of, uh, of contribution possibilities give to the Clinton Corps campaign. This is out of your tem testimony in your quotes, support the DNC, in quote, give to Clinton Gore campaign, in quote, uh, help the president and Mrs. Clinton's legal defense fund, end quote. You said those were your standard uh, uh, responses to people who were uh, offering to help. Is who, that correct? That's correct. And that's what you told him? When he asked me, yes. Did you ever receive any other uh, checks or contributions? Were they any personally handed to you? No. For, en for any of these? Uh, uh, organizations I've cited or groups? Um, no. This is the only one? This is the only one. And the same day that you received this, uh, Mr. Chung was also invited to the White House mess or allowed, it's not easy to get in the White House mess. It's, uh, who who no, made the arrangements to get in the White House mess? Well, f first of all, it, it really isn't so difficult to get into the White if, House mess. If the, if the First Lady's chief assistant gets you No, in. because the White House uh, mess is uh, essentially personal accounts, which is to say, but if you, 
I get an apple mm -hmm. from the White House mess, it's charged to me. Did you get Charlie Chung in before he gave you the check or after that he gave you the check? I believe that I had um, gotten him in one ch Johnny Chung. Well, the, I, the group that went to the White House mess, did, was it the officials, the Chinese officials, <coughs> the delegation? Well, I and Mr. Chung, all of the above? Uh, first of all, I don't know who actually went to the mess with Mr. Chung that day, but I certainly did um, ask um, Ms. Ryan or someone in my office to make a reservation under my name for Mr. Chung. After he gave you the check or before? Um, you don't recall? I don't recall, but I do recall him having used uh, my meth account uh, before, on another occasion, before the check, I believe. Gentlemen's time has expired, you, Mr. Mr. Davis. Chair. Ms. Williams, thank you for coming. I don't have any questions, but I'm going to yield time to my friend from California, Mr. Horn. Okay. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Waxman had some comments uh, to make, and I want to ask this question while you're here, because one of the witnesses will come after you're finished. Uh, Mrs. Hernreich, as I recall from her deposition, uh, said, uh, was told by President Clinton after the Chinese delegation uh, visited him in the Oval Office, uh, you shouldn't have done that, unquote, or, or also, we shouldn't have done that, unquote, referring to those pictures that were taken of the President and the members of the Chinese delegation. Did Mrs. Hernreich talk to you after that picture was taken and the President was slightly upset about it all mm. as a national security matter? Did she ever call you and say, who brought them through here? And now I don't recall a conversation with Nancy Hernreich about that. Let me move to a, another situation, the back to business situation. What was the basic purpose of that back to business committee? Um, as I understood, the Back to Business Committee were a group of people, um, primarily spokespersons, who operated outside of the White House to um, answer uh, the charges made about the President and the First Lady. What sort of charges are we talking about? Oh, too numerous to, I mean, there were all kinds of things that were being said about them. Well, did it have to do with things when he was governor or when he was president? Oh, I can't remember. It was just just generally any bad thing that could be said. Th this was an all-purpose committee, in other words. As I understood. Handling anything that was coming to the outfield. As I understood, yes, sir. Did it uh, concern charges arising from Whitewater? Yes. Was that the primary thrust of the committee? Um, I don't believe so. What was its primary thrust? I, like I said, I thought the main thing was to have other spokespeople to respond. The primary was to have spokespeople. Who founded that committee? Um, Lynn Cutler was one of the co-founders. Was the other co-founder Ann Lewis? Ann Lewis could have been a co-founder. I don't know if she was brought in later or if she was a co-founder. And uh, what is Mrs. Lewis's position in the White House now? Um, she's Director of Communications. What is Mrs. Cutler's position in the White House? Um, I'm really not sure. Okay, I'm sorry. She's um, an Intergovernmental Affairs. Is she Deputy White House Director of Intergovernmental Affairs? Um, Does that ring a bell? It, could be so. I don't know if that happened after I left, or but she's she works at the White House. Yes. Uh, were discussions ever held with the First Lady about the information or advertisements that the Back to the Business Committee was promulgating? Um, I'm certain that there was a point that I told Mrs. Clinton that there were people who were um, speaking out on her behalf. Well, did you uh, get some of these advertisements or leaflets or brochures or different forms of communication and ever take them into the First Lady? No, I, no. So you weren't involved in approval or disapproval? Oh, of their materials? Yes. No, not at all. Uh, did the uh, White House or the First Lady's office or you or anyone else you know in the White House 
ever provide the committee with a list of potential donors? With a list of potential donors? Potential donors, even um, one donor, um, one and up. I don't know about anyone else at the White House or if there was any specific list, but as I said in um, my uh, statement today, I, I was asked by Lynn Cutler um, for people who could go on television and people who might contribute to the group, and I gave her um, some names, three or four names. At your suggestion, Ms. Cutler contacted uh, Chung for a contribution the day after the December 8, 1995 White House Christmas party, and Ms. Cutler introduced herself as a friend of the First Lady who was referred to him by you according to an August 9, 1997 Los Angeles Times article. Is that correct? Well, I did give her his name. I, I wasn't there at the Christmas party when she talked to him, but I did give him uh, her name. Did uh, Mrs. Cutler know Chung at that point when you um, gave the name? Had she met him during some of I his tours? I don't know. I don't know. Did you suggest that Mrs. Cutler contact other potential contributors, and how many were they? As I said before, I gave her um, three or four or five or six names. Um, I remember Mr. Chung as a, as a contributor, but um, I primarily gave her names of people I thought could go on television. And um, given my communications background, I thought that's what she, she thought I would be able to give her. In addition, I gave her Mr. Chung, and I don't know who else. Well, Mr. Chung, let's say, is one of the four. Who were the other three? Um, I do remember that I gave her the name of Kiki Moore, someone who could go on television. I don't remember the other three, but those two names I do remember. Is that a celebrity that I ought to know and don't know? No, not a celebrity at all, just a uh, young woman who is very good at speaking on television. And did she do that? Speak on television? Yes. Um, yes, I believe she did once or twice, yeah. So we assume Mrs. Cutler contacted her and got her involved? Um, I don't know who in the end contacted her, but she, that was a name that I did give to her. Why did you suggest that Mr. Chung and these other individuals uh, to Mrs. Cutler to contribute to Back to Business. Was there any particular reason? Um, only that I was trying to think of uh, people who had asked to be helpful to uh, Mrs. Clinton, and he had on numerous occasions, and so his name was a name that I gave to her. Did Johnny Chung ever contact you inquiring about Lynn Cutler? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you you'll have to, can you repeat Did the question? Johnny Chung ever contact you Gentleman's inquiring Christ. about Lynn Cutler? Um, no, I don't recall that he did. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Portman. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to yield some time to you or, or your discretion if to Mr. Portman. If the gentleman yield to me, I'll just take a minute or so and then uh, Could I make a brief, brief statement Hunter. first and then I'd be happy to yield. I won't have Fine. any questions. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a quick statement. I. I've, I've listened carefully today, and uh, we started off uh, with uh, my friend from California, Mr. Waxman, saying the only useful purpose here could be to develop new campaign finance laws. I think that's inaccurate. I think the oversight is very important. I think that's what this committee is supposed to do. I think it's a useful public airing of specific ethical issues, uh, this case surrounding Johnny Chung. And among the concerns I've heard today are inappropriate White House access, uh, improper use of that access potential use as a conduit for foreign money, even potential national security issues related um, to the People's Republic of China. And I think at the very least this has been a useful public hearing because it helps to establish what the ethics rules should be uh, and puts this administration and future administrations on notice, and that is that the ethics rules need to be followed, that do exist, the current rules, and that we need in those gray areas, and they will always exist uh, to seek uh, to adhere to higher ethical standards, particularly in the nation's White House. Gentlemen, um, yield to me. So I think this is an important service to the country, and I, I commend the chairman for having this public hearing, and I will now yield time. Uh, Gentlemen, uh, just yield to me for one comment. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I hope we will learn also to change the campaign finance rules yeah. that en encourage this payment of money for access, which we see permeating throughout both the, Fed the White House and federal campaigns for Congress as well. Reclaiming my time, that's an issue there is not a consensus on in, in this committee, much less this Congress or this country, and I think in the meantime, this is a very important exercise, and I would now yield my time to the Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Portman. Uh, 
First of all, Ms. Williams, to clear up one thing, uh, you were here, I guess, uh, of your own volition to uh, be at the First Lady's 50th birthday party, is that correct? No. Oh, you, you were not? I did go to, but that, that was not the reason I came. Did you go back to Paris after that? Um, I was on my way to Paris, back to Paris, um, when uh, my lawyer called me and told me that... But you, but uh, you, you didn't leave the country, you, uh, you stayed? I stayed because it was a week. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, according to the information we have, uh, you said uh, you did not solicit money from Johnny Chung and you did not discuss with him the money to the, the DNC owed uh, the White House, and uh, you do not know how he was aware of that. Now, uh, on page 110 of Evan Ryan's deposition, which was released today, uh, here's what she said, mm -hmm. talking about Ms. Williams' response. Her response was, we would see, you know, we'd see if we could set those things up for him and that it was helpful to know about his donation because then maybe that would enable the DNC to pay off some of their debts. And then on page 112 she says, oh, I don't know, it was more. I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was something along the lines of that's helpful to know that they're getting this donation. Maybe it will help with some of the debts that they owe the White House. That's the general gist of what I got from her. Uh, that seems inconsistent with what you've told us here mm -hmm. today, and I just wondered if you could explain that inconsistency. Well, as I said, I had no specific recollection of uh, this discussion with um, Ms. Ryan, but as I said in earlier questioning, it was not a secret um, for Ms. Ryan or people at the DNC that the DNC owed the White House um, money. But the point is that uh, th this was discussed prior to your getting the check from Johnny Chung. Well, that is her recollection. That is not my recollection. Okay. Uh, I uh, uh, will yield back to Mr. Portman and Mr. he can Chairman. yield to Quick question. When you read the deposition, did it, it seemed to me that Ms. Ryan was speaking after the fact of the contribution, not prior to the fact of the contribution. So maybe it wasn't clear. No, I, I, I'll be glad to give you a copy so you can take a look at that. I yield back to Mr. Portman. He can yield to Mr. Cox. Mr. I'd be happy to yield to uh, the gentleman from Florida. Uh, Mr. Portman, thank you for yielding. And Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a a general comment too about uh, what has been said on the other side about the cost of these hearings that, that it costs so, uh, too much uh, that it's cost three million dollars when in fact the cost of operation of this committee including the investigative function uh, is far less than the other side spent for similar activities uh, in uh, the time that they controlled uh, this committee I submit, Mr. Chairman, that the cost to close down this hearing, this investigative process uh, for future generations uh, would be much more than we want to pay because, in fact, this process is what separates uh, our government from uh, dozens of other governments, scores of other governments around the world where they don't examine their executive branch, their executive agency. So this is very important. We appreciate the witnesses. Uh, uh, cooperation and we're not trying to uh, condemn this witness but we're trying to find out the facts from this witness and we, we hope to also find out from Mr. Chung where this money came from how he could gain such access to the White House uh, and to uh, uh, the uh, uh, president and first lady in this manner and then make uh, corrective steps so this doesn't happen again if in fact uh, we this does lead to foreign uh, contributions so I thank the chairman. Yield back my time. How much time has expired? Let, let me give everybody some information here, real quickly. Uh, it's the intent of the chair, after the last uh, questioner, which will be Mr. McIntosh, uh, to uh, break for about 15 minutes so everybody can get just a quick bite of something, come back and get to the second panel. I've been informed by the uh, the House, uh, the cloakroom, that we'll probably have a vote in about an hour to hour and a half. So. If we take 15 minutes, we'll still have about an hour and a quarter before we uh, we have to break for another vote. So, Mr. McIntosh. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield my five minutes to Mr. Barr. I appreciate the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, I was somewhat intrigued by uh, your attorney's uh, reference to the uh, letter that he wrote setting forth his opinion uh, on some of the matters that we've touched on here today with regard to that provision of the U.S. Criminal Code that relates very explicitly to uh, receipt of uh, campaign donations and the place of solicitation and, and by whom, uh, I might very respectfully suggest that you discuss with him some further documents. One would be an opinion by the Office of Legal Counsel at the U.S. Treasury Department uh, in 1979, a Democrat administration, uh, 3 U.S. Opinion OLC 31, in which there is some discussion uh, not directly on point with regard to uh, the use of the word receive in the statute. It deals primarily with the location. Uh, but there is language in there that indicates very clearly that the issue of receive is not black letter law the way uh, uh, Mr. Dennis may, may wish it to be. Uh, now, certainly he is your advocate, and I understand his position, and he argues it very, very eloquently, uh, as, as always. Uh, Congressman but Barr, could you give me that citation again? I'm sorry. 3 U.S. Opinion OLC 31, uh, and there are a number of footnotes that relate to some of the specific issues we're talking about here. 1979? Right. Okay, thank you. I would also, uh, Ms. Williams, uh, direct your attention again to 18 U.S.A. Section 607. There's been some discussion, and I think an effort on the part of the other folks on the other side of the aisle to deliberately misconstrue this. 607 has two parts to it, A and B. A is the operative part that we've been talking about here that uh, states very, very clearly uh, that uh, any person uh, defined, as we have uh, seen in 603, uh, any person who is paid by funds drawn on the U.S. Treasury. Uh, cannot uh, solicit or receive contributions for federal elections uh, in any room or building occupied in the discharge of official duty. So on, on its face, I think very, very clearly it applies to your situation. Section or subsection B of the statute, which has been referred to by folks on the other side, uh, has nothing whatsoever to do directly with your situation. It deals very explicitly with representatives uh, or senators. It uh, very clearly does not refer and does not cover uh, members of the executive branch. Uh, and that is the provision that allows for persons in senator representative offices to receive unsolicited checks uh, or monies and then transfer those within seven days. So uh, if anyone in your situation were relying on that as a defense, I think they would be uh, sorely disappointed. I think if anybody in your situation were relying on the defense of it would be rude to abide by the statute, uh, they would be sorely disappointed as well. Uh, my point is that we have uh, law here. We also have uh, a opinion and a review of federal laws, including criminal laws, by uh, Mr. Mick, by the counsel to the president. Uh, not quite tem contemporaneously, but within a month or so of what we're talking about here, uh, that does not go into the detail that your counsel did in, in um, giving us his opinion. Uh, and I think that's very revealing. Uh, the memorandum of April 27, 1995, that I referred to earlier and that has been put forward as di Exhibit 153, uh, states very clearly that no person in your situation can receive campaign monies. Uh, the it, does not, it, does not, it does not have any convoluted definition of uh, what exactly receive means. As a matter of fact, it says uh, it means a common sense uh, definition, which means somebody hands you something and you take it. It does also, as the federal statute, have an explicit and an express exception for things received by mail. Uh, the fact that both this opinion and the statute that I refer to have expressed exemptions for certain activities leaves one very clearly under rules of statutory construction with the conclusion that other activity that does not fall within those exemptions is in fact covered. And I would therefore uh, repeat that under your testimony under oath today, I believe that a 
case very clearly has been set forward of a violation of 18 U.S.C. 607A. Now, what this Department of Justice wishes to do with that is, is certainly not anything over which we have uh, concern. That's been obvious for quite some time. But uh, for folks on the other side to say there is no evidence of this and this statute does not apply, I think is uh, laughable. The statute is very clear. The opinion of the White House by Abner Mikva is very clear. One could certainly argue, uh, uh, you know, about the fine points of it, but I think you have a serious problem here. Uh, Mr. Byer, would you yield for just a moment? I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman from California. Uh, there's something else in the White House counsel's memo that concerns me. Uh, in addition to stating clearly that uh, White House employees may not ever accept a political contribution from any person. Uh, if, they, if the gentleman it, would it yield back just, just for a moment, I have one, one point that I do want to make before my time expires, and that is that I do intend to uh, write a letter to the Attorney General uh, requesting prosecution because I think very clearly uh, there is a violation of the law. Uh, Mr. Dennis uh, obviously does not agree, but I think uh, that is clear. I, I, I do Mr. Not Barr, agree. Mr. Barr, if you yield for just a moment, yes. I, I just uh, finish the point that uh, the memo says that uh, uh, one should please consult our office, the counsel's office, before undertaking any action uh, implicating an exception to that general prohibition. And I just uh, would wonder why Williams did not contact the counsel's office if it is, as you say, extraordinary to receive a $50,000 check. Gentleman's time has expired. The lady There's can answer. answer. The gentle lady can answer. She uh, if I might, Mr. Chairman, again, my client is not a lawyer. I would only point out that the regulations that I cited, which define official acceptance and receipt under the statute in question, the interim regulations were published in 1994, which is some 15 years after this OLC, U.S. opinion, whatever it might say, and that the final regulations were adopted in 1996, and the citation is set forth in my letter some two years later. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, if that, does that conclude your, your, your comments? Uh, just, just one other thing. Uh, the uh, counsel's office, uh, White House counsel's office, also agrees with that interpretation, the interpretation that I have uh, stated here. And it is in writing in various documents. If, if I might, Mr. Barr, uh, before you uh, write a letter to the Department of Justice, uh, I hope you will accept something in writing from me addressing specifically the points that you've made in this uh, in your last statement. Uh, and Mr. Cox as well. I'll, I'll address that did, to you did, as well. Did, 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 did that uh, conclude the last part of the Mr. Question? Chairman, uh, I have a pending question to the witness. Counsel is certainly entitled to speak, and I'm pleased that he did so, but I have a pending question. Mr. Chairman, uh, in regular order, I think Mr. Barr had the time and his time has expired, and we and I, I did yield be, uh, for that final point. He was in the middle of asking it. Okay, go ahead. You, you may answer the question. I'm sorry. What's the question? What is the, the question was why you did not, uh, even though the advice of the White House counsel was before implicating any exception to the uh, prohibition on accepting a contribution, uh, you should count. You should uh, contact the counsel's office. Uh, why, if it's so unusual for you to receive a $50,000 check or a check at all, because you've testified that this was the only time it happened, uh, why you did not contact the White House Counsel's Office? Let, let her I, answer. Go ahead. Pardon? I didn't think of it. I was in a situation, just human, I guess, didn't have the memo in front of me when it happened, just acted. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to yield to Mr. Fatal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sanders. Let me, uh, last week we had a, uh, a witness here, a deputy, a counsel to the White House, and she was accused of obstructing justice, and now you've been accused of violating the criminal code. Uh, and there are a lot of accusations flying around, but nonetheless, uh, just so we can settle down to the facts one more time, the DNC has returned every dollar that was received from Johnny Chung, even though there's no evidence at this moment that any of those dollars were illegal. Uh, in any respect, and all of his contributions, with the exception of the check that was handed to you, were sent through some other mechanism. And so if one is chasing, you know, foreign contributions, they would not just be focusing in on this one incident. Congressman uh, Cox asked you when you arranged for these strangers to be with, meet with the President on that Saturday, um, did you, and so on. You never testified that you arranged such a meeting, right? You didn't arrange for them to go into the press conference at all. The, um, the uh, radio, radio address. Right. 
So that was never your testimony. And that as far as you were concerned and your counsel is concerned, uh, contrary to all of the, this, uh, these wild allegations, you don't believe that by accepting this check and passing it on that you violated any criminal statute or any civil statute, and it was not your intent to, was it? No, of course it was not my intent to. Now, I know that you were probably amazed at the hypocrisy of members uh, here in the Hill. They, we had the chairman of the Republican conference handing out checks on the floor of the House from the tobacco industry, in which members on the other side of the aisle thought that this was just fine and dandy. And now here they are, rather than, I mean, if they have a political problem with the president, I'm sure the president can handle it. You were doing, you did nothing other than receive this check and send it on to the DNC. If you were working here as a chief of staff to a member of Congress, you would have had seven days to do that and not violated any law. Don't you think that, uh, that the rules reasonably assume that there may be circumstances in which citizens, and Mr. Chung is a citizen of the United States, may make a contribution and so that it not be um, a, 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 a inartful situation and you can just pass that check along? What, don't you think that that law makes a lot of common sense? Well, um, I've refused to give my opinion. Well, fine. No, <laughs> don't, you, you need not share your opinion. I just want to make it clear that you did not solicit the contribution from Mr. Chung, that you did not do anything other than forward in an administrative way through a, someone else in the office to check over to the DNC. That's correct. Is that correct? That is correct. And that at this point in time, um, you have appeared voluntarily before the committee? Yes. All right. And that notwithstanding um, the abuse, at least that what I think has been abusive uh, allegations of criminal conduct, uh, which is obviously an attempt to smear your good name. You have served this country faithfully uh, for uh, many years as in a high public office. I want to thank you for your service, and I want to wish you well. Thank you. Well, the, the, gentleman, the, gentleman, the gentleman, I'll take back my time, uh, be yielding to Mr. Barrett. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. What I would like to do is just take a minute or two. Um, Evan Ryan, who is Ms. Williams' aide, uh, is not here today, but her deposition was taken by minority counsel. And uh, what I'd like to do is read key excerpts from her testimony in the record. I think that they're relevant here for several moments. Uh, this is from her deposition. Question, second sentence. He showed her the business cards of his Chinese companions and asked if arrangements could be made for them to eat uh, lunch me, with in the White what, House what, what mess. Page, what page are you on so we can follow you? Uh, I don't have the page number here. There, there's used, there should be a page reference on, your, on the copy. Uh, I, I have it retyped onto Okay, well, we'll try to figure it out. He, quote, he showed her the business cards of his Chinese companions and asked if arrangements could be made for them to eat lunch in the White House mess and meet Hillary Clinton. Quote, to the best of your recollection, are all the elements of that sentence correct? Answer, no. Which ones are incorrect? Answer, he never showed me business cards on that day, and he also asked about the radio address and a tour of the White House. Question, quote, Chung also asked if there was anything he could do to help the White House. Quote, is that sentence correct? No. Question, and how is that, how is it incorrect? Answer, that day he s stated he was making a contribution to the DNC. Then we move down. New section. Question. Then she said, quote, maybe you can help us, quote. Is that sentence correct? Answer, no. How is that incorrect? I didn't say anything about helping us. I mentioned that we were going to check and see if we could set up any of the things he was hoping to set up. Question. The next paragraph reads, quote, the aide told Chung that the First Lady had some debts with the DNC from expenses associated with White House Christmas parties. Quote, is that sentence correct? Answer, no. And how is, question, and how is that, and how is it incorrect? Answer, I never discussed expenses in that Christmas with Mr. Chung. Question, the next sentence reads, quote, Chung believes that Ryan mentioned a figure of $80,000. Quote, is that sentence correct? Answer, no. How is that incorrect? Answer, I never mentioned a figure of $80,000. I never mentioned any money. Question, skip the next paragraph because it is parenthetical, not bearing on facts. Sentence, paragraph following that reads, quote, Ryan told him, Chung said that she was relaying the request on behalf of Williams who hoped Chung could help the First Lady defray these costs. Quote, is that sentence correct? Answer, no. Question, and how is it incorrect? Answer, I was not relaying anything on behalf of Maggie Williams regarding the fraying costs of the First Lady. And we go down. Question, 
We have already covered that. I apologize for bringing it up again. The next sentence reads, quote, and Lewis said Ryan is sure that she had no discussion of financial contributions with Johnny Chung, quote. Is that sentence correct? Yes, and no discussions he, and yes, and no discussions he made that statement to me, but there were never any discussions. I just wanted to make sure that that was, these are questions from minority council and I wanted to make sure those were in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the last uh, person to question will be Mr. Shattuck, even if somebody else comes in. Well, because no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. Let's hope nobody else comes in, <laughs> but you can't do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. William, or Ms. Williams. Well, I will assume that Mr. Shattuck will be the last person to yeah, a question and, uh, and uh, we will then break for 10 minutes. Ms. Williams, I, following on this deposition, because I don't know what pages of the deposition they were reading from, but I have the same deposition, a deposition of uh, Mrs. Evan Ryan, who is not here today. Mm -hmm. uh, she is out of the country and not available, although I think at some point in time she'll be before this committee, and I'm trying to get some clarification. We, for example, know that Mr. Chung was seeking some things from the White House, and everybody's agreed on that. We also know that at one point in time, Mr. Chung tendered a $50,000 check, and you accepted that $50,000 check. But I have some questions that go to this deposition that Ms. Ev Mrs. Evan Ryan gave. For example, in that deposition, Mrs. Evan Ryan says point blank that... What page? Uh, excuse me. Page, I do have the page numbers. Good. Uh, page 109, at line 16. Line question to Mrs. Evan Ryan. 109, line 16. Right. Okay, I'm sorry for being slow. What did you tell Mrs. Williams? And Evan Ryan basically goes on and says, I told her that Johnny Chung was here and that he had some businessmen from China and that he was hoping to get a tour, the radio address, the mess, and the photo with Mrs. Clinton. And he was also going to donate money to the DNC while he was here. You see that question and that answer? Okay. Now, what I want to do is clarify for the record. Do you recall her telling you that Johnny Chung was there and that he had businessmen from China with him? Um, on what day is this the same? I presume it's March 9th because the radio address was on March 11th and we know Mr. Chung did in fact attend the radio address with the Chinese colleagues. Well, even, if it, even if we can't pin down a day, did you mm -hmm. have a conversation with Mrs. Evan Ryan, uh, whom I think you knew well, in which she indicated that Mr. Chung was there and that he was anxious to get a, a tour a radio address, a visit to the mess, and a photo with Mrs. Clinton, and in which Mrs. Evan Ryan said to you he was also donating some money to the DNC while he was here. Um, I don't recall this uh, conversation exactly. I know that she said that Johnny Chung was here and um, told me about the photo and uh, wanting a photo and wanting to eat at the mess. Okay, well, That's th what I recall. Yeah, it's just very important for us to try to figure out who's right and who's wrong here, because we're trying mm -hmm. to get to the bottom of this, and we have two conflicting stories. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily saying they're conflicting stories. I'm saying that she may have Well, I'm have trying a, to find out the degree okay, to which they conflict. She may have a more specific recollection of some of these issues simply because her job was to deal with these, re, uh, these requests. With all due respect, as Chief of Staff to the First Lady, um, these were among some of my concerns, but necessarily not my primary concerns. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I absolutely uh, well, Can remember we just walk through the other things that she made so that you have a chance to say whether they're true okay. or not true, or whether you recall them, or whether you just have no recollection? Fine. She then gets asked again the question. You told her what he wanted, and you told her at that at that time, he was going to donate money to the DNC, and Mrs. Williams reaffirms that. You still have no I'm recollection. I'm sorry, I don't. I'm sorry, Mrs. Ryan reaffirmed that. Okay, could you get, give me the, what, what is the question? Okay. There's a reaffirmation by Mrs. Ryan that she told you two things. One, he wants a tour, a radio address, the mess, and the photo with Mrs. Clinton, and he's making a donation to the DNC. She's now said that very clearly at two different points. As you can see, now we're looking at lines 22 through 24, which mm -hmm. your counsel has just shown you. Mm -hmm. Do you have a recollection of that? I have a recollection definitely of the mess and of the photo and that Mr. Chung was there. No recollection of being told about the fact that he was making a donation to DNC? Um, no, I don't. Okay, let's go to page 110, lines 6 through 9. 
Here she gets very specific, and she talks about what you said back to her. She said, we can see if we can get, that you had said to her, we could see if we could get those things for him, and that you said it was helpful to know about this donation because then that maybe the, the DNC would be able to pay off some of their debts. Now, I don't have a recollection of this, and, and Mr. Chung had prior to, I guess, March 9th, already been a contributor to the DNC and had been making donations to the DNC. So I guess I think news about a donation from Mr. Chung would not strike me as extraordinary or unusual. So you are saying that you didn't say it was helpful to know about the donation? I don't, rec I, I don't recall saying that. Okay. Um, we then go on. You were aware of the debt, though. Is that right? The debts by the DNC to oh. the White House were significant? Oh, I was aware. Lots of people were aware. Okay. Uh, going on to page 112, lines 12 through 16. Mm-hmm. Um, Ms. Evan Ryan again says that uh, you had said it was helpful to know and they're getting this donation, maybe it will help with some of the debts they owe the White House. So she again says that your uh, you response... Should, well, I think you should read the... First she says, oh, I don't know. Right. But it was um, something along the lines of, that's helpful to know yes, that they're getting this donation, maybe it will help with some of the debts. So again... She quotes you as being aware that he's going to give a DNC dona well, a donation to the DNC. Okay, I, I just want to make sure that there are two things because what what you've read has been the the lines that are in between. What you haven't read are the first thing is when um, um, when Mrs. Williams when Ms. Williams had mentioned that she seemed pleased to you. This is a question that Mr. Chung mentioned he was going to donate to the DNC. Do you have any idea how she knew that perhaps that donation would go to pay off some debts? Oh, I don't know, and then? she says. Then it was more. I don't remember exactly what she said. And then, though, then that's but where I began? Then like it was along, something along the lines of that's helpful to know that they're getting this donation. Maybe it will help with some of the debts that they owe to owe the White House. That's the general gist of what I got from her. I don't know. Once again, she is saying that she made you aware that, that he was going to make a donation to the DNC and that you said, she's now said it twice, and he's, she's used the exact same fr phrase twice, that your response was, that's helpful to know. Well, could you explain to me then what the meaning of her saying, I don't know, well, at the end of that? Sure. That was a response to the question to put to her was, how did you, Mrs. Williams, know about the debt to the DNC. That's a different issue. There are two I don't know. So there's a top one and a bottom. I just, re that's right. But there's still, yeah. The, your bottom line testimony well, is even though she says at two different points, I that have no you responded recollection. saying it was helpful, you have no recollection of that. No, I do not. Okay. Thank uh, you, Ms. Williams, for your patience and your legal counsel and everybody else who's with you here, uh, Lanny. Uh, for, uh, I know it's been a difficult time for you. I hope you have a safe uh, trip uh, back to Paris uh, with your new husband uh, and that everything goes well with you. And once again, thank you very much for your help. We really appreciate it. We stand in recess for 10 minutes.
witnesses please take their seats. Uh, the other members of the committee are on their way back, at least uh, some of them are. And uh, we will start uh, with Mr. Bennett uh, uh, doing his uh, half hour questioning. First, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our guest, uh, Nancy Hernreich, Hernreich, is that Hernreich. correct? Hernreich, yes. Deputy Assistant to the President for Appointments and Scheduling. Uh, Kelly Crawford, former staff assistant to Ms. Hern Hernreich. And uh, Carol Ca Ca Care. Care, Carol Care. Uh, former assistant to Don Fowler over at the DNC and Siandra Scott. Siandra. Siandra. Yes, sir. Siandra. Former staff member at the Democrat National Committee. Would you rise and so I can swear you in? You swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I'll be gone. I do. I do. You be seated. <coughs> we'll start off with uh, Mr. Uh, Bennett, the questioning for 30 minutes, and then we'll go to the minority. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In light of some of the time constraints this afternoon and allowing appropriate time for members, uh, do any of you have opening statements you'd like to uh, read in the record, or you just want to go ahead and start? Okay, Mr. Bennett. Um, you know, Mr. Chairman, I'll try not to take the full uh, 30 minutes. Uh, just for the record, in terms of you're represented by a very able counsel here today, Ms. Carey, you're represented by, uh, I believe, uh, Mr. Neil Eggleston, is that correct? Uh, Evan Rebell is here with me right now. All right, Mr. Rebell, you are from Mr. Eggleston's office. It's nice to have you, sir. And Ms. Uh, Scott, you're represented by um, Mr. Judd Best, Judah Best, is that correct? Yes, sir. Judd, it's nice to see you again. And uh, Ms. Hernreich, you're represented by Mr. Bob Kearley, who's in from Arkansas, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and Mr. Kearley, it's nice to see you. And finally, uh, Ms. Crawford, you're represented by David Wilson, is that correct? Mr. Wilson, nice to see all four of you here. If at any time there are questions and you want to refer to your counsel, uh, don't hesitate to, to seek their advice. Uh, Ms. Kerr, you worked in some capacity for with Mr. Fowler, Don Fowler, the um, former Democratic National Committee Chairman for, I guess, the last 20 years. Is that correct? That's right. And are you still employed with Mr. Fowler? Yes, I am. And uh, you joined his staff at the DNC when he was Chairman of the DNC in January of 95? That's right. And worked there with him until January of this year? Yes. And Ms. Scott, you formerly worked for the Democratic National Committee, is that correct? That's correct. If you just will try to swing that mic. I apologize, we only have three microphones for four people. Um, what is your present employment, Ms. Scott? I am temporarily working for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Ms. Hernreich, uh, you currently work as the Deputy Assistant to the President Clinton. That's correct. And, and let me correct my title. Um, the, the chairman indicated that it was for appointments and scheduling. That was my original title, but my title now is Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Oval Office Operations. And uh, how long have you worked in the White House? I've been there since January 20th, 1993. And so the entire term of uh, yes. the Clinton administration. And Ms. Crawford, you formerly were an assistant to Ms. Hernreich, is that right? That is correct. And you now work at the Department of Treasury? That is correct. Uh, Ms. Kerr, uh, in your deposition before this committee, you testified that your first contact with Johnny Chung was in March of 1995. That's right. Did you have any contact with him prior to that time? Had you ever heard his name before? Not, not that I recall. And exactly what was the nature of your first contact with Mr. Johnny Chung in March of 1995? He telephoned the chairman's office at the DNC uh, I was given the call. I don't rem remember that he asked for me specifically, but I was given the call. Uh, he identified himself as Johnny Chung. He said, I'm a friend of the First Lady's. By the way, where was he calling from at that time? He was he... calling from the First Lady's office. He, from from he Mrs. Said, Clinton's was, office? He said the First Lady's office. Now, I, I did not take that to mean that he was in her office. He was somewhere in her complex of offices. But he did office. indicate he was calling from Mrs. Clinton's office. Yes, he did. And exactly what was the nature of the conversation you had with him at that time? He told me that he was over there, that he was a friend of the First Lady. He said, I have some important Chinese business people with me. We would like to go to the radio address on, I, I believe that it was going to be on Saturday. Sometimes they do that on Friday. Uh, and he said, Maggie Williams said that she cannot get us into the radio address, but that maybe the chairman's office could do that. Uh, so according to his uh, telephone call, he indicated that Ms. Williams, from whom we heard earlier today, had suggested that you call Mr. Fowler? Well, she, she said, he said that she had told him that perhaps the chairman's office could, could 
uh, get him in. And I don't believe that he asked for Mr. Fowler when he called. Uh, did you ever, in fact, put him in touch with Mr. Fowler? No, I did not. What uh, step, did you talk to Ms. Williams at this time? No, uh, I did not. And uh, what steps did you take, Ms. Kerr, with respect to his desire to get into President Clinton's radio address that Saturday? This was, I think, Thursday, March the 9th, or Friday, I, March the I'm 10th? I'm sorry, I don't know which day it was prior to the radio address. What uh, steps did you take to get uh, Mr. Chung and his friends into the radio address? I told him that I did not know whether the chairman's office could get people into the radio address or not. Uh, I, you understand, I had only been there a few weeks. This was the first I knew that people could go to the radio address. I did not know that anybody could go to the radio address. And so... I'm I, not sure if it just anybody can go to the well, radio address. Well, I, I didn't know that anybody was in the room other than the president when they did the radio address. So I told him that I would find out what we could do and I would call him back. And he gave me the telephone number where he was. And I went away to... Uh, walked out into the... the reception area of the office where several people were, uh, all of whom had been at the DNC longer than I was and knew a lot more than I did about this kind of thing. And I asked if anybody there knew whether or how we could get somebody into the radio address. At, at that point in time, did he indicate to you uh, the names of the individuals he was seeking to get into the radio I, address? I don't recall that he did. He said he had Chinese business people with him. I'm sure that at some point we had to get the names, but I, I don't remember that I took those names down then. Uh, did Evan Ryan, who I believe uh, her deposition transcript indicated that she procured passport numbers for these individuals, did you talk with Ms. Ryan in First Lady Hillary Clinton's office at that time? I didn't talk to anyone in the First Lady's office. And when I called um, Mr. Chung back to say that uh, we had arranged for him to go to the radio address, I just called and whoever answered the telephone said Office of the First Lady and I asked to speak with him. I did not. Did you have any anyone. interaction with Evan Ryan with no, respect to not. passport numbers of these six individuals? I, if I did, I don't recall that. Exactly what did you do with respect to trying to arrange for Mr. Chung and his uh, friends to get into the Oval Office to be part of the radio address? When I went into the, our outer office and asked if anyone knew how you made arrangements like that, Ms. Scott, uh, as I recall, in, indicated to me that she knew someone at the White House she could call about that. And I asked her to do that and went back into my office. Ms. Scott, did you, in fact, make the telephone call to the White House? Uh, yes, I did. And whom did you call with respect to getting Johnny Chung and the delegation of Chinese representatives into the Oval Office for the radio address? Uh, I'm not sure, but I believe that I called the First Lady's office. And, you, and whom did you speak with or who did you talk with in the First Lady's office? I don't remember exactly who it was. I do know that I asked for Maggie Williams. I'm not sure that I spoke with her. Uh, and if you did not speak with Maggie Williams, who might you have spoken with? It was a woman. I just don't remember who. Was Ms. Williams basically your contact in the First Lady's office? Uh, she was not the only contact, no. Well, Ms. Williams was a personal friend of yours at the time? Uh, I wouldn't call her a personal friend. Okay. We met during the campaign. Um, she has been helpful. When was that call made? In fact, that was made Friday afternoon, March the 10th, wasn't it, Ms. Scott? I don't recall the specific date, but it was an evening and Friday, correct. And was there any particular reason why you called the First Lady's office as opposed to the visitor's office of the White House?
actually get this done, wasn't there? Uh, it didn't seem to be real rushy to me. Have you routinely, uh, and I'll ask you this of, uh, of either you, Ms. Kerr, or Ms. Crawford, or Ms. Heinrich, Hernreich, for that matter, uh, have you all routinely ever had requests on a Friday night late with respect to trying to get people into the radio address the following Saturday morning? Ms. Scott, had you dealt with a situation like that before? The only other time that I dealt with a radio address was for my godparents. And uh, I think I called, I'm not sure exactly when I called, I think it might have been the week of. But uh, you, uh, let me ask you, Ms. Kerr, have you had a similar situation when you were at the DNC where there were calls on Friday night trying to get someone into the radio address the following Saturday morning? Uh, no, I, I don't remember any other circumstance like this, although I don't remember this as being night. I, I remember this I'm as sorry. being in the daytime. Okay. All so. right. Ms., Ms. Crawford or Ms. Hernreich, do you, either of you recall a situation where um, the afternoon before, or let's say into the evening before, uh, the president makes his radio address in the White House that there's been an effort to at the last minute uh, allow people to go into the Oval Office itself at the time the president is making the radio address? Ms. Crawford, as to you, do you recall such a scenario? On Friday afternoons, yes. That would and, not have been unusual. And have you personally handled such uh, efforts at the last minute? To have people come to the radio address yes. on Friday afternoon? Absolutely. Yeah. Are you, would you normally have been the person to handle that? Yes, I would have been in normal contact. Right. Ms. Hern Hernreich, what about you? Would you have been involved with that, or would that have been Ms. Crawford's function? Uh, I would have been involved um, peripherally. I, if, I think she would bring the list to me and uh, eventually, and, and, or come to me and say someone just called at the last minute, and that would be the normal process. Ms. Uh, Kerr, ultimately, Ms. Mr., uh, to you, Ms. Kerr, Ultimately, Ms. Scott advised you that the First Lady's office said that it could be arranged that uh, this group could go into the White House, correct? She advised me that the group could go into the White House. I don't remember whether she said the permission came from the First Lady's office. I, I just don't remember who, who told her. And in fact, uh, you are the individual who ultimately called Mr. Chung? I, I returned the call to him, he, he, and the, the time period was not very long. He was still... Still at the First Still Lady's at the office. First Lady's office, yes. Uh, and you, you basically advised him that he was going to be permitted with uh, his uh, six friends to go into the Oval Office. I, I don't remember the number of friends, but yes. Uh, Ms. Kerr, were you ever criticized uh, by any representatives of the National Security Council with respect to taking these steps? Uh, no one ever came to me from the National Security Council. I've never talked to anybody from the National Security Council. So the. The following week or two, within the following few weeks, uh, someone on, my, on the DNC staff came to me and in a, in a teasing kind of way said the National Security Council is after you because you let those Chinese nationals have their picture made with the president. And they were, that, that was not at all s serious, but they were telling me that the, uh, they did explain that the National Security Council was... Um, objecting to the photographs being given to the Chinese citizens, the well, photographs fact, with the president. In fact, Ms. Kerr, I'll be asking Ms. Hernreich and Mr. Ms. Crawford uh, in a few minutes about the reaction of the president with respect to the photographs being released, but you don't know whether it was a, uh, a jesting concern on the part of the National Security Council or a very deep concern. I, Clearly someone indicated to you that someone was upset with you at the National Security Council, Yes, correct? and I did not think that the National Security Council was jesting. I did think that the person on my staff was making it a more serious thing, was I jesting and making it sound more serious than it And was. I believe that uh, the individual at the DNC was Mr. Eric Silden who that, indicated that to you? That is what I remember, yes. And did you personally ever talk with anyone at the National Security Council about the concern of the NSC for these individuals having been permitted to go into the Oval Office with the President? No, I did not. Ultimately, um, Ms. Kerr, you not only arranged for Mr. Chung to get into the Saturday morning address, but you also handled the forwarding of the photograph to him in connection with his visit, didn't you? No, I did not handle the forwarding of the photograph. Let me, if I can, exhibit 201. If you see that exhibit that's on the screen before you, Ms. Kerr? Yes. Um, it, it's a, f a fax, covering fact sheet uh, to Johnny Chung from Carol Care, yes. subject photo, uh, and I believe it reads, the White House assures me that you now have the pictures, hurrah, I guess is what it says. If I'm uh, not, something like uh, that, yes. If, if you don't uh, 
give me a call, have a good trip. Is that is that your handwriting, Miss That Kerr? is my handwriting. Yes, so then is. you were involved with forwarding. I, I, no, I didn't forward the photographs. What I was saying to him was, I understand you now have the photographs. Okay, I'm sorry. Excuse I, I me. I did not make the arrangements or send him the photographs. But, but clearly you did confirm with him that the photograph had been sent. Yes, yes. Now, Ms. Uh, Hernreich, I gather that it, you as the deputy assistant to the president and the director of... Uh, Oval Office operations, do I have that correct in yes, terms correct. of your title? Uh, you would have had some responsibility in terms of handling logistical arrangements with respect to this kind of visit by uh, an individual and or foreign nationals into the Oval Office. Wouldn't you have some involvement in that? Well, specifically, what do you mean by logistical? I mean, do you, are you the one that basically, did you uh, in any way coordinate the checking of passport numbers or anything else with respect to the individuals taken in to see the president? Uh, on this occasion, um, I, to be very honest with you, I don't recall anything about the, uh, how they came to get into the radio address. And normally I would not uh, be the one who would be checking passport numbers or even forwarding those to. Did you interact with Ms. Evan Ryan, who in fact checked the passport numbers? Again, I don't remember anything about any of the, anything coming up to this radio address or Mr. Chung being in this radio address. I do not recall ever interacting with Evan Ryan regarding uh, anything on this radio address or really any radio address. If we can just briefly play the, the, the videotape of the March 11, 1995 visit by Mr. Chung and his group. Thank you very much. It's like, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yes. Hello. Good to see you. Yes. Hello. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Hello. The chairman of China. Good to see you, sir. Yes. Welcome. And this is my brother, yes. far far away from North West, uh, both of China and uh, Russia. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, it it is 28 see. years to get here. Uh, 28 okay. hours to get here. Oh, oh. 28 hours. Yeah. So we're going to get a great picture, Tom? Yeah. 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 Ms. Uh, Hernreich and Ms. Crawford, were both of you there in the Oval Office on this occasion? Um, I hear some female voices in the background. I'm just trying to clarify whether both of you were in the Oval Office when that visit was made. I don't recall if I was in the Oval Office right then or not. Uh, Ms. Crawford, were you? Yes, I was there. Okay. And uh, with respect to um, your appearance there, Ms. Crawford, and Ms. or Ms. Hernreich, uh, if you were or were not there, who was responsible for vetting? phrase in Washington, vetting or clearing the names of the guest list, clearing the names of those individuals before they arrived into the Oval Office to meet with the President. Are you asking? Yes. yes. I can tell you the standard practice, um, if, that's, if that's what you're yes. interested in. We would it was your responsibility, wasn't it? Isn't, aren't you the one that was in charge of that? Of vetting names? Yes, and clearing the names. No, my responsibility was gathering um, the requests that would come in to the radio address. And I would, anywhere from a couple weeks before radio address to, as I mentioned before, a Friday before the radio address, would take requests from people, um, from friends and family of the president, from various people, and then put the list together. And Nancy and I would, anywhere from two or three days prior to the radio address, would sit down and try to determine you know, who, who could attend. And did you take those steps with respect to those individuals? Those, those six individuals uh, with Mr. Chung, we just saw them on the videotape. I have a vague recollection of, I mean, I know that they attended the radio address um, of how they came to, uh, it's my understanding that the requests came from the chairman's office at the DNC. Um, and as these young women have testified, I believe it was on a Friday, so it would have not have been the normal practice of sitting down a couple days ahead of time. but. Well, I think that's my point, if I can pick up on that. It would not have been 
the normal practice. Obviously, this is an event that has taken on some significance in, in your life in terms of depositions and appearances. And I guess the, that's the point I was trying to make earlier. This was, was not the, the normal event to, to Friday afternoon, let's say if it's not Friday night, have an individual indicate he wants to bring six foreign nationals in to the Oval Office of the White House. And my question is, do you recall, in light of this late-minute request, what steps you took to try to find out who these people were? I do not recall exactly. They were not described, I don't think, in that manner to me. I understood it as a request from the Chairman's office for a gentleman, Mr. Johnny Chung, to come along with. Did you know anything about checking of passports or, or such things with respect to individuals who come into the country? Did anyone talk to you about that? That was, that was not part of our responsibility, the Secret Service. Did anyone from the Secret Service talk to you in terms of how these people are managed to get into the Oval Office? No, I do not believe so. Ms. Hernreich, uh, I, I think uh, uh, clearly at some point in time a photograph of these individuals with the president was released. Isn't that correct? I don't know if it was released or not. I, my recollection is that it was never released. At least my recollection is that I, uh, that I was called about the photograph and I never released it. Well, I believe at some point in time with the photograph having been released that didn't President Clinton, and, I, and I'm just referring to uh, page 67 of your deposition, if you, if you want to refer to that, Mr. Kearley, um, uh, I'm not trying to trap you here on this, Ms. Hernreich. I'm just trying to clarify. You have previously indicated, I believe, that, that with respect to the release of the photograph of the president with Mr. Chung and these individuals, that President Clinton said to you, and I'm referring to page 67 of your deposition, uh, that, quote, you shouldn't have done that, end of quote, or, quote, we shouldn't have done that. Do you see that at your deposition? Yes. Say that I don't. My recollection is that he did not say that in regards to the photograph. He, I think, what he was saying to me, as I recall it, that we should not have brought them in there. I'm sorry. So then, it was more than just a matter of the president talking about a photograph. He was specifically saying to you that these individuals should not have been brought into the Oval Office. That's my recollection. And did he? Did President Clinton indicate to you what the basis of his concern was? as to the manner of these people being brought into the Oval Office? Not that I recall. Did he at any time express um, concern about National um, Security Council considerations? I believe at one point in your deposition, I thought you indicated at page 64 that uh, the President, President Clinton, uh, noted page 64, uh, Congressman, of, uh, the, uh, of Ms. Hernreich's deposition that the President expressed concern about the National Security Council having to be contacted? No, I don't believe so. I don't think it says that. Can I have one second, please? Okay. Yeah. Can I uh, interrupt? I just yeah, like certainly. to ask one question. Chairman. Uh, when, when, I, when I'm talking to my assistant and uh, I tell her I, I, I don't think somebody should be in my office or should be uh, uh, talked to, I, uh, she usually says, why? I mean, she usually gives me a, some kind of a question. Did you not question the president and say, you know, what did I do wrong or why, why, why did you object to them being in here? No, I didn't. Um, and I'm not really in, uh, I, I normally don't question him. I think what he says is, 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 you know, should go. If the President of the United States says oh, we shouldn't have done that, then I say, well, we should not have done that. You're the President, and I, I think he's... But you had no idea why he said we should not have had them in there? M my recollection, Mr. Chairman, is that there was no follow-up conversation, and I, th that's my recollection. Thank you. Did you have any further conversations with President Clinton concerning uh, his concern about these individuals having come in? Did he ever bring it up again to you? Not that I recall. Ms. Crawford, uh, I believe uh, that in your deposition you previously indicated that you remember um, the President expressing some concerns about Mr. Chung and his guest. Isn't that correct? Yes, I vaguely recall. And did you talk with President Clinton about his concerns about these people having been brought into the Oval Office? No, I did not. Did, I, don't, I don't recall any specific conversation, no. Um, did you take, Ms. Crawford, did you take any steps with respect to these concerns uh, 
that were uh, raised by the President. Specifically, did you contact the National Security Council uh, after the fact to follow up on this? I have. I recall that um, my concern, because I would also deal with the photographs from the radio address, um, was making sure or seeing if it was appropriate to hand out these photographs. So I do have a recollection of um, after the radio address, very shortly after contacting or giving a note to someone in the National Security Council. I'm not sure if it was... Did, did you take the names of Mr. Chung and his six guests uh, to the National Security Council so someone could do a little bit of a check on these people? During Not a little bit of a check, any kind of check. <laughs> did you take those names to the uh, NSC? During my deposition, I, I did see a document that um, the names were forwarded to Nancy Soderberg, and that I may have been the person that passed that note down or walked well, Let me, in, in that regard, maybe it'll help you a little bit, Ms. Crawford. If I can have Exhibit 196. <laughs> if we can increase the... Let's bring that up a little bit. Uh, Ms. Crawford, uh, showing you Exhibit 196. It's on the TV screen, and I believe it's in the exhibit book there before you. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have it here. Which is a, a memorandum from Brooke Darby uh, of the National Security Council to Robert Sutinger of the National Security Council. Do you see that that's dated April the 7th, 1995? Yes, I do see. That's uh, approximately four weeks after the radio address. And you'll note the comments there, I, I believe it, it says, uh, Johnny Chung, one of the people on the list, is coming in to see Nancy Hernreich tomorrow. And Nancy needs to urgently, to know urgently whether or not she can give them the pictures. Do you see that? Now, Ms. Crawford, I'll show you also Exhibit 198. Which is apparently a uh, notation of email in terms of the response of Mr. Sutinger back to Ms. Darby. In that Exhibit 198, there is Mr. Sutinger's comment about Mr. Chung in that exhibit to the effect that, quote, my impression is that he is a hustler, uh, a quote that's been repeated a few times here today by uh, members of both political parties. Uh, Ms. Crawford, is there any reason why these memos would be dated April the 7th and not March the 11th if you immediately address the question on Saturday morning with the National Security Council? I did not write these memos or emails, so I don't know why they would be dated. And I guess my question to you is, is it your recollection that you dealt immediately with this that same Saturday, March the 11th? I believe that I followed up very shortly after the radio address. Um, I believe that I followed up on Saturday, but I, you know, I'm not sure if it was Saturday or maybe Monday, maybe people weren't in on Saturday, but Ms. I believe I followed up shortly M thereafter. Ms. Hernreich, looking at Exhibit 196, if we can have that back on the screen again, please. And there's reference to trying to have a visit with you. Do you recall the visit of Mr. Johnny Chung to see you the following day uh, on April the 8th with respect to the photographs taken in the Oval Office? No. Do you, know, do you have any recollection of any follow-up visit by Mr. Chung? No, I don't. Do you have any recollection of speaking with Ms. Crawford? Uh, with respect to her contact with the National Security Council, whether it was on March the 11th or April the 7th? No, I don't have any recollection of, any, of speaking with her about conversations she had with the NSC. Ultimately, what was the response of the National Security Council? What was the position? Well, I don't recall. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Hernrick. Ms. Crawford, you wanted to add something? Excuse yes, me. If Exhibit 187. Well, I'm sorry. Exhibit I'm, 187 in my book indicates, which was shown to me during yeah. my deposition, the name and the list of the delegations and a note that went to Nancy Soderberg, who is in the NSC. I, I was going to get to that in a second. We can go to that right now if you'd like. But just because that, this is what I believe would have been the contact shortly thereafter, which would have been two days thereafter. All right, Ms. Crawford, do you recall Ms. Uh, Darby calling you and advising you not to permit this photograph to be released? 
I don't specifically recall a conversation with Ms. Darby. I, I thought at page 62 of your deposition, you indicated I that mean, you recall. I I, I'm sure that I talked with Ms. Darby, but I don't specifically recall what she told me to do with the photographs. Well, Ms. D uh, Brooke Darby of the National Security Council is uh, testifying before this committee tomorrow afternoon, and uh, according to comments she has made to members of the staff of this committee, she indicates that she specifically told you, Ms. Crawford, not to have photographs of Mr. Chung and his guest released. And I, I, I interpreted that comment made recently by her in preparation for her appearance tomorrow to be consistent with your deposition testimony where you indicated, I thought, that you recalled her, in fact, calling you saying, don't release this photograph. Can you show me in my deposition? I recall having a conversation with Ms. Darby about this, but right. I don't specifically recall her saying. Let me address, if we can, the points you were trying to make on the exhibit. Uh, Ms. Hernreich, directing your attention to exhibit 187. 187, uh, if we can also put up exhibit, first of all, exhibit 171-1. One seven one one is the second page of a letter forwarded by Mr. Chung. And then now looking at Exhibit 187, that is handwriting and notation on that second page. Mm -hmm. Do you see that there, Ms. Hernreich? Yeah, 187. Yes. yes. And in directing your attention to Exhibit 187, um, that is actually your handwriting, isn't it, Mrs. Hernreich? Ms. Hernreich? Yes, that's correct. And referring to that exhibit, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, if I'm not reading that correctly, tell me, but the handwriting reads, someone from DNC asked to let into radio address, before photos are sent out, we need to know if we should not send them. Isn't that correct? That's what it says. Uh, Ms. Kerr, ultimately, you did learn that the White House, in fact, sent the photographs, correct, as it reflected by the facts I, that was sent that out? That facts reflects that. I, I do not, independent of that fact, remember what the final outcome was of this. But, but clearly the facts reflects that it was sent. And I guess my question to, uh, to all of you is, do any of you know the individual at the White House, this is directed to the entire panel of four, the, White House, the individual at the White House who made the decision to send these photographs of President Clinton, and Mr. Chung, and his friends out to Mr. Chung despite the warnings of the National Security Council. Do you know who made that decision? Mr. Bennett, may I speak for a moment? Certainly, um, Mr. Ray. Do we know for certain that that, fo those fo that photograph with the group was sent out? And, and yeah, you know, my recollection is that Mr. Chung called quite a bit about these photographs and that they were never released. And, um, only yesterday did I find out that he had, in going through some of this, that he had received any photographs. And I'm wondering whether he received only the photograph of him and his brother, and that the photographs of the entire group were never released. I've not seen that photograph in any of, of his literature or anywhere else. It is my recollection that those photographs were never sent to him. Uh, Ms. Returning in response, I'll tell you on behalf of the committee, we're okay. going to be interviewing Mr. Um, Chung tomorrow okay. under oath. And that's one of the many things we like to find out. And Mr. Chairman, if I can just have about 30 more seconds in light of yielding my earlier time and I'll be finished. Um, just one last thing, Ms. Hernreich, yes. and uh, if you would, uh, specifically referring to Exhibit 215, and uh, you also, Ms. Crawford, or actually, Ms. Hernreich, uh, either one of you, those of you that were in, working at the White House, uh, this is an email at the White House dated November 30, 1995. Do you see that? where there is a specific notation that at a, as of November 22, 1995, we will not honor requests from Johnny Chung. And there's reference to his, quote, improperly using photo or business people, uh, photo of business people and the president. Do you recall receiving this email, Ms. Hernreich? Uh, that, no, I don't. The email is not to me. Uh, do, you, I mean, do you recall ever seeing it, Ms. Crawford? Did you ever see that email? No, this is the first time I believe that I have seen this. Do either of you ever recall any conversations concerning a policy that was established as of November 22nd of 1995 at the Clinton White House uh, in light of Mr. Chung's use of these photographs? Do, do either one of you recall that? Mr. Bennett, what I recall, and, and my memory is not uh, great a lot, of time, a lot of the time, but what I recall is conversations with the photo office 
that we would not send those photographs of the business people with uh, Mr. Chung from the beginning. That's my recollection of My question to you is in terms of this follow-up, Mr. Chairman, I'll be, I'm finished and thank you. This, th that, mem that email clearly establishing a policy in November of 1995, neither of you recall actually seeing that email or being aware of its issuance at the White House. That's correct. I do not Thank you. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Enreich, uh, I understand you essentially serve as President Clinton's gatekeeper. Uh, can you explain what that means? Well, I am basically uh, responsible uh, on a daily basis for uh, uh, who he sees and what paper he sees, what phone calls he you know, receives, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, for all of those things, I uh, am his gatekeeper. And you manage a staff of how many people? Yes, I have a, a, a nine or ten people. And you look at the, you manage the flow of the paper to the president, the memos, letters, notes, and other ad individual uh, order orders to, uh, that the people want to get to the president. That's correct. Okay. Do you field, uh, do you keep a schedule? Um, I, what we try to do is implement the schedule uh, every day. That's part of our responsibility, to make sure that uh, he does what he's supposed to be doing on, as it relates to the schedule and that he accomplishes the goals that he's supposed to accomplish each day. And you field a lot of the phone calls? Yes, we do take a lot of phone calls. And you handle visitors to the Oval Office? That's correct. Does that include staff who will be meeting with the President? That's correct. Does your office handle the President's personal correspondence? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, I'd like the committee to understand what a typical day is like for you. <laughs> I understand you work six days a week. Uh, how many hours do you typically work each day? Well, I, usually the minimum is 12 hours. How many pieces of paper do you review in a typical day? Uh, I would say a minimum of probably 150 pieces of paper. Do you do a quick review to determine where to send the pieces of paper? Is that your, your job? Correct. I yeah, also review the paper that goes to the president. Uh, it comes uh, often. It'll come from the staff area or other sources. I review that, and then I review uh, correspondence, uh, other uh, pieces of paper that come to me, and and then I d decide where to send them. How many visitors to the president does your office deal with on a typical day? Uh, including staff, oh, at least a hundred. And uh, you help to determine who gets in and who doesn't. That's correct. How many phone calls does your office field in a typical day? Including staff, usually we get a lot of uh, phone calls from staff asking, not asking to speak to the president, but asking us, you know, what the president's doing or opinion of what he might want on something. So I would say, oh, probably that same amount, 100, 150 phone calls at least a day. Mm -hmm. How many of those do you personally return, do you think? Well, I speak to a lot of the, the staff people directly. I return a lot of my own phone calls. If I don't get them done that day, I'll return them the next day or the first opportunity I have. In sum, on a typical day, you're required to review hundreds of pages of paper, talk to dozens of individuals in person, speak to dozens of people on the phone, keep the president on schedule, manage a staff of nine, and handle any emergencies that might come up. That sounds like a <laughs> And you do that six day. days a week. Pardon me? And you do that six days a week? Uh, normally six days Sounds a week. Sounds like you're constantly in motion. It's true. Uh, were you involved in organizing the president's uh, radio addresses? Yes. And what was your role in regard to those events? My role is to primarily oversee the, to go over with my assistant the last list and determine um, who actually gets into the radio address. What's the purpose of inviting guests to attend the radio address? Um, the purpose is basically to, uh, because I give the, the president an opportunity to visit with uh, his friends and his friends to see him. Um, another reason to have people at the radio address is because staff people often want to bring their families in to meet the president, and we really don't have a good opportunity during the week to do that. So this is a, a nice way to have an audience and then afterwards to have photographs, and so and a chance for them, uh, staff and cabinet members, to bring their families in to, to meet the president. Uh, and the, the third reason is actually it's good for the president. He <laughs> enjoys having an audience. Uh, he loves people, and uh, he wants to be accessible to his staff and to his friends and there's not that time often and so this is a good chance for that and he makes him feel good and I think it it puts a nice tone on the radio address for him he likes it how many radio addresses does he give each year 
I think, well, he gives one a week, 52. Uh, we have audiences, I think, for about 40 a year, because he probably does around 40 in the office. 40 a year in which you'd have audiences. And how That's many correct. how many people typically in an audience? Um, probably about uh, 60, an average of 60. Some days are 100, and some days are 40. But so we're talking about over 10,000, uh, maybe 15,000 people attending a radio address since the start of the Clinton administration in 1993. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. Uh, do you remember each of the 10 to 15,000 people who attended a radio address? No, I don't. Okay. How long have you been working for the president? I've been working for the president uh, since 1985. So around 12. when he was governor. 12 years. And uh, you've been at the White House for four and a half years now. In your experience, uh, is the president pretty courteous to people? Pardon me? Is the president a courteous individual? He's extremely courteous. Uh, he loves people, and um, he, I think he wants to do things for other people, and this is a great opportunity for him to do that. He has a And uh, we saw a videotape of, of the president greeting uh, Johnny Chung. Mm -hmm. uh, on the, uh, and would you say that was unusual for the president uh, when he greeted Johnny Chung? No, it's not unusual at all. Uh, he's he friendly. Gre he greets most of his friends like that. And does the president get his picture taken with lots of people? Lots of people. Does the president generally smile when someone wants the picture taken with him? Absolutely. Okay. Um, because of the nature of your job, do you generally know who the president's personal friends are? Yes, I do. Was Johnny Chung a personal friend of the president? The president considered Johnny Chung a personal friend. Okay. Did uh, you have any role in helping Johnny Chung attend the March 11, 1995 radio address? I honestly don't remember anything leading up to the time that he, you know, what, what took place to, that caused him to, to come to the radio address. Did you have any conversations with Maggie Williams about Johnny Chung's request to attend the radio address? I don't recall any conversations with Maggie Williams about the, him coming to that radio Did address. Did Evan Ryan contact you to request that Johnny Chung be allowed to come to that radio address? I don't recall that Evan Ryan called me at all on that. Did you have any conversations with anyone else in the First Lady's office requesting that Johnny Chung be allowed to attend this radio address? No, I don't believe so. And I think you testify you don't remember seeing Johnny Chung at the radio address. I don't remember it, no. Let me ask you a few bottom line questions about Johnny Chung. Did Johnny Chung ever tell you that he would make a contribution if he could attend a radio address? Absolutely not. Uh, did Johnny Chung ever talk to you about political contributions? No. Did Johnny Chung ever talk to you about policy matters? Did he ever tell you that he was trying to get a change in U.S. policy? No. And did you ever solicit contributions from Johnny Chung? No. Let, while I'm on the subject, let me ask you uh, some very general questions. While you worked at the White House, did you ever solicit contributions from anyone? Absolutely not. And did you ever observe any White House staffers soliciting contributions from anyone? No. Ms. Uh, Kahar, uh, John, Johnny Chung called you in March 1995. Did you know who he was at that time? No, I didn't. And he identified himself as Johnny Chung, I assume. He did. And he said, uh, what, he's a friend of the First he Lady? He said, I'm a friend of the First Lady. He was, did he say he was calling from the First Lady's office? Yes, he did. And he also said that M Maggie Williams couldn't help him get into the radio address? That That's right. right. Yeah. Uh, you had someone in your office handle the request after he had called, isn't that right? That's right. And you asked Ms. Scott to, to see what she could do about it? Well, I asked if anyone knew what could be done about it, and Ms. Scott volunteered to, to try. You didn't handle that request yourself? No, I really didn't know how. Okay. You didn't tell Chairman Fowler about the request? Not that I recall. I don't think I did. You, uh, you eventually passed it off to Ms. Scott? Yes. Okay. And Ms. Scott told you that the request had been approved at some point that day? Yes. And you called Mr. Chung back at the First Lady's office to let him know, isn't that right? That's right. Uh, you don't remember his name being mentioned in the, in the office before that time? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I, I know now from, from discussions and depositions and that kind of thing that he had been in the office a few days before, but I, I was not aware of that at the time. Did, did you know at the time he had made any campaign contributions? No. Uh, the way you handled Johnny Chung's request was the same way you would have handled uh, any friend or supporter's request to attend a radio address. Is that right? I, I hope so, yeah. yes. You didn't do this. You, you didn't just do this for financial contributors. You did it for others as well. Yes. Um, you didn't accept Johnny Chung's invitation to travel to China, did you? No, I didn't. Yeah. And Chairman Fowler didn't accept his offer either, did he? No. Yeah. Uh, 
there was a, a question about whether he should get these, well, let me ask Ms. Scott some questions first. I'm going to get to that. Uh, Ms. Ms. Scott, you said that Carol Kehare asked you to find out if Johnny Chung and his guests could attend that March 11 radio address. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. She made a general statement. And, and did you office. know how to handle that? Uh, not specifically. I said I would make a call to a friend. You made a call to the First Lady's office to see what you could do? I think so. And uh, the purpose of that call was to have someone lead you in the right direction. Is that correct? That's correct. You, you, as I recall your testimony, you didn't recall whether you spoke to Ms. Williams at that time, but you talked to somebody there. That's correct. And um, okay. um, you think someone took a message and someone called you back? Is that your recollection of what happened? Or did they arrange it right on the spot? Uh, they called me back. Okay. Is it possible that someone from another office in the White House, someone in the President's office might have called you back? I don't think so, but I'm not sure. In addition to the radio address attended uh, by Johnny Chung, you made arrangements for some family members to attend a radio address, isn't that right? That's correct. And at that time, did you call the First Lady's office? Uh, yes, I did. Is it possible that you're... Okay. You're not confusing this call with the call about Johnny Chung? I don't think so. Okay. Sure. Now, Johnny Chung was at this White House uh, radio address, and we saw on the videotape that some photos were taken of him and his guests. Uh, wouldn't it have been routine for him to get the photos? Who would have been in charge of the photos? Would that be the White House or the DNC? It would have been our office would have been in charge of or my assistant normally is the person responsible for sending the photos out after the radio. Now, Ms. Crawford, uh, why was there a hang up about the photos? I believe we wanted to make sure that we knew who these people were and that it was appropriate to send the photographs out. And, and eventually uh, someone from the uh, National Security Council had to take a, a, a look at this. Is that right? That was Mr. Sutinger? From that, that's, seeing that's the email, you know evidently, that's the process that happened. That's I, I want to yield to Mr. Fatah for some further questions on this. <coughs> Thank you very much. Let me, uh, Ms. Scott, I want you to answer the same question that um, Congressman Waxman asked of, uh, of someone else. You were also invited to travel to, with uh, Johnny Chung? Yes, sir. And you declined a trip to China? Uh, yes, I did. It seemed uh, inappropriate. Okay. So, Johnny Chung made a lot of invitations, and um, mm -hmm. people declined it. Let me, um, let me go back to this uh, radio address. I was at one of the president's radio addresses. Good. We do have members of Congress in yes, the Yes, and I, I appreciated the opportunity to be there. Good. Um, and we've heard that uh, Mrs. Scott's godmother, uh, godparents were also... Yes. Uh, so it was pretty regular that people could get invited or could get themselves invited to be at a radio address of the president. Uh, we um, have invited guests. Every week we do the radio address in town. There are times that the, the president is out of town on the, or out of the country on a Friday or Saturday. And so in those cases, we would not have an audience. Right. Pardon yes. me? Let me. Let me ask you this question, because a lot of this is an investigation into foreign uh, campaign dollars of uh, getting into the 1996 elections. And we may seem somewhat far afield focusing on this radio address in these six gentlemen, since there's no evidence that the committee has that any of these six gentlemen donated any money in the presidential election. So whether they were or weren't at a radio address, whether they did or didn't receive pictures, uh, is pretty far afield. Only, the only connection to it is Johnny Chung. Um, because these gentlemen, for, from everything that this committee knows, didn't give a dime to President Clinton's re-election campaign or to the DNC or to anything. All they, they were visiting, the person who was escorting them said, look, I can get you in to get you know, a picture with the president, and he arranged it. So in terms of uh, Johnny Chung, which is really, I would assume, our real focus, not how somebody got into the radio address, since more than 10,000 people have been in radio addresses. Um, 
is in terms of Johnny Chung, he was a friend of the president. He was a supporter of the president. That's correct. I, you now, know, the president, may I just mention, has, you know, friends that, that he's had all of his life, his high right. school friends and college friends, and he has, but he considers friends, people who are now, helpful I, to I, him. He's I very, totally understand. Mm -hmm. Bob Dole ran for president in the same election. He had a friend. His name was Fireman. He was uh, the chairman or deputy chairman of his campaign finance committee. Uh, and he went about trying to help Bob Dole, his friend. And he arranged to launder some money through a Hong Kong bank back through into the Dole campaign. And he was, uh, he pleaded guilty and was, had to pay a $6 million fine and was uh, put essentially under house arrest for a few months. And in the entire prosecution of the case, it was asserted by the U.S. Attorney that Bob Dole knew nothing about how his friend went about raising this money. That Bob Dole was never implicated or there was not, not even an inference that Bob Dole had any idea. All he knew was that his friend was helping him. Now, there's been no proof whatsoever that Mr. Chung has done anything wrong, but do you have any reason to believe that if he had done something wrong, that the president would know about it? I have no reason to believe that. And if, you, if the president had some knowledge that a friend of his was doing something wrong vis-a-vis -vis his campaign, wouldn't the president uh, direct them to stop it? Uh, yes, he would. So now, Unless Mr. Chung was operating as an agent of the president or of his campaign, even if he did something wrong, don't you think it's kind of strange that since in none of these other cases, let me give you another example. The Speaker of the House, there was a foreign arms dealer who gave tens of thousands of dollars to Speaker Gingrich's campaign. But there's no assertion by anyone that Newt Gingrich had any idea that this person was funneling money improperly into the speaker's uh, political efforts. So it is of interest, as we sit here today, focused on this silliness of this radio address in these pictures, which have nothing to do whatsoever with the subject matter of this investigation. Johnny Chung does, and how he got his money, and where the money came from, that's an important issue, but it has nothing to do with this radio address, unless the chairman or the majority can show some connection. Now, supporters of the president, some of them get cufflinks from the president, some of them get a picture, some of them get a smile. Um, but as best as we know from Johnny Chung, he never sought any policy or preferential treatment in terms of policy decisions at all. And in terms of his interaction with the president, do you have any information to the contrary in terms of that? No, I have no information of the contrary. Will the gentleman so, yield for a minute? I'd be glad to yield. But, Mr. Enright, though, after that, we saw the videotape. The president yeah. met with all these people, took the picture. After that uh, radio address, and he said something to you about they, they, sh they shouldn't be bringing all those people in. And what, what did he say to you? Well, he, my recollection of what he said was, we should not, you should not have done that. And, and that's all I recall that he said to me, and I, with In no other words, explanation. He, he yeah. sort of had some sense that he was being used. Um, I, well, I, it's, I can't tell you exactly what he meant by it because he just said that, but that whether he was being used or that they were inappropriate people to bring to the radio address or inappropriate people for him to meet with. Um, but I, again, I did no follow-up questions. He didn't explain it. Or, that's my recollection. And so I would only have to infer what he meant by it. Now, after that, somebody at the National Security Council was asked to give some advice as to whether these pictures ought to be given to Johnny Chung. Do, do any of you at the table know how the NSC was asked to give some view on this? Well, I think they were asked to to do it because I sent a note to Nancy Soderberg and asked her to, to whether it was appropriate to send the photos out. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes, I think that's why they did it. And so Nancy Soderberg then asked Sudinger? Well, I don't know. No, I think Nancy Soderberg's assistant probably just took care of it herself and then asked Mr. Sudinger about it. That's what it indicates on this email. Well, Mr. Sudinger sent an email and... You heard some of the people on the other side of the aisle, they talk about it as if it was an all-points uh, NSC advisory bulletin concerning Johnny Chung. But uh, as, I, as all of you are surely aware now, uh, and we'll hear from Bob Sutinger tomorrow, that uh, they responded to this request for advice about the release of the photographs, and then they sent an email saying, this guy looks like a hustler. Uh, but he also said it didn't seem like it was gonna endanger U.S. foreign policy, my words, not his, to give the man a photo with the president. 
Uh, I think it's critical to note that Bob Sutinger's email accurately describes Johnny Chung as a hustler and doesn't even object to the release of the photos. He said it was okay with him to release the photos. And then I gather the photos were eventually released. Is that? Is that uh, again, I, I question whether the photos with the groups were, were ever released. Uh, that, I, I really don't think they were. Well, Ms. Kahari, you said some note, like, hooray, the photos are going to be released. What were you referring to? You yes, think, and uh, until, I, until I saw this fax, I, I really don't remember the photos being released, and, and I see this fax, so some photos must have been sent to him, but I, I really don't remember whether or not. I don't remember one way or the other about these questionable photos. Johnny Chung evidently was pestering people about the photos. Who did he call? Did he call you, Ms. Kahir? I, I don't remember whether he called me. I know that he called some people at the DNC, and I know that he yeah. sent a letter to a couple of people at the DNC. So I was aware of the photo hunt. Thank you, Mr. Fatone. I, I want to yield back to you if you have more questions. Well, thank you again, because I, I think that um, now when, when these gentlemen came in and got their picture taken with the president, they were in the radio address, nobody had any envelopes with them st stuffed with cash or anything like that, right? I don't recall being in the room, so... Okay, Ms. Uh, Crawford, you were in the room, right? Yes, no, I don't believe anyone... Well, now, not that I saw, no. L let me ask you this question, uh, because there's a lot of attention focused on the fact that they were foreign nationals. Was it unusual that um, people who were visiting our country uh, and had associations with uh, uh, you know, people who knew the president would want to get a chance for these people to meet the president? No, I, I don't think it's unusual for, for uh, anybody to want to bring their friends and associates in to meet the when president. The, when the president travels overseas, you see tens of thousands of people uh, line up just to get a glimpse of him. Absolutely. So the president of the United States is a pretty important person. That's why you said when the chairman asked you, well, did you ask him what he meant? You said you don't ask the president of the United States what you just... You just do what he says. Right. But so... The fact that Johnny Chung, who was a friend of the president, who was trying to do business in, in a, a foreign land, uh, wanted to bring some associates through, in and of itself is not something that would be beyond someone's understanding, that, that it might be something he would want to do. The president, however, sensed that it might have some inappropriateness and cautioned you about it. So the president, when given because he was not aware of any of this, these other activities leading up to these people showing up at the radio address. But the minute he sent something, he felt that perhaps it was somewhat inappropriate. So what we do know about the president's actions in this regard is that when he sensed that something was inappropriate, he took some action about it, which was to direct you that there should be more appropriate concern taken as the people who Mr. Chung might want to bring into the White House. That's correct, Congressman. So for those of us who, because um, there have been a few members of our committee who want to impeach the President of the United States of America. Uh, it is not a widely held view in the Congress or among the American public, but just so people can have a glimpse of what he said in private to you when these group of people were in there and got their picture taken, uh, it was someone who, as we would suspect, was attempting to do what was right and honorable. Uh, so I, I just think that, again, this committee's uh, attempt to seek out foreign money. Let me just go down the line here. Do any of you have anything that you would want to, that you know about in terms of illegal foreign contributions coming into the 1996 elections? Do you have any information about that? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Ms. Crawford? No. Ms. Kerr? No. no. Ms. Scott? And do you have any knowledge that the Democratic Party or President Clinton sought or solicited donations, illegal foreign contributions in that campaign? No. 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 And in terms of the subject matter of this hearing, Mr. Chung, do you know of him violating any laws in our country? No, I don't know of him violating any Do you know of him providing any foreign money that was illegal in the campaign? I, I don't know anything, you know. Do you know of him violating, uh, you know, even any, you know, the, uh, I mean, he didn't barge into the White House. He requested the opportunity. He was checked through. Ms. Kelly, was, was he, Ms. Crawford, was he, was he checked through by the Secret Service for admission into the White House? Everyone that comes onto the White House grounds has to go through. A so even process. if you said that someone could come and they could be in a radio address, 
For security purposes, the Secret Service runs their own check. We provide the secrets, or whoever. You give them a name, the and you them. give them information pertaining to that person. Yes. And then they get back to you and let you know. It, well, they make a decision, an independent decision, based on their responsibilities to protect the, uh, the uh, physical health of the president as to whether that person can come in. Is that correct? That's my understanding of Mr. the Mr. Fatah, process. before uh, we run out of time, I did want to yield uh, some time to Ms. Maloney, and then we'll get a further chance for questions on the five-minute round. Ms. Maloney? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd just like to ask all of you the same question. You could answer yes or no, starting at this end. And I'd just like uh, to ask you if you um, have any reason to believe that uh, Johnny Chung was an agent of the Chinese government, yes or no? No. 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 Um, I'd like to ask again, all four of you, um, do you believe that he tried to seek any favors for China? Are you aware of any favors that he tried to seek for China? No. 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 Uh, to your knowledge, did Johnny Chung ever try to seek any policy changes? Did he ever try to advocate policy, uh, to your knowledge, in front of you in any way? No. 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 To your, to your knowledge, uh, were any policy changes ever enacted as a result of uh, Johnny Chung's uh, visits to the White House or for his uh, contributions? Are you aware of any policy changes that were enacted? No. 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 Do you believe that it is unusual uh, for Johnny Chung to seek to have his picture taken with the president or the first lady? Is that an unusual thing? No, it's not unusual. <laughs> and uh, do you believe that uh, Johnny Chung was unique in trying to obtain a, a photograph? No, I don't think it, there's anything but What is it like when people come to the office? Do they usually want their photograph taken with Absolutely. the president and the, <laughs> the first lady? And, and do you think that uh, it's unusual for a, a businessman or woman to display a photograph that was taken uh, with him or her with the president or first lady? Is that unusual? No, it's not unusual. I'd like uh, to really ask the president's scheduler, Mrs. Heinrich, a few questions. Uh, how many people typically attend uh, the president's weekly radio broadcast? Um, anywhere between 40 and 100, or approximately 60 each and is uh, everyone who attends someone who gave a donation to the Democratic oh. National Committee <laughs> well number one one certainly doesn't know that about those, those people it has no correlation to their being at the radio address and um, so I wouldn't know that one way or the other describe some of the people who oh. come to these radio dresses well I, besides yeah, I, Johnny Chung I mean well, you would normally, I mean, we have make Mr. a wish. Mr. said he went. Do members of Congress Ma go? Members of Congress, the president's friends from uh, high school and college when they come to Washington will come to radio addresses, his friends from Arkansas. We have staff people and uh, what their about families. school children? Do school children come? School children often come. We'll have, if we have a theme radio address, we'll have a group that, for instance, if we had a radio address on mammography, we would have uh, breast cancer survivors there. If we had... Uh, we had uh, radio dresses on uh, tobacco, and so we would have a group of school children come who had started a, an initiative to keep other kids from ever starting smoking. We've had a, absolutely a variety. So we it's have a make cross a, section of yeah. America. Yeah, and we have Make a Wish children come. We have the president of the you know National Rotary Clubs come. We have all kinds of people come. Actually, uh, maybe I'd like to come one of these. We, we'd, we'd love to have list. you. I hope okay. you will. I, I, I would uh, really like to ask a judgment question uh, of, of yourself. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you're not aware if any of these school children or Congress members or friends from home. Uh, make uh, contributions uh, to the president's re-election campaign or to the DNC or to a congressperson. But in your judgment, do you think it would be right to deny a person uh, the access to go and listen to a radio address if they had given a, a contribution? I was always taught that it uh, to be civic to participate in your government. But do you think it would be right to deny someone uh, access because they've made a contribution? Well, I don't think it's right to deny somebody because they've made a contribution. You, you yield, have you ever heard of anybody being uh, denied access because they gave $50,000 to the Democratic <laughs> National Committee? Well, no, I haven't. <laughs> the reverse. I'd, I'd like to ask um, Carol, the DNC worker, <coughs> the former assistant, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you, 
Um, why were you concerned about releasing the photographs of the president with the Chinese businessmen that China, Johnny Chung brought to the radio address? Why were you concerned about that? I was not really concerned about it because we didn't have the photographs. The White House did. I did hear, I did learn that there was some concern at the White House about releasing them. And um, I heard that the National Security Council had those concerns. Uh, I didn't, that was, when I heard that they were concerned, that was the first I knew that there was anything questionable about it. And, and would you have arranged for Mr. Chung to attend the radio broadcast if you'd known that he, he was going to bring uh, other businessmen with him? Well, I knew that he had businessmen with him uh, because he asked. He, when he called, he said, I'm at the First Lady's office. We've been in with the First Lady. I have these businessmen with me, um, and we would like to go to the radio broadcast. Uh, well, to your knowledge, is there anything illegal or unethical about bringing businessmen to a radio broadcast? No. Uh, to your knowledge, at the same time Mr. Chung made donations to the DNC, do you have any reason to believe those uh, donations were improper? No, I have no reason to think that. And um, was Mr. Chung an American citizen at the time that he made these donations? I believe that he was. He was an American citizen. And uh, is there any, any reason to believe that he was not the source of the contributions? That he would, that he, was there any reason to believe that uh, the contributions came from any place besides Mr. Chung? I, I certainly had no reason to believe that. Uh, did you know that when Mr. Chung came to, these, uh, to this meeting that he had just uh, been named uh, California's uh, Entrepreneur of the Year? for his uh, business activities? No, I really didn't. That's the first I've heard of that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, my time is up, and, and I, I look forward to asking some more questions. Next round. The lady's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Hernrich, yes. you said that, uh, I, I, believe, I believe that one of you uh, uh, indicated that uh, Anyone coming, I think it was you, Ms. Crawford, anyone that coming into the White House had to have security clearance or else they couldn't get in, obviously, to protect the mm -hmm. president against something. Is that correct? The Secret Service handles the security. But, the, for but the that's president. for everybody. Yes, you have to clear someone into the White House if you're not a White House pass holder. Okay, so the, so the people that Johnny Chung brought in did have clearance or else they wouldn't have been involved in the radio broadcast that day. I assume that is, is that correct. right, Ms. Hernrick? I would assume so too. Yeah. You you send the, the, the list with information to the Secret Service and they make a determination about who's allowed onto the White House grounds to see the president. Okay. Uh, you said you uh, didn't remember Johnny Chung being there and uh, you didn't uh, uh, know the people who were, were with him. I have no recollection of that particular radio address or being there in the room when he was there. But the president said to you afterwards, those people shouldn't have been here. Yes. Now, that seems kind of strange to me that you don't remember Johnny Chung being there and you don't remember those people being there, but you remember the president saying those people shouldn't have been here. Well, I don't deny that they were there. I certainly, you know, because everything indicates they were there. I just don't have any recollection of the particular radio address and you know everything surrounding being in the room often i don't stay in the room sometimes i do sometimes i don't my office is right outside of the oval office and often i will stay out in the outer office uh during the radio address and let my the staff handle the radio address. i know address. but you, you said you, you didn't remember johnny chung being there no what i uh, what i meant to say mr chairman is that i was not in the room and don't remember that you know everything that went on there i guess what i'm trying to say is I certainly, from every indication, Mr. Chung was there. I just don't remember, I cannot visualize the events that went on that day or remember anything that sort of, you know, and transpired you, and you in the room that day. And you don't remember the people that were there either? I don't have, other than, you know, having seen... Um, well, the reason that troubles me is I'm thinking of myself now, you mm -hmm. know, because we have people running in and out all the time as well, and, and sometimes I get a little upset, and I look at my secretary and say, why did you bring these people in here, you know? For instance, when we have, have a bill up and people are in there beating on us, we don't want to talk to certain people, say, why did you bring these people in? And, and uh, usually when I say that, I'm not angry, but she gets the message pretty easily and mm -hmm. pretty quickly, and it makes a very vivid impression on her. And I can't understand you being as close to the president as you are and working with him as long as you are and knowing him as well as you do, that you wouldn't remember 
these people and remember this incident because obviously he says, hey, these people shouldn't have been in there. Well, that's what I remember is what the president said to me. But you that, don't remember the That people. makes a very vivid impression upon me. But no, I do not remember. Again, I, everything indicates they were there. I, what I'm saying is there's no denial that they were there. I just cannot tell you anything that transpired in the room. I have no visualization of what went on that day. And my recollection, although it could have happened in the Oval Office, that the president stepped out into the outer office when he said that to me after the radio address. It could have occurred in the Oval Office, but that's my recollection. Okay, well, but what I do remember, Mr. Chairman, is that he said that to me. And as you said, your assistant would remember something like that. That's, that's the part that I remember. We have had okay, right. 15,000 people probably go through there on radio addresses. It's impossible to remember everybody that has well, gone through there. I but I do remember that the president said that to me. I Excuse understand. Me. Uh, but the pictures weren't sent. That's my recollection, Mr. Chairman, why, is why, that. Why, I mean, you don't remember the people. Mm -hmm. You don't remember Johnny Chung being there. You do remember the president admonishing you that they Correct. shouldn't have been there. And then the pictures weren't sent. Why, 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 do you have any idea why the pictures were not sent? Why he didn't want them sent? I, I don't think that's what the president said to me. He did not tell me not to send the photographs. He just said to me, we shouldn't have done that. That's my recollection, that there was nothing... He didn't say anything to me about photographs. Um, and uh, my recollection is that, that we did not send the photographs. I didn't necessarily recall that that's what the NSC said, because in, in the uh, memo that we now see from Mr. Sutinger, he said it was OK to release the uh, photographs, although I did not have that information uh, at the time. But if, if I made the decision not to send the photos, it was either because the NSC said it or because I thought, let's err on the side of caution here. And if there's any question about this whatsoever, let's not send the photographs out. Uh, Ms. Crawford, uh, you know who Mr. Ware Donata was, the gardener that uh, gave $400,000 to the DNC? No, I, I, that were, name were you in the room when he was there? Do you recall? I do not know. You said you were in the room most of the time oh. when these people came in after a radio broadcast. And did this gentleman attend a radio address? Is that? I thought didn't where did not attend a radio broadcast. He was just there for a picture. Okay, never mind. Could we play this uh, tape of Richard Sullivan, please? Can you put that on? Uh, Johnny had, had contributed some money up to that, and um, uh, Johnny had a very uh, nervous, kind of a, a outward, aggressive personality, and uh, just the appearances made me, the appearances of it, and um, uh, the fact that he seemed um, uh, very much desired to to get into the radio address made me nervous and also that that might not be his money that Johnny Chung's money right that the money might be coming from those he was escorting into the White House isn't that a concern that you had that was that's correct uh, miss Scott uh, I know my time's expired but I'd like to ask you was there any discussion about this with the staff and the people uh, at the Democrat National Committee? On what day? About the concerns that he expressed there about uh, Mr. Chung. Uh, I'm not understanding your question. You heard what he just said there. Right. Uh, was there any discussion about Johnny Chung about, what, uh, about this particular issue, about whether or not uh, 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 people over there were concerned about getting contributions from him because of uh, because of his uh, his uh, his his background and because of his uh, uh, hustler image. No, there was no discussion whatsoever. No. So the only person was Mr. Sullivan that had that concern. I can't speak on behalf of Mr. Sullivan. I see. Uh, who seeks time on your side? I'll uh, reserve my uh, I'll five time. minutes and pass at this point. Beg your pardon. I'll seek Tom. Mr. Cummins? No, Fatah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fatah. Uh, oh, that's right. You were in the 30 minutes, Mr. Fatah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
<laughs> Let me just walk back through this, Ms. Um, Heinrich. You're in charge of a major operation that has to do with access to the president, him getting his work done That's on correct. behalf of the country. And you have a number of employees who work for you. That's right. And so when the president is doing something that's on his schedule, more likely than not, you're thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing that's on the schedule. I would Usually I have other work to do. Okay, so in radio addresses are you are regular events that take place. That's correct. And I hate to shatter the public image of this, but these are not extemporaneous comments by the president into a radio microphone, right? That's correct. These remarks are prepared well in advance. There's a sense of what's going to happen. So for you, there's not a lot of drama in a radio address. That's correct. So the fact that you say, well, the president was having a radio address and I was doing my other work, in the context of the world that you live in, makes a lot of sense, right? Yes. I mean, again, that's as I recall it. I, you know, I could have been in the room. I just don't remember it. And uh, I want to make that clear. There are times that I go into radio addresses, and there are times that I stay outside and do other work. I just want to get a sense of this. You know, the mm -hmm. president was over on Capitol Hill the other day, and mm -hmm. my, my staff was up looking at the windows and stuff. You see the president all the time, right? That's right. So you're not going to be up because they said the president's, you know, walking by. You're not going to be jumping up to, to see the president of the United States. I mean, you're you're on the inside. Yeah, well, that you're correct about the, that statement. So the, uh, the, uh, the point that the chairman was making about your recollection about the radio event, there's no disagreement that these gentlemen came in with Johnny Chung into the radio address. Uh, that's correct. There are pictures of it, in fact. <laughs> that's correct. There's videotape of it. That's correct. Uh, and they were put on a list by Mrs. Crawford, who works under you, is that correct? That's correct. And that list was eventually run by you before the radio address took place. Well, I, I assume so. I am not absolutely certain of that, but I. But it would so. normally have been. That's correct. Okay, so there's no mystery surrounding this event whatsoever. That's right. Now, there's a mystery, at least on my part, not on your part, as to why the committee is so focused on this matter, because again, there's no no information whatsoever that these people's appearance at the radio address in any way, shape, or form has anything to do with foreign contributions, illegal contributions into the 1996 elections. Now, there was testimony under oath by Haley Barber in the Senate that he traveled to Hong Kong. He was on a yacht there. He requested $2 million, that he got those dollars. Uh, he put it into the National Policy Forum, which he was the chairman of while he was the chairman of the RNC. In fact, when the policy forum was created, the paperwork ch chart showed it as a subsidiary of the RNC, and they spelled out in the paperwork that they were creating this 501c3 so that it could take foreign money. So then he, he set up an entity to take foreign money. He went to a foreign land, received a couple million dollars in foreign dollars, uh, that went into the election of Republicans to the United States Congress. In fact, it was requested specifically to go into some 60 targeted races. And then the gentleman who helped facilitate this money asked him not for a letter like the letter that Don Fowler wrote for Johnny Chung. He asked him to travel to China with him. The chairman of the Republican National Committee got up, took his United States passport, and went off to China. So if we're looking for foreign money in an election, uh, there's some reason to believe that if we could stop majoring in the minors, we might be able to actually get some people in front of us who could talk to us about foreign money coming into an election because there is evidence, at least on the record in the Senate, under oath that these are the facts and we could ask the people involved in this as to why it was that they sought to have foreign money influence the outcome of elections, uh, federal elections, in the, uh, and so, Mr. Chairman, I would just hope as we go forward that uh, since these people have uh, given us all of the information I think that they have at their disposal, uh, that we would find some time on the committee's schedule, uh, which we could bring in those who have been involved in these activities, uh, because I know uh, since we have uh, been so enthusiastic in our search for illegality, that this committee would not want to miss the opportunity to scrutinize these uh, activities. And gentlemen I'm going to yield, yield back. Gentlemen yield. I, I would yield to uh, Congressman and, Wax. And if we really want to look at the influence of foreign money, we ought to look at the money that's gone to members of Congress. Because one of the things we learned in just reading the press reports about 
what was made about the big to, to do that was made about the Chinese government maybe doing something. They were looking at Congress. They were trying to influence the Congress of the United States. And we've got a lot of other reports of members of Congress that have been influenced with foreign money or supporters of foreign policy issues. If we want to look at that question, let's look at it across the board, not just at the president, not just at the Democrats, but some of the Republicans as well. I thank you for yielding to me. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. We, we intend to have hearings on the entire question of foreign money. We will do that at some point in the future. Uh, Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to be using exhibits uh, 196, 198, <coughs> 240. And my question is addressed to Ms. Crawford, who I believe at the time we're discussing, which is 7 April 95, you were deputy, uh, uh, or you were former staff assistant to uh, Nancy Hernrich at the White House. Is that not correct? That's correct. What I'm curious, if you remember, looking at Exhibit 196, uh, did you happen to uh, call up Melanie Darby in the NSC staff uh, to give her the information on the delegation from China that was coming? I don't recall specifically calling Ms. Darby about this, but she would have been the appropriate person. She worked in the National Security Council for Nancy Soderbergh, who this list had gone to on the 13th. And she what would have been sort of my counterpart. So it would not have been unusual for me to contact her and follow up on these. Well, what I'm looking at here is April 7th, 1995, 10, 12 a.m., uh, Melanie Darby sends this email, electronic mail, to Robert L. Sutinger. Now, here's what it says. An odd situation in which I need some guidance for the president's office as soon as possible. A couple of weeks ago, late Friday night, the head of the Democratic <coughs> National Committee asked the President's office to include several people in the President's Saturday radio address. They did so not knowing anything about them except that they were Democratic National Committee contributors. It turns out they are various Chinese gurus, and the President of the United States wasn't sure we'd want photos of him with these people circulating around. Johnny Chung, one of the people on the list, is coming in to see Nancy Hernrich. Hernreich uh, tomorrow, and Nancy needs to know urgently whether or not she can give him the pictures. Could you please review the list as soon as possible? Give me your advice on whether we want these photos floating around. For your information, these people are major Democratic National Committee contributors, and if we can give them the photos, the President's office would like to do so. Now, the major Democratic National Committee contributors are the Chairman, China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, Chairman, China Commerce of International <coughs> Commerce, the President, China Petrochemical Corporation, the Vice President, China International Trust and Investment Corporation, the Vice Chairman and President of Shanghai AJ Shareholding Corporation, then James J. Sun is the young entrepreneur of, uh, in this Chinese city, self-made multimillionaire, uh, and then the chief of the American and Oceanic Affairs Division, liaison department, so forth, and Johnny Chung, chairman and CIO of his own firm. Now, I take it most of the people on this list are aliens, are not United States citizens, and yet they're noted here as major Democratic National Committee contributors. And that he is taking, I assume here, or rather Ms. Melanie Darby, is taking this as background that probably someone from the President's office, either you or uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Nancy Hernreich, uh, are the ones uh, that, and I assume perhaps Mr. Sullivan gave it to you, uh, or whoever it is that gave the information from the Democratic National Committee. Am I wrong on these assumptions? Seems to me there here we have evidence that aliens are contributing uh, to the uh, Democratic National Committees, foreigners, not citizens of the United States. I don't recall a specific conversation with Brooke Darby and what I may have or may not have told her. Um, well, you worked for uh, Nancy uh, Hernrich, uh, Hernreich. Uh, did you, Ms. Uh, Hernreich, uh, call uh, Melanie Darby and give her the background and ask for some advice and information? Um, 
I, I have no recollection of calling Brooke Darby. It, it, she's called Brooke, by the way, uh, about this. And but I think in the other, and I can't remember what number it was. They, what it appears that I did was shortly after the radio address, wrote a note on the list of the people who attended that radio address to Nancy Soderberg, who is who Melanie V. Darby works for. And that seems to have been, and, and that one indicates on there that the, someone from the DNC asked us to let them into the radio address. She may have met, uh, decided from that, you know, note to then phrase this this uh, email in this way. I don't, I don't know. I don't recall ever having a conversation with her about this. And in fact, I probably would not have had a conversation with her. What I did was send the note, and you all can read what I put on the note. And it doesn't say that I thought that these people were DNC contributors. The uh, Earlier, the chairman asked certain questions about how one is cleared into the White House. Yes. I gather when you have somebody that you've arranged or somebody wishes you to arrange a, a meeting with the president, just if it's sitting in on the radio show, having pictures, photos, whatever, uh, that you make a call to the Secret Service, I assume, give them the list of people, and uh, do they have to do more than that? Do they need, if well, they are American citizens, a Social Security number, uh, or what? How do you do it with foreign nationals? Uh, we have a, a new procedure that we have uh, put into place now. Since where, this time? <laughs> yes, say. since this what time. What was it then? I, I don't know what it was then. I think what we did then, which is, uh, which is probably give, if they weren't American citizens, give passport numbers and names. We would send those to the Secret Service, um, and then they make a determination if the person can come into the White House. I'd like to ask the chairman and the general counsel for us, chief counsel, uh, do we have those records from the Secret Service as to who came in and how they were admitted? We do not have all those records, Congressman. We're in the process of talking to Mr. Ruff's office about many records at the White House, and Mr. Ruff is seeking to be cooperative, but we do not have all those records, no. Okay, well, this but is we a, will we will check into All that. right, this electronic mail, as I said, was sent April 7, 1995, 10, 12 a.m. to Robert L. Sutinger. Now, here's his reply, since it was urgent that they wanted some information. One hour and 12 minutes later, sent at 11.24 a.m., April 7, 1995. And he says the following to Melanie Derby, uh, Darby. The joys of balancing foreign policy considerations against domestic politics. I don't see any lasting damage to U.S. foreign policy from giving Johnny Chung the pictures. And to the degree it motivates him to continue contributing to the Democratic National Committee, who am I to complain? Neither do I see any unalloyed benefit, unalloyed benefit either, but as far as the other Chinese on the list are concerned, they all seem to be bona fide, present or former, Chinese officials with the possible exception of James Y. Sun, young entrepreneur and self-made millionaire, with quotes around it. Got some doubts there. Notwithstanding that, these guys will all hang the pictures on the wall and feel grateful for a memory. But a caution. A warning of future deja vu. Having recently counseled the young intern from the First Lady's office who had been offered a, quote, dream job, unquote, by Johnny, Ch Johnny Chung, I think he should be treated with a pinch of suspicion. My impression is that he's a hustler and appears to be involved in setting up some kind of consulting operation that will thrive by bringing Chinese entrepreneurs into town for exposure to high-level U.S. officials. My concern is that he will continue to make efforts to bring his friends, in quotes, into contact with the President of the United States and the First Lady of the United States to show one and all he's a big shot, thereby enhancing his business. I'd venture a guess that not all of his business ventures or those of his clients would be the ones the President would support. I also predict that he will become a royal pain because he will expect to get similar treatment for future visits. He will be persistent. Signed, Bob. And this Bob, I don't know, is not related to the CIA Bob the, we hear about. The, the gentleman's time. But this is Bob Sutinger, otherwise known as Robert Sutinger. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. The, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cummins. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I was very pleased to hear you saying that we are going to be um, looking beyond where we've looked, because certainly, uh, as Mr. Fatah and Mr. Waxman have said, 
we definitely need to look at the Congress of the United States of America, and we also need to look at both parties. And I just, um, and I'm glad to hear that, and certainly we will hold you to that. Um, uh, the New York Times, I just want to cite something that I find very interesting as we go down this road of leading to nowhere, by the way. Um, New York Times on January 27th has a very art, uh, interesting article, 1997. It, uh, it says $250,000 buys donors best access to Congress. It says for elite donors who contributed at least $250,000, the Republican Party offered a new enticement in its gilded invitation to the party's convention in San Diego last summer. Beyond the smorgasbord of perks like access to the party's private skybox and a photo session with Republican nominees, the party promised a special benefit, staff members to help with the problems in Washington. In fundraising circles, these $250,000 donors, and I emphasize $250,000 donors, became known as season ticket holders. At least 75 corporations and individuals gave $250,000 or more uh, to the Republican Party last year, setting a new standard for political giving that by far surpasses previous election years when top donors generally gave $100,000 to join the Team 100 Club. According to solicitation letters, invitations, and interviews with dozens of Republican fundraisers, the Republicans have focused on large corporations and individuals with interest pending on Capitol Hill. Quote, there is no question if you give a lot of money, you will get a lot of access, said a senior executive whose corporation gave $500,000 to the Republicans. All you have to do is send in the check. The $250,000 season ticket was pitched as an entree to the party's inner circle and the best access to Congress. And that's a quote. He said, adding, it is literally touted as being in the inner sanctum and the creme de la creme. Most fundraisers and donors spoke on the conditions of anonymity. I, and he went on to say, I think it is fair to say that everyone in our organization from the CEO down finds this atmosphere to be corrosive and unproductive, said an executive whose corporation donated more than $300,000. Quote, you play because your competitors play. At least from our perspective, we would much rather take a number at the door of a congressperson's office, sit down like any other citizen, and when our number is called, go in, state our case, and then leave. I thought that this is what the Constitution says how it should be, end of quote. That article and those quotes call out for us, Mr. Chairman, to look at this entire process. Um, and, I, and I'm just curious to, to the, the, these uh, ladies that are sit, sitting in front of you, do all of you all have lawyers? Do all of, uh, I'm sorry, would you say? All, do all of you have lawyers representing you? Yes. yes. And, and it's interesting, Mr. Chairman, that when I heard the figures that were paid by Maggie Williams to, uh, to defend herself in coming from and coming from Paris and I'm sure these ladies that you know people had to find money take time to do this the question becomes is what is our aim where are we going as I've said many times before uh, I, I think the American people basically want to see their tax dollars spent in a cost efficient and effective manner that's all they want and we seem like we're on our road down this Alice in Wonderland situation where we're trying to present something but it reminds me of a few years ago when I was a child when HUD had a commercial and the commercial was about home buying and basically telling people to be careful when they go out to buy a house and so they had this big wonderful front I'll never forget it I was like six or seven years old big big front and the person goes and open the door and there's nothing behind it and so that that this whole episode reminds me of that and I think that it's important that the American people understand where we're going. The Senate did their hearings. Uh, Senator uh, Fred Thompson, in all due respect, came out with all of these allegations from the very beginning. And when the door was open, even he had to admit that there was nothing behind it. And here we are again, spending taxpayers' money, taxpayers that are looking at this right now, trying to figure out how they're going to get their kids through college, trying to figure out how they're going to have food on the table, trying to figure out how they're going to pay the taxes that are going to come due very shortly. But at the same time, they watch their government 
bring in these wonderful ladies with their lawyers sitting right behind them and watch their Congress people that they are paying $137,000 a year sit here and go down this Alice in Wonderland situation. They too are sitting wondering when the door is open and there's nothing behind it. Nothing. They ask themselves a question and they must become quite cynical as to where, what we are doing. And so I would hope, Mr. Chairman, that we would move on to the things that are very important, that we look at Congress. I think that should be very, very interesting. And perhaps when we open the door, we will see something behind it because maybe there is. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Yes. Uh, Mr. Micah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so we're getting towards the end, ladies, and I appreciate your patience. Uh, and I think you know why we're here. Um, we're here because the very top assistant to the first lady, uh, close to the president, accepted a check. She admits she accepted a check at, on government property for $50,000. The committee doesn't know the source of that money, but we know that substantial foreign money was, con was sent to the account of Mr. Chung. We know that on March 9th, uh, he passed that check again to Ms. Williams, who came before you, for $50,000. We know that on March, that's March 9th, on March 10th, that one or two of you were calling to get him and his Chinese delegation uh, into a meeting with then with the president. On the 9th, I guess he, or the 10th, he had his uh, picture taken with uh, the first lady and used the White House uh, mess at the direction of the first lady's office. And on the 11th, he did appear uh, with the president and the president you've testified is upset about it. Um, we're a little bit concerned that we don't know where that money came from. We're a little bit concerned that, uh, Ms. Scott, uh, you told the committee that you think that you spoke to uh, Ms. Williams about uh, the request uh, to get these folks in. Did you speak to Ms. Williams or uh, someone in the First Lady's office, is that correct? I said uh, that I think that I spoke to someone in the First Lady's mm -hmm. office. I did not specifically say Ms. Williams. Okay. Well, again, we're trying to sort out where these, uh, where these uh, directives came from, where this money came from. And uh, we hope to get to the bottom of it by talking to Mr. Uh, Chung and see how in a matter of a couple of days here by giving $50,000. He uh, not only spent time with the First Lady, uh, ended up with the President of the United States with uh, four uh, foreign nationals uh, at a radio address. Some of it seems very coincidental. Uh, and then if we look at other uh, transactions that are made here, $125,000 uh, April 8th and other contacts that were made. And we also have, if you go back to March 13th, I think this is, are you left-handed? Uh, no. <laughs> who's who's left? I, I'm the, well, I'm left-handed. You're left-handed? That's my handwriting. Is, right. is that your handwriting? It's my handwriting and I'm right-handed. Well, there's a left-hand check here. Oh, that, must that may have been my Well, someone right. knew and it's, it's, it's marked here at 313. So we have uh, the ninth, the money's given. Uh, the tenth, we see action uh, requesting this, and on the thirteenth, already the photos, and no one remembers the photos, even though we have testimony or a deposition by uh, Miss uh, Ratliff, who says she picked them up from uh, Miss Crawford, and we have questions raised about who these dudes are and what uh, what they're doing. So it does raise some questions about a uh, trail of foreign money, about national security, mm -hmm. about access to the president, about giving money on uh, federal property. And we're just trying to get to the bottom uh, of what uh, 
in fact, has gone on here, uh, and we will continue to pursue it. It does cost money. In some countries, they don't spend the money. It's all swept under the table. No one knows what took place. But the American people have a right to know, and we have an obligation to find that information uh, out from our witnesses. I want to thank uh, the chairman would, for would the gentleman yield, holding uh, the meeting and yield back my time. Would the gentleman yield before he yields back his time? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'd like for uh, uh, Exhibit 191 to be put up on the screen. Can you bring that in a little bit closer? Uh, Ms. Scott, uh, you indicated a while ago that uh, there was not a lot of discussion over at the Democrat National Committee about uh, Johnny Chung. Uh, if you read this, it said uh, Sandra Scott called. She was concerned about Johnny Chung. She stated that we should have called them prior to their coming to the radio address. Apparently, they were in Maggie's office when the request came, and Maggie said she didn't know but to contact the DNC. Uh, it, it just seems strange to me that there was not any discussion over there. Like you said, you said there wasn't much uh, concern about Mr. Chung, and yet you called uh maggie's office and said that that should have been uh, uh cleared prior to them coming over there why were you concerned and why does this memo say that the memo is addressed to betty curry who's in the oval office uh-huh uh, what happened was after the radio address i made a call in to miss curry who was not there and spoke to someone else i'm not sure who that person was and they raised concern about Mr. Chung being at the radio address with those gas. So, so there was some concern at the DNC uh, among the staff about uh, Johnny Chung? I didn't say the DNC. I said it called over to the White House. I know, but you were at the DNC. Correct. And that's what I'm saying. There was concern about him over there. I'm unclear I mean, as to you, what you your made this, is, You made this Chairman. call. I didn't make the call regarding Johnny Chung. I just made a unspecific, unrelated call to Miss Curry. Someone answered the phone. It was female. I'm not sure who, who she was, but stated that uh, there was some concern about the guests of Mr. Chung well, at the radio well, address. If you read, the, if you read the, the note there, it says, Sandra Scott called. She was concerned about Johnny Chung. And, and when we were asked the question a while ago, you, you indicated there was not any discussion or concern about Johnny Chung over at the DNC. Well, Mr. Chairman, the real question for the witness is, does this refresh her recollection of such a conversation? Because this is not her memorandum. I understand it's not her memorandum, but Ms. Curry indicated that this was a concern that Ms. Scott had when she called over there. That's why I'm asking the question, does this stimulate any recollection on your part? Yes, it does. It does. So there was concern at the DNC about Johnny Chen. I can't say the DNC. I said what happened was I called over to Betty Curry after the radio address. She was not in. Someone answered the phone, said that there was concern about Mr. Chung and his guests at the radio address. I then put in a second call to Betty Curry to try to get her once I found out, of which I never made any contact with Ms. Curry. So that's what this is about. Hmm. So when, when it, the word she does not refer to you, is that what you're saying? I didn't write it, so I, I'm unclear as to what the she is. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any more? Uh, Mr. Uh, Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can we have Exhibit 201 up? Uh, Ms. Kerr, what, what is, do you know the date of that? There's no date on it. The fa a fax from you to uh, Johnny Chung about the photos? Apparently it was faxed on April 11th, 1995 from the fax line at the top, but... Uh, okay, that would be consistent with an earlier phone message, I think, that we've seen. Uh, I, I don't know about a phone message. Uh, can we have Exhibit 195? Well, that's dated 311. Or day 4... Four, seven. Uh, I, I, this phone message, I didn't write this phone message and it's not to me. I don't know what that is. Uh, I wasn't saying that you did. I'm just trying to come up with a timeline. 
Uh, can we uh, have Exhibit 215, uh, please? Uh, this this uh, document says, uh, as of 11-22-95, per Bob McNeely, he will not honor request from Johnny Chung, CEO of AISI. He has been improperly using photo of business people and the president. Uh, do any of you have any knowledge of that? No, I don't. Uh, that would seem to indicate that the photos did go out, though. Would it not? I uh, you know, again, all I can say is my recollection of this is that he asked for photos and that we did not send the ones of the group with him. Um, if he obtained them through some other office or some other way, uh, I don't know. Or, you know, I think what's possible that could have happened is that the photo of him and his brother could have been released, but the large group wasn't. I don't know for sure. And, you know, my memory can be incorrect on this, but my memory is that we did not send the photos out. Uh, if they, but there are other ways for them to get the photos. Anybody can order photos, and, um, but that was my recollection. And it could have been another, not the photos of the group, it could have just been of, the, of him and his brother. On uh, Exhibit 198, uh, down at the bottom, uh, it talks again about the, uh, the photos Down, down, way down at the bottom there. Thank you. Uh, and the last, uh, the last sentence there, that parenthetical, uh, the president's office would like to do so, talking about giving them the photos. Uh, who does that refer to? Who would be representing the president's office in that context? I, I mean, it, I dealt with photographs in the president's office, but I don't recall a specific conversation with Brooke, or I don't know why. I would have any stake in whether or not Mr. Chung got his photographs or not. Well, one, one would presume that, that Darby Brooke would not just make that up. I mean, that wouldn't be a fair presumption, would it? That she just made up I that, assume that she did not make Right, I, I would presume that too. Uh, but none of you all in search in your memory and your vast knowledge of, of how things work at the White House can think of anywhere that would have come from that the president's office would like the photos to go out. The only thing that I can come up with is that Mr. Chung was persistent about wanting the photographs, but I don't but, think. But he, I had he any doesn't speak for the president's it. office, does he? No. Mr. Chung, I, I, I wouldn't think so. Uh, somebody must have been speaking for the president's office to uh, cause uh, Darby Brook to make a very specific reference to the president's office wanting the photos to go out. Uh, would that be a fair, fair, fair assumption? I don't know what Miss Darby, you know, why she would have written this. You know, I can't, I can't speculate. Well, you could, uh, if you, if you, if you're not speculating, <laughs> that's different from saying you can't speculate. I mean, all I'm trying to do. Would you there like seem, to there, there I mean, seems to be some confusion here, uh, uh, and, and nobody wants to own up to the, you know, anybody wanting the photos to go out. There seems to be a clear indication here that somebody over at the White House did, and I'm just curious as to who, who at the White House did want the photos to go out or, or whether uh, Darby Brooke just sort of made that up. Congressman, I think that the chairman or someone has indicated that you'll have these people tomorrow, um, and maybe they can answer the questions, and their memories might be better than ours on it, and certainly accept it. They be, say they, that they would be nice. from us. Yeah, I'm, it would be. I'd like to know myself, really. Thank you. Does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, uh, Mr. Uh, we're only go going to have two more people question in all probability. Did you have any more questions well, this evening? Well, <laughs> Mr. Cox. Uh, I thank the chairman. Uh, Ms. Hernreich. Yes. Uh, as the uh, person responsible for Oval Office operations, um, you have some familiarity with what goes in and out of the president's office. Isn't that essentially the job? Yes. And uh, that includes correspondence? Yes. Uh, 
Now, as I understand it, uh, some of the correspondence that the President receives is separately answered uh, because uh, it's not uh, of a business nature but of a personal nature. Is that the way it works? Yes. Um, and the category of whether correspondence is personal or not uh, is dependent uh, on what? Well, um, we have, uh, at the beginning of the, the administration, we sent out a letter to uh, a group of friends, and it gave them a, a private zip code. So originally, the, the, all the personal correspondence were people who were writing in under that particular zip code. And um, so that's how it started. And then as we were able to determine, as other people would write, uh, the correspondence, the general correspondence department would then decide, pick those letters out and say, well, this sounds very personal, send it over to the personal correspondence department. We'd make a determination, yes, this is somebody the president knows personally, and yes, we should answer this is of a personal nature. So that's generally how that happens. And does the president see personal correspondence as it goes out? Uh, not every single piece of it, but generally, yes. Uh, because these are people that he personally wishes to keep up with. Um, yes, uh, it's it's people that he will see often and uh, um, and would not often, but would see periodically, and it would be people that he would want to keep up with as well. But now, it's my understanding that uh, in response to a question from the ranking member, uh, you've indicated that. Johnny Chung, not for correspondence purposes, but uh, just in the plain English sense, was a personal friend of the president's? I, what I said, I, I correct a little bit there, I think the president considers a lot of people his friends, and he considers his supporters his friends. Uh, he, this is a man who loves people, and, and he has um, I, literally, I, in my mind, millions of friends, and he and he honestly considers a very wide group of people his friends. All right. Now, so on the videotape that Johnny we saw Trump. of the Pardon me? meeting, the videotape that we watched earlier of the mm -hmm. Oval Office meeting with uh, uh, Chinese uh, guests that Johnny Chung brought in with him. Uh, the president sort of bear hugged Johnny Chung and was very happy to see him and greeted him by name and so on. And it's it's not in the sense that the president has millions of friends, but in the sense that he actually knew Johnny Chung, that he's a personal friend. Is that right? Well, um, I, I assume so, yes, by the appearance of that videotape. It's and and was, was Johnny Chung uh, part of the group of correspondents who was treated as a personal correspondent? No, well, that was a really initially a very small group, and and I, Kelly and I put that list together in transition from a uh, and we had very little time to do it, so we used a very limited list to begin with, and there were people just high school and college friends and that sort of thing because those are the, really the only ones that we had to deal with at the time, and we were in uh, quite a hurry to let people know that they could you know those people could could contact the president. And is Johnny Chung uh, uh, in that group? Uh, he was not in that group of high school and college friends and, you know, Rhodes Scholar friends and that group that re received that uh, uh, zip code. There were only a very small number who received the zip code. Again, we had a limited number of time to go through the list. We had limited list at our disposal to go through, and we were in a hurry to get that information out, so... And did the, the president himself occasionally gave people this zip code, right? I think he did, yes. So it wasn't just college friends and so on that had the zip code? Eventually, it, as I in, uh, it expanded. And again, we received and would answer letters that came from correspondence that people, they were able to determine you know, would fall into that category. So you had so. to be an even better friend than Johnny Chung to get a zip code, is that it? Uh, I'm not sure that... Um, Again, that I ever had a list. The only reason that 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 uh, Johnny Chung didn't fall in, the only list I think I really had at my disposal at that time were high school, college, Rhodes Scholar, those, and some Arkansans. So I didn't have a wide variety of lists of everybody in the United States who was ever his friend. 
to send to him to say, mark the people you want it was me to a, send. It was a discreet person. and limited list. Yeah, it was primarily people, it, and th that was it. I just didn't have those lists to send to him to, with every name of every person he had met. Did James years. Riotti get a zip code? I don't know if James Riotti got the zip code. Oh. I, I doubt it initially because he would not have been on an Arkansas list, and he would not have been on any of those categories, but I can't say for sure. Uh, in your deposition, you said you thought he did. Yeah, I don't know. I, again, I just said I don't. I, now I would say I doubt it for that reason. I can go back and, and uh, check and clarify, but I can't do it in this very, at this time. Okay, it would be be uh, informative to know whether in that inner circle of people uh, we included James Riotti. I yield back. We can, uh, uh, w would you be willing to uh, answer some questions that we would write to you and send to you? Regarding this? Uh, regarding, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I would. And we'll, we'll, send, we'll send you some questions that we'd like to ask. Do we have further? Uh, Just further? a quick question. Uh, if we ask you to take all the people the president has seen over the course of the year and to rank them in the order how close a friend they were, do you mm -hmm. think you'd be able to do that for us? <laughs> All of them that he sees in a year? No, I can't. I just, not you're like being that. Facetious. Well, well, I am I obviously being facetious yeah. because I just can't understand how at uh, 520 in the afternoon, this committee hearing, which has done nothing in, but turn over the same information that's already been made available, we're already down to the level of how close a friend Charlie Chung Henry. was. Mr. Chairman, I haven't had my five minutes. And I won't take it if oh, you don't interrupt me. Is this your first me. five minutes? My first uh, five give minutes. Give him the five minutes. The gentleman, you'll put that. Oh, sure, certainly. Th thank you. Because, um, you know, I know that we have the authority to ask for anything under the sun, but what the relevance is of asking about the president's personal correspondence list, unless there's some evidence um, that someone has done something wrong, I think it's, you know, it just shows the stretch of this wide-ranging investigation into nothing. Um, now, if we want to investigate whether James Riotti has done something improper, that seems entirely appropriate. But to know whether or not he's on a list seems to be a, a stretch, and I would just hope that the committee would try to confine itself to focusing in on what was the alleged challenge of the committee, which was to look at illegal foreign contributions and improper activities relative to the 1996 list. Who's on my personal correspondence list or the president's seems to be somewhat off point. The last thing I want to say is that the Speaker of the House has said that President Clinton has had a, you know, has a unique ability to make everyone feel as though uh, they are someone that he uh, uh, is close to. It is a ability that I'm sure many politicians would hope that they can emulate. If the gentleman um, will permit, the speaker even said that he melted in the presence of the Indeed. President in fact, it was so, the uh, charismatic. part of the revolution against Newt Gingrich was they thought he had went over to the White House and been corrupted by the charisma of uh, Bill Clinton. So I, I, I think bet that he could have gotten invited to a White House uh, uh, radio address. Or something or radio. Radio. <laughs> but so I think that, you know, we are far afield. And if we look at the, the, the questions that have been emanating from the majority side, for this panel, just look at them. None of them have anything whatsoever to do with what we're supposed to be investigating. So my colleague, I just want to yield back my time. Well, I thank you. And, and I don't mean it as a personal criticism. I just think that it shows that the investigation of this committee has no focus in terms of its charge. And that's why the Thompson Committee went out of business. So if we're going to have some reason to be here, we should at least have a focus of what we're trying to accomplish. Well, it keeps us off the streets. I want to yield to. Uh, Mr. Barrett, if you wanted to take some of Thank this Thank you, time. Mr. Waxman. And I, I had the opportunity to watch your testimony in my office. And uh, I thought you all did a very good job. I don't think it's necessary, really, to uh, carry this out further. I just, as I was sitting here, though, I was thinking about, frankly, the President's ability to, to know people. And I recall when I was first elected in 1992, same time he was, and then he came into the Democratic caucus and was fielding questions. And he went around the room, and he knew everybody's name and the issues that were important to them. And I thought, man, he's not going to know who I am. I'm not going to raise my hand. Uh, but he knew everybody in the room, uh, which I thought was just amazing. And then in 1990, it must have been 94, I was out uh, at about 7 a.m. jogging one morning down the mall. And who comes running toward me but the president uh, with his little 
entourage of Secret Service agents. And um, he came over to me and said, hi, Tom, how are you doing? And greeted me and asked me about a bill and how things were going. And we talked for maybe 35, 40 seconds. And then we both went our separate ways. And even at 7 o'clock in the morning, there's some tourists on, on the mall. And as I was running, they were now looking at me because the President of the United States had just stopped to talk to me. So I turned to them and I said, hey, who was that guy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but my, my question, I guess, for, for you, uh, Ms. Heinrich, is are you as good as the President in remembering people and names? Oh, not at all. I wish I was. He has a wonderful memory. And, you know, the thing about it is this is a man who really cares about people. He loves people. And, um, uh, and, and he considers many people his friends. And so I, you know, there's, I, I don't know, it, it seems to me that, it, it, honestly, and I maybe uh, shouldn't editorialize here, but, you know, what difference that it makes, you know, what, who's on the personal correspondence list or who isn't, or, you know, it, this is a man who loves people, considers everyone his friend, and, uh, would be happy to have everybody, you know, have his personal correspondence code and, and write, write him personal letters. He would love to sit and read every one of them and answer every one of them personally. Okay. Thank you, all four of you for your time today. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. In conclusion, let me just say, did you, did you want to have anything else you'd like to Well, yes, uh, just uh, to, because my time expired uh, on the questions that I began, and I won't resume, but... Uh, I think it's rather obvious that, uh, in response to my colleague's rhetorical question, that James Riotti is, in fact, at the center of an investigation uh, into illegal foreign payments to the executive branch of our government, uh, and inquiring about the level of involvement uh, of James Riotti in the White House, uh, all the way to the extent uh, of having a special code that he can put on his mail so that it bypasses the staff bypasses the correspondence office and goes directly to the president, I think is uh, uh, very much to the point. Well, let me, let me uh, conclude by saying that uh, the reason the investigation continues is because millions of dollars of illegal contributions have been found and returned, number one. Number two, we have 66 or so people who have taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country. And so we're having a difficult time getting this information. And until we get satisfactory answers, unfortunately, very fine people like these ladies are going to be called up here to try to help us fit pieces of the puzzle together. I do appreciate, and I'm sure the committee appreciates your, your, your uh, patience today because we had so much that we had to cover and you had to sit there and wait for many hours. So we do appreciate that and we apologize for the amount of uh, time you had to just sit there and cool your heels. Uh, the committee, uh, unless there's further business, will stand in recess until 12 o'clock noon tomorrow Mr. Morning. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, just as an inquiry, can you give us a little uh, uh, preview of tomorrow, what, what you're planning? Uh, tomorrow there will be a deposition uh, which will take place starting at 9 a.m. of Mr. Wong, oh, uh, Mr. Chung, pardon me, and uh, hopefully that deposition will be concluded by 10.30 or 11 o'clock. What we wanted to do was to start the hearing at noon. Uh, and uh, I think we can stick pretty close to that schedule. And where will the deposition be? Uh, have we been informed of that? The deposition will be held at the, who, what room will we have that in? Uh, Congressman, uh, the deposition will be held uh, here in, in the Rayburn building, but I've talked to Mr. Ballin, Minority Counsel, and in terms of uh, certain considerations of the witness, we're not really announcing at this point in time exactly what room the deposition will be in. Uh, All the members of the committee will be advised what room we're going to be in. Prior to the, prior to the Certainly, yes, sir. We, we will make sure that you and any other member who would like to participate in the deposition are made aware of, uh, of where it is. We just don't want to uh, gaggle people waiting outside. Thank you very much. Stand in recess till noon tomorrow. There was no space in it. And, um, well, hi. Uh, that's the original. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess that was my mind. Sure, I'll give that Mr. Waxman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh,
You can see Friday's House campaign fundraising investigation hearing, where committee members heard from witnesses from the National Security Council tomorrow afternoon at 3 Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 2.